practice. So there is an authentic workshop on food care, insulin, pumps and CGMS which spreads additional extent of awareness on most common endocrinological abnormality, diabetes mellitus. So the exciting key highlight of the summit is endocrinology quiz initiative eligible for all MBBS, MD, DNB, DM professionals along with the nursing executives in endocrinology department. The winner awards as follows. The first prize with INR 10K gold medal and a certificate. The second winner awards with INR 8K plus silver medal and also a certificate. The third winner awards with INR 6K a bronze medal and a certificate. I take a privilege to talk about our organization Idea Clinics. Idea Clinics is a preventive healthcare provider addressing premature deaths, particularly from diabetes and other non communicable diseases. Over the years, Idea Clinics has pioneered a predictive model for healthcare that shows precision in the continuity of care with right blend of human touch and technologies. With hybrid omni channel platforms and cutting edge technology, Idea Clinics is integrating healthcare with a vision to reduce the burden of these prevalent conditions. Idea Clinics aspires to process, automate, and make reliable healthcare simple, quick, and preventative. Idea Clinics was created by keeping the customer experience in mind, using cutting edge technologies and collaborations with the finest medical specialists at the Idea Clinics. By keeping track of health indicators and using digital wearables, smartphone apps, and at home services, the Idea Clinics aims to provide much needed ease and speed in bringing the treatment of patients' homes. Idea Clinics executes its formulations through four components Idea Pharmacy, Idea Health Tech, Idea Skills, and Idea Foundation. Thank you.
I just quickly get through the highlights of the conference. It directly awards four CME credit points. Interesting panel discussion on global disruptions in healthcare new frontiers by group of official academic experts and scientists. Authentic workshop on food care, insulin pumps, CGMS, which spreads additional extent of awareness on most common endocrinological abnormality, diabetes mellitus. The exciting key highlight of the summit is endocrinology quiz initiative eligible for all MBBS, MD, DNB, DM professionals, along with nursing executives in working in endocrinology department. The winner awards as follows. First prize, INR 10K plus gold medal and a certificate. The second prize awards with INR 8K and silver medal with certificate. The third prize is INR 6K bronze medal and a certificate. Thank you. So I request everyone to participate in all the workshops and also the quiz initiatives and make the program the grand success. Good morning to all the dignitaries, guests, delegates with great respect and exultation. Let me introduce myself. I am Dr. Divya, general practitioner and a diabetologist, a clinical nutritionist and obesity specialist. I am from Idea Clinics. I feel privileged today to extend my warm greetings to all the presentees here for the summit. A grand welcome to Idea Clinics National Conference Diabetes Research Update 2022 held at 16th, 17th July, Hyderabad. I would like, I, I'm taking privilege to talk about our organization, Idea Clinics Institute for Diabetes, Endocrinology, and Adiposity. Idea Clinics is a preventive health care provider addressing premature deaths, particularly from diabetes and other non communicable diseases. Over the years, Idea Clinics has pioneered a predictive model for healthcare that shows precision in the continuity of care with right blend of human touch and technologies. With hybrid omni-channel platforms and cutting-edge technology, Idea Clinics is integrating healthcare with a vision to reduce burden of these prevalent conditions. It aspires to process, automate, and make reliable healthcare simple, quick, and preventative. Idea Clinics was created by keeping the customer experience in mind using cutting-edge technologies and collaborations with the finest medical specialists at Idea Clinics. By keeping track of healthcare indicators and using digital wearables, smartphone apps, at home services, Idea Clinics aims to provide much needed ease and speed in bringing the treatment to the patient homes. It executes its formulations through four components, Idea Pharmacy, Idea Health Tech, and Idea Skills, Idea Foundation. Heading to the first and foremost session of the conference, it is a matter of great pleasure to honor and address Professor Dr. N. Sudhakar Rao Garu. Professor and Dr. Sudhakar Rao Garu has an experience of 33 years in the field of endocrinology, has completed MBBS from Osmania Medical College, Hyderabad in 1975. DM Endocrinology, the Post-Graduation Institute of Medical Education and Research in 1984. He is a member of Indian Medical Association. His areas of expertise include hypertension treatment, diabetes, thyroid swelling, hormone therapies, men and women, and goiter treatment. Let us now welcome Professor N. Sudhakar Ravgaru onto the stage and request him to take the chair. The next dignitary to honor us with is the presence of Professor Dr. P. Srinivas Garu. He has completed MBBS from Kakatiya Medical College, Warangal, MD from Gandhi Medical College, DNB in endocrinology. His interests are in endocrinology, growth, puberty, thyroid, and diabetes. A grand welcome onto the stage, sir, and please take your chair. Thank you.
it's a pleasure to invite you all. Welcome for this conference. And uh, I request uh, Dr. Nilaveni, who is a professor of endocrinology currently teaching in Usmane Medical College, and Usmane General Professor and Associate Professor of Endocrinology. She pursued her MBBS, MD, General Medicine, Gandhi Medical College, 1994 and 2000, respectively. She then completed DM Endocrinology in Usmane Medical College, Usmane General Hospital. She has been teaching this since 2000. Dandy. Since 2000, she has been te teaching the tutor for cardiology Gandhi Medical College, then tutor endocrinology in Usmania Medical College, General Hospital, Aston Professor of Endocrinology Usmania, and Associate Professor of Endocrinology from till now. Uh, she will be talking about Turner Syndrome. Good morning. She is a very good. Uh teacher and uh, good uh, writer and we are, we are going to enjoy the real topic of uh, our experience of Turner syndrome. So we had a good experience in our teaching institutions, especially Gandhi and Usmania. We had publications also, national publications and international publications regarding growth hormone therapies on Turner syndrome. So we have a practical experiences and we have a real patient data is there. So. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, at the outset, thank you for the opportunity, and uh, thank you, Chase, for the kind words. And can I have my presentation? Slide. Sorry for a little bit delay and small yeah. hiccups uh, initial uh, this yeah. thing. And uh, I appreciate everybody because the morning times on Saturday, weekends, and coming at 8, eight 9, 9 o'clock, it's a really essay. So, a lot of. Uh, and uh, my, my, my senior and uh, who is respected, Dilip Tandon, sir, is now age of 75 years. He came at morning 9 o'clock for a conference that indicates how the Seniors are very appetite about learning the something from a conference. And we promise that we are going to stick the time and we, are, we don't want to waste your valuable time also. Right. Some difficulty, technical difficulty in projecting the slides. What happened? Slides have been there, Bob. Slides have been sent to the maker. Jaydeep. Jaydeep. Next to the 
and chairpersons also can see. There is a small change in the agenda. The last uh, subclinical hypothyroidism and pregnancy by JCMI is postponed to, to tomorrow. Otherwise, only two topics. We are going to cover the time. So we have little time. <laughs> so that can be compensated. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Again, uh, once again, very good morning to you all and uh, thank you for the opportunity. And the topic which I am going to discuss is the growth hormone therapy in turners. Though it's not a very common disorder, but it's a like, very important disorder which can be managed with appropriate treatment and appro like early diagnosis. So, to begin with the case, to begin with the case scenario, which we have seen in our practice. So uh, she was a 13 point, 13 and a half year old girl, was brought by her mother uh, for the evaluation of the short stature and the delayed puberty. And she was born to non-consanguineous parents and it was a full term normal delivery. Birth weight was 3.5 kgs and milestones were normal. Scholastic performance was good and uh, no visual disturbances, no CNS asymptomatology and no history suggestive of any chronic systemic illness. This is the background history. On examination, she was very short, like with the height being 130 centimeters, less than third centile, and the weight 32 kg in between third to 10th centile, and no goiter, and her height age was eight years, eight, nine months, and weight age, weight age was nine years, nine months. Height SDS was minus 4.16 SDS, that is severe short stature. And mid-parental height was 154 and target height was 146 to 162 centimeters. And she had a short neck and cubitus valgus, which are the like Turner stigmata. So, and uh, she doesn't have any short fourth and fifth metacarpal or metatarsal. Generally, we expect it to be. No other skeletal deformities and SM, uh, SMR was pre-pubertal. And uh, otherwise, vitals were very stable and bl blood pressure was normal. Uh, that is very important thing to be examined in a like Turner's patient because they can have a coarctation of iota with a high blood pressure. So, and the systemic examination revealed normal. And uh, routine biochemistry was normal, bone age was 10 years. Generally, bone age will be appropriate in most of the Turner's, but sometimes it can be delayed. Thyroid was normal, uh, antibodies were negative, and FSH was 199, which is very much elevated, suggestive of a ovarian insufficiency. And karyotyping was a classical of Turner's, 45 XO. And uh, ultrasonography suggestive of infantile uterus and streak ovaries. No other anomalies because they can be associated with any other renal or uh, other anomalies. And the 2D echo showed a bicuspid aortic valve and the trivial AS and no coarctation. So, diagnosis of Turner's. So, this is the case typically we see in our practice. So, the concern is the mother was concerned regarding the short stature. So, can we do anything for the stature? So, these are all the Turner's is one of the most common chromosomal disorder affecting approximately one in every 2500 uh, live born females. So it is the result of absence or structural abnormality of one copy of the X chromosome. The diagnosis of Turner syndrome requires presence of characteristic features oh, yeah. along with the uh, 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 demonstration of complete or partial absence of second sex chromosome with or without oh, wow. cell line mosaicism. And uh, the, looking at the stature, there will be Turner syndrome, like short stature or growth failure is a universal phenomenon in almost all patients with Turner's. Almost they will be 20 centimeters shorter than the uh, normal, like, their mid-parental height. 
So these are all the phenotypic features of uh, Turner syndrome, which I am not going to discuss uh, in detail because uh, I just want to tell, like, uh, short stature is a universal phenomenon in Turner syndrome. And these are all the other various abnormalities and again, psychosocial problems like learning disabilities and all. So now our today's our focus is on short stature in Turner's. How can we address that problem? So what is the genetic basis for the short stature in Turner syndrome? So the growth failure is due to the haploinsufficiency of shocks. That is the short stature homeobox gene located on the short arm of X chromosome. So you can see in the picture. So the shocks gene resides in the telomeric pseudosomal, pseudo-autosomal region 1, region on the short arm of both sex chromosomes and normally escapes the X inactivation. So this is because of the shocks haploinsufficiency. So shocks gene function in dosage dependent so manner, the loss of function mutation of one shocks allele results in disorder of shocks deficiency, which causes growth failure as seen in Turner's. Turner's is almost, almost always associated with loss of one shocks gene because of the numerically or because of the structural aberration. And growth hormone deficiency is generally not a feature associated with Turner's. They are short because of the shocks haploinsufficiency. So invariably they have a normal growth hormone levels. So then the question comes. So and uh, then the question comes why should we treat with a growth hormone? So shocks is essential for the regulation of chondrocyte proliferation and differentiation. And it encodes a cell type specific nuclear transcriptional activator primarily expressed in the osteogenic cells. Shocks acts as a repressor of growth plate fusion since it is specifically expressed the growth plate in the hypertrophic chondrocytes undergoing the apoptosis. So the haploid insufficiency of shocks gene may lead to premature growth plate fusion in the distal limbs, so causing short stage. So there can be, as we have said, growth hormone will be normal. Uh, but there can be alterations in the IGF-BP axis in Turner syndrome. So despite the fact that growth hormone deficiency is not usually present in Turner syndrome, the growth hormone in IGF, IGF-BP axis is disturbed. <coughs> Increased IGF-BP3 proteolytic activity has been found in adult Turner syndrome combined with the low levels of circulating free IGF-1 and increased levels of free IGF-2. So th probably that may be contributing. So now, Having known about the, uh, the, there is a short stature or growth failure as a universal phenomenon, how short they will be? So looking at the average length of the full term babies of Turner syndrome is approximately 0.7 standard deviation below the mean for the general population. So it can manifest very early. So average untreated height falls below minus two standard deviation score by four years of age and below minus third standard deviations in adulthood. So, and we have a separate charts that has to be remembered. So, growth charts for the Turners are a little different from the normal population. So, Lyon et al. constructed a standardized growth curve utilizing cross-sectional heights from untreated European girls uh, with Turner syndrome in the absence of hormonal therapy. So, that means looking at the natural course of a Turner syndrome, the curve is widely used in clinical practice and which, so the mean final height was 143 plus or minus 7 centimeters in the lion data, untreated. So, so this is the, you can see on the left side, and this is the growth charts in comparison with the normal. This is the normal. These are all the charts for the growth, uh, Turner syndrome. Now coming to the growth hormone therapy. So various studies, uh, way back somewhere around 1992, 94 and all, so uh, growth hormones therapy in Turner's has shown little benefit. So improving various, uh, in the sense height improvements was almost five to 20 centimeters have been observed. So comparisons of the studies, final adult heights of women with Turner syndrome who were treated with the uh, growth hormone show height gains after treatment in the form of significant increases of five centimeters or over. So than the predicted adult height. So a mean height gain over a predicted adult height of up to 16 centimeters using a higher dose of human growth hormone that is up to the tune of 0.63 milligram per kg per week has also been 
demonstrated. So they require little higher dose. So treatment with recombinant human growth hormone is the standard of the care for a girl with Turner syndrome. It has been approved by the US FDA in 1996 as a non-growth hormone deficiency condition. And many studies have evaluated the growth hormone therapy in girls with Turner syndrome and revealed that growth hormone can increase adult height by to the tune of 5 to 12 centimeters in various studies. So the stimulatory effect of growth hormone on growth plate, chondrocyte proliferation and hypertrophy, which is partly mediated by increased IGF-1, can in many cases non-specifically accelerate the linear growth and thereby partially compensate for unrelated molecular defects affecting the growth plate. And uh, actually, initially, they have used for the so psychosocial issues. And there was a like, poor competence uh, among the children with Turner syndrome because of the short stature. So initially, they tried uh, actually to improve the psychosocial performance. Uh, but subsequently, they found that like, there is a true benefit with the growth hormone therapy in comparison with the untreated uh, Turner syndrome. So that's how, uh, looking at the data, US FDA has approved uh, growth hormone therapy uh, for the treatment of uh, short stature in Turner syndrome in 1996. So definitely, it improves the quality of life in uh, children with Turner's. And uh, the next question is, generally we see very late presentation of Turner syndrome, somewhere around 13 or 13 plus, mostly because when the child is not growing and not attaining puberty, like not going, entering into the puberty, that is the concern for the mother, so then they will bring to us. So by that time, so it will be too late for us to, so the real challenge is making a diagnosis of, early diagnosis of Turner syndrome. So it can be actually diagnosed prenatally, immediate postnatally and during the childhood also, looking at the growth pattern and the appropriate other clinical stigmata associated with the turners. So high index of suspicion is required so, so that early and a diagnosis can be made and early uh, child can be instituted on the growth hormone therapy. So early is the better. So this is one study. So toddler turnal uh, study actually uh, I don't know whether uh, the last benches are able to see. Uh, uh, looking at, so this is a, actually they have looked at like involved nine months to four years of age Turner's children. So they have treated for two years. This was a randomized trial and definitely they were like, look, you can see the, the corresponding graph. So the treated versus untreated definitely almost seven centimeters taller than the untreated children. So this is age between nine months to four years and subsequently they have in the sense at the end of the randomized uh, trial so they were in the interstudy period but again they, they had a thought like should we follow up these children who were treated with growth hormone therapy so in the so they invited for the observational study so which extended for up to almost so for 10 years so look at that so there was a, and there here the growth hormone treated during the study period did not receive the growth hormone here, whereas untreated actually they were provided with the growth hormone. So uh, there was a catch down, catch down growth for the treated earlier treated and there was a catch up. So subsequently the adult height was not different because of the catch down growth. Definitely the earlier treated children had a taller, like the, throughout the study they remained taller than the untreated children. So that is the importance of uh, uh, early treatment. So these are the uh, 2016 uh, clinical practice guidelines with respect to management of Turner syndrome. So what do they say? Age of initiation, so early is the better. So how early? Uh, around, around four to six years. So initiate growth hormone uh, early, so at around four to six years of age and preferably before 12 to 13 years so that we, have a, we can have a good impact with respect to the growth promotion. So child already has evidence of uh, growth failure, that is uh, in these circumstances actually. So 50 and like uh, follow, that's why we should have a growth charts. So follow up the height velocity and all. And, uh, and all the causes have been ruled out. I think some problem with the... So various lines of evidence indicate that younger age at treatment initiation, including at least four years 
of treatment prior to the puberty. That means somewhere around 11 to 12 years is the puberty induction. So somewhere around 6 to 7 years would be the best thing. At that time, if you make a diagnosis, then start the treatment that will be uh, really improve the height. So I think same thing. So therapy may be continued until the girl, how long should we continue once we started on the growth hormone? So should we continue till the girl like uh, uh, less than like 2 centimeters per year growth is been observed or bone age is more than 14 years. And there is no transition as we see for a growth hormone deficient children. So this is the recommended dose of growth hormone. Generally, the dose is little higher than the uh, dose what we use for the growth hormone deficiency children. So to the tune of uh, various countries use different doses, but uh, majority of the times 45 to 50 micrograms per kg per day or 1.3 to 1.5 milligram per meter square per day. So in most instances and increasing little higher doses depending on the response to the treatment and monitoring the IGF-1 status. So increasing to uh, 68 micrograms per kg per day if adult height potentially substantially compromised. You can increase the dose. And this is the monitoring. So monitoring, like uh, uh, clinical monitoring with the height velocity and the height monitoring every six months. And the biochemical monitoring with the IGF-1. So IGF-1 at least annually and maintain the uh, uh, IGF-1 less than minus two standard deviations, uh, less than, um, if it is more than two standard deviation, so then we have to adjust the dosages, keep it less than two standard deviations for the mean for that a particular age. So this is how we have to adjust the dosages. And uh, what are the factors? Do all of them, as, as we have said, e even in the studies also, they have observed varying from 5 centimeters to 20 centimeters improvement in the growth with, uh, with the initiation of growth hormone. So why this so much of variability? So several factors influence the efficacy of the growth hormone treatment. One is the uh, a relatively tall height at the initiation of therapy because of the parental tall stature. So tall parental, so familial or genetically, genetically they are at higher. So and uh, mid parental heights uh, and young age at the initiation, younger the age, so better will be the response. And long, longer period of treatment before induction of the puberty. Longer duration of therapy and little higher doses of growth hormone therapy. So these are all the factors which influence the uh, um, um, uh, growth promotion with the growth hormone therapy. So now oxandrolone, what is oxandrolone? Oxandrolone is an anabolic steroid, synthetic derivative of testosterone, uh, which is non-aromatizable. That means it will not be converted to estrogen and which is a weak androgen. So how does it help? So it can be used as an adjuvant along with the growth hormone to improve the height. So how does it help in growth promotion? So exact mechanism is not known, but works in synergy with the growth hormone. It augments the effect of growth hormone at the growth plate. So uh, because it will not promote the bone maturation. So early fusion will not be there. At the same time, giving a milieu uh, like steroid rich environment for the growth hormone to work effectively. So dose in the range of 0.03 to 0.05 milligram per kg per day. And the side effects, because it has a weak androgenic uh, activity, so histism, clitoromegaly, and mild deepening of voice can be there. And it should be started somewhere around 10 years of age. So uh, we have tried, but I think non-availability is an issue uh, with our uh, people. So this is a, a, a Cochrane database, which has looked into the beneficial effect of oxandrolone as an adjuvant therapy to growth hormone. So uh, the, in this uh, database, they have like duration of the therapy was three to 7.6 years and the mean age was nine to 12 years. And the benefit was mean difference in the height with respect to growth hormone alone versus growth hormone with oxandrolone was 2.7 centimeters. So favoring in like little benefit, modest benefit with respect to the height improvement with the addition of oxandrolone. So this is again another important thing is the puberty induction. 
So generally, traditionally, what we do in our uh, management of Turner syndrome who have been initiated our growth hormone, we delay the uh, uh, induction of the puberty with the estrogen. That is because assuming that addition of estrogen will cause an epiphyseal fusion, so that will hamper the beneficial effect of growth hormone therapy on the growth promotion. So that's why little delay will be there. So this is looking at, so this was the question in their mind. So with the low dose additional uh, uh, as an adjuvant to the growth hormone, does it have any impact with respect to the final height? So this is a uh, double blind placebo control. So number of patients, 149 patients, age in between 5 years to 12.5 years, randomly assigned to four groups, like double placebo, that is placebo for growth hormone, placebo for estrogen, and estrogen alone, growth hormone alone, and the growth hormone for estrogen. These are the four arms. So dose of the growth hormone was 0 0.1 milligram per kg, three times week, per week. That is a 0.3 milligram per week dose. And ethinyl estradiol was uh, depending on the chronologic age and adjusted to the pubertal status. So this is the dose they have re received. In between to 5 to 8 years, 25 nanogram per kg per day. And in between 8 to 12, 50 nanogram per kg per day. And after 12th birthday, so escalating doses because of the induction of the puberty. So that's, and growth hormone therapy was started when the growth uh, velocity was less than uh, 1.5 centimeters per year. So this is the, you look at this. So there is a growth hormone alone uh, improve, improvement in the height standard deviation scores. And with the estrogen, definitely almost two centimeters benefit with the uh, uh, associated uh, use of uh, estrogen. So this is the curves, growth hormone plus estrogen, that is the yellow line, growth hormone alone, that is the violet, and estrogen alone is the blue, and the double placebo is the or uh, orange colored. So in conclusion, so uh, a growth hormone treatment initiated at an average age of nine years increases the adult height in turners, and uh, ultra low dose estrogen with growth hormone showed modest growth benefit. So hence, practice of delaying estrogen therapy should be reconsidered. So the idea is, though they have started very early, pre-pubertal estrogen is not recommended. Appropri at appropriate uh, age, somewhere around 11 or 12 years, you can start with the estrogen therapy, so which may have a, uh, in the sense, which may improve the psycho uh, psychosocial behavior as well as the neurocognitive function. So that is the message from this study. So puberty induction should be done like as an appropriate 11 to 12 years and do not recommend a routine small dose of prepubertal estrogen therapy and uh, 11 to 12 years and once the, uh, once the appropriate pubertal development has occurred then you can add with the uh, progesterone so that continued on estrogen and progesterone supplementation. So I think coming back to our patients, so this is uh, uh, on the, so coming, how did we manage our, so uh, growth hormone was started three units per day, so it is a lesser dose, generally for our patient, as per the recommendation requires 4.5 to 5 units per day, but because of the financial constraints, we started with a low dose, so and subsequently increased and thyroid status was monitored because uh, as per se, thyroid, like Turner syndrome are at risk of developing the autoimmune thyroid disease and during the growth hormone therapy also they can develop a thyroid dysfunction, hypofunction. So then it has to be monitored because it is again another important factor which can have a negative impact with respect to the uh, growth promotion. So uh, it was monitored and estrogen supplementation was started at 15 years of age. So total height gain, what we have observed in our patient was 22 centimeters. I think a couple of slides I'm going to complete. So this is the growth hormone uh, chart for our patients. You can look at this like at the start like here. Actually in between for again financial constraints, patients stop the therapy. And here at 15 years of, you can see the like how the growth benefit with the growth hormone. And uh, you can see the no growth catch up. So when the patient stopped for a period of six months, and then we, we have added estradiol at, the, at 15 years of age and completed somewhere around when the growth hormone, like growth velocity is less than two centimeters per year. So somewhere around 152 final height she reached and mother is happy. So take home points. So growth failure is the most common presentation of Turner syndrome, which is due to shocks, haploinsufficiency, which is progressive from the infancy to adulthood. And uh, growth hormone therapy remains the mainstay of treatment for treating the short stage of Turner syndrome. So, and growth hormone therapy can be safely initiated at a younger age in individuals with Turner. The real challenge is to making a diagnosis very early. 
and early growth hormone treatment with induction of puberty around 12 years would improve the growth and the psychosocial behavior. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Nilavini. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, sir. Uh, any questions? Any comment? Sir. Yes, sir. Akada, akada. Sir. Sir, sir. Mike. Mike. It is common. I am Dr. Jayasundar. Um, for the male version of this Turner syndrome, can you give this uh, treatment? Same, same Nunans, thing. Nunans, sir, Nunans. Nunans, you mean to say? Male, male, males, in males. It's Nunan. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. yeah it is also approved indication, sir. There are several approved indications like uh, where the growth hormone deficiency will not be there, but growth hormone treatment can be used to improve the height. So one is the Turner syndrome, the Noonan syndrome, prader willi syndrome. So there are uh, uh, even in acandroplasia also it has been tried. Even the chronic kidney disease associated uh, uh, short stature also can be treated with growth hormone therapy. Any more question? No, thank you, Dr. Nilaveni, for the you. nice lecture. Thank you very much. So, from from a Gandhi, Gandhi, we had a paper publication in uh, IGM, Indian Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism, in 2016, of 20 cases of growth hormone therapy on Turner syndrome. Follow up was there for four years of the patients. So, somebody interested can go through an article. Indian Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism, 2016, publication from Gandhi Medical College, Department of Endocrinology, and we are the authors for that uh, article. And uh, patients are there. Sometimes we are getting a CM relief fund for the growth hormone therapy. Government sometimes providing RQC. We are getting small, small time RQC approvals. ESI growth hormone is available like left and right. And for poor patients also, we can do something. For uh, high tech city patients, for Hyderabad, no need of uh, thinking about money you can start a growth hormone therapy, low doses. So 50 micrograms per kg per day. So easy to remember for youngsters, what's the dose for exam question? 50 micrograms per kg per day, right? So growth hormone is a common condition, easy to diagnose if you have a inclination to the moeni sida, bone, bone, carrying angle, important, and short neck is important, right? So thank you, Nilaveni, for seeking time and uh, making a Wonderful presentation. Next speaker is likely to have a, is my junior in Varangal, and is uh, so as a senior, I'm proud of uh, as a chairperson. Kiran, Kiran, Kiran Peddi. We we used to call Kiran, but everybody knows by name Peddi, Peddi. So he's a gastroenterologist, trained in UK, and is a is a MRCP examiner. Very few people in India as a MRCP examiner, international examiner and is a specialty gastro trained in, in, trained in UK because of uh, love for India, ba Bharat, 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 he came from UK to serve the Indian patients. I'm, uh, that's why my, my father and my uncle and my all family members are his patients only. So lucky to have a speaker like uh, Kiran in the morning time. And uh, reputation, you know, you, you, sky is the limit for his to talk about his uh, papers and uh, this thing and this thing. And he's especially interested in IBD, IBD trained in Australia. And Kiran, we had one case in Prime admitted in Gandhi, uh, 16 years girl, IBD with bleeding perfectum and polyuria, central, central DI. Okay. Central DI with uh, IBD, bleeding perfectum, Prime uh, admitted and we are working up this thing. So 16 years girl with IBD for your uh, specialty interest. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Srinivas Rao. Uh, First of all, at the outset, uh, I would like to congratulate the entire idea uh, management, especially uh, Dr. Sham, Dr. Srinivasro, Dr. Bhavani, and thank you, uh, Professor Sudhakar Rogaru, for inviting me to talk on this topic. Uh, my topic being a gastroenterologist is diabetes and the gut. So in the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to give an overview of what are all the kind of uh, gastrointestinal diseases commonly associated with diabetes. Okay. 
So probably the GA is the, uh, the closest organ or uh, system involved uh, in relation to diabetes because diabetes is very closely associated with gut disorders or the luminal intestinal disorders, uh, liver disorders and also pancreatic disorders as all of us know. So when it comes to the luminal uh, pathology, uh, uh, diabetes can affect uh, gut by autonomic neuropathy, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and also a lot of diabetes drugs can cause a lot of GI issues. Uh, we all know that liver is uh, again affected by diabetes or associated in the form of fatty liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which can lead to chronic liver disease. Pancreas, uh, we again know that uh, chronic pancreatitis one second. Chronic pancreatitis is again uh, closely related to, sorry, diabetes. And there's a lot of emphasis on a uh, lot of research in the focus area of the role of microbiota and diabetes. We'll talk a few things on it. So coming with uh, the starting with the luminal pathology, diabetic autonomic neuropathy, which is called, uh, in other words, enteropathy and gastrointestinal tract. We uh, commonly see a lot of diabetic patients, almost 50% of the patients with diabetes experience disabling uh, GI symptoms in the form of nausea, vomiting, bloating, early satiety, and also abdominal pain. You can divide these symptoms into four gut symptoms in the form of nausea, vomiting, and bloating, or mid and hind gut symptoms in the form of abdominal pain, diarrhea, constipation, and also fecal incontinence sometimes. And it's mainly related to the dysmotility, which is a result of a diabetic autonomic neuropathy, which leads to enteropathy. Uh, interestingly, esophageal disorders are the commonest, but uh, uh, paradoxically, the gastroparesis is the most widely studied uh, in patients with diabetics. Uh, sorry, the slides are taking some time to move. Okay, so uh, this is a pictorial uh, view of enteric nervous system, which is very complex and very uh, meticulously organized nervous system within the gut wall. So the three common uh, nervous, uh, or the group of neurons involved in uh, enteric nervous system are IPAN, intrinsic uh, 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 autonomic neurons, and uh, uh, glial cells, and also interstitial cells of Casel, who are, which are called pacemaker of the intestine. Pictures of mood actually. So, fine. So, hyperglycemia and diabetes and how it is going to affect uh, gut autonomic neuropathy in the form of uh, uh, altering metabolism. We all know that hyperglycemia can initiate a trigger of alternative metabolic pathways like polyol pathways and uh, it can lead to advanced glycated end products. I think the slides are blurred. Um, you can see, oh, uh, it was not the exact slides, but it has changed a bit on the email, I think. Fine. So uh, advanced glycated end products, which can actually uh, trigger free, free oxygen radicals and also cause oxidative stress on the neurons. And the interstitial cells of casual, which are uh, regarded as the pacemaker cells for intestine, uh, the hyperglycemia will result in loss of interstitial cells of casual, which leads to decreased contractility and then uh, dysregulation of the movements of the intestine. And this uh, hyperglycemia per se will cause osmotic stress and uh, inflammatory pathways which are triggered in many ways. Again, the slide is condensed a bit. Uh, so the upper GA manifestations are gastroesophageal reflux disease and Barrett's which can lead to Barrett's and then adenocarcinoma later on. And lower GA manifestations are uh, small, uh, small intestine motility disorders and small bowel bacterial overgrowth. So there are various uh, modern techniques for assessing GA motility uh, in the form of gastric emptying scintigraphy and whole gut scintigraphy and radionuclide imaging and wireless capsule uh, motility capsule. But to be honest, not all of them are widely available even uh, for the routine gastroenterologist, but gastric emptying studies are commonly uh, done. So how do you manage diabetic enteropathy? So once uh, enteropathy sets in, there is no obvious cure, but we can prevent or delay neuropathy by strict glycemic control and the gastroparesis can be managed by dietary modifications, prokinetics, tricyclic antidepressants, and also various endoscopic procedures of late uh, took priority in the form of balloon dilatation of the pyloric channels, 
Botox injection of the pyloric channel, and also there is a new poem uh, procedure called G poem, gastro paroral endoscopic myotomy procedure, where we can tunnel uh, close to the pylorus, and then done by only few gastroenterologists. Um, and the diabetic enteropathy commonly manifests as a diarrhea. So this can be managed by fiber supplementation, which increases the stool consistency, increases the holding capacity for the patient. Loperamide can also uh, be used. Constipation can be effectively tackled by purcolopride and abdominal pain with uh, tricyclic antidepressant and SSRI. Um, again, this slide is a little blur, but we, uh, anybody with diabetes presenting with malabsorption features like B12 deficiency, vitamin D deficiency, and anemia, please think about celiac disease because the diabetes hyperglycemia per se can cause uh, uh, immune uh, upregulation and can cause intestinal small will, intestinal damage resulting in malabsorption features. We are all uh, very, very familiar and worried about NAFLD and diabetes. And nowadays, uh, the NAFLD is perceived as anybody you do ultrasound, they get a fatty liver. So 25 to 30% of the general population has NAFLD. And it is very strongly associated with the metabolic syndrome in the form of obesity, type 2 diabetes, and also dyslipidemia. And NAFLD is also associated with other endocrine disorders like hypothyroid, PCOD, psoriasis, and osteoporosis. It has two steps. Whenever we talk about NAFLD, we either talk about steatosis, that means just a fatty liver alone, that is called NAFL, N-A-F-L, and if the fatty liver is associated with inflammation and fibrosis, that is called NASH. And it also have bad, previously we used to think that uh, anybody with diabetes has a risk of developing NAFL, but nowadays the latest research is showing that it's actually a bi-direction bi relationship. And that means anybody with NAFL can also be at a higher risk of diabetes. So type 2 diabetes and NAFL and uh, triglyceride derived uh, toxic metabolites accumulate in the liver, pancreas and muscle leading to uh, lipotoxicity which can increase hepatic insulin resistance thereby predisposing patients with NAFL to type 2 diabetes. So a 2 to 5 fold increase in the risk of type 2 diabetes in NAFL patient. These are a few of the studies showing increased incidence of type 2 diabetes in NAFL. I won't go into details of this but you can see it's actually spelt uh, other way around. So the, the last column on the left, if you can see that, it's a uh, case of the type 2 diabetes versus NAFLD versus uh, non-NAFLD. So 8.1 versus 1.8, for example. So people with type 2 diabetes, uh, sorry, people with NAFLD has got increased incidence of na uh, type 2 diabetes. And what about uh, uh, mechanism of NAFLD in diabetes, reverse way? So insulin resistance and then a lot of uh, uh, chain uh, gene uh, uh, polymorphisms, hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia can increase free fatty acids and lipid deposition leading to NAFLD and NASH and thereby hepatic fibrosis. This again, some of the studies showing increased incidence of NAFLD in type 2. So what I showed in the last four slides is increased incidence of uh, type 2 in NAFLD and increased incidence of NAFLD in type 2 as well. So that's a bidirectional uh, pathology. So that brings out the importance of screening of all our patients. And most of the European guidelines recommend screening all the patients with NAFLD for diabetes. Whenever we get patients with NAFLD, we should be screening for diabetes in the form of random glucose at least and uh, HbA1c. And American Diabetes Association recommends screening all diabetic patients with elevated liver enzymes and or liver stiffness for NAFLD. And, but American Association Liver Disease doesn't recommend the same way. So essentially, we can adopt to our practice, but uh, my recommendation would be all of us gastroenterologists should screen for diabetes, anybody with NAFLD, and all diabetic patients should be screened for NAFLD as well. And this is a big area nowadays, gut microbiome and diabetes. When I say gut microbiota, which in, uh, implies that there are 10 to, 4, 10 to the power of 14 bacteria in the GI tract, and the, micro, the term microbiome refers to genome of all these bacteria. So there's a subtle difference in the terminology. And whenever we get altered composition of intestinal microbiome, and it can contribute to obesity, diabetes, and heart failure. And uh, a lot of research is going on in this area now. So commonly, there are six phyla of uh, microbiota in our intestines. And the common uh, phyla are firmicutes, bacteroids, protobacteria, actinobacteria, fusibacteria, and vericomicrobia. So any disturbance in this composition of these six phyla, we call it dysbiosis. The dysbiosis will predispose the patients for diabetes. Um, so this is various ways. You can go for uh, the microbiota increasing uh, protection, production of uh, short chain fatty acids, and these are various mechanisms how the uh, dysbiosis can predispose to diabetes and all. Okay. So 
So unfortunately, the slides are a little slurry here. No? So the dysbiosis can de re lead to decrease in short chain fatty acids and loss of self tolerance and increase the regulation of immune uh, systems and alteration of uh, um, TUR4 and then thereby de leading to development of type 1 diabetes. Similarly, role of microbiota in type 2 diabetes increase uh, inflammatory pathways, uh, insulin resistance, and then development of type 2 diabetes. So it's clearly the, a lot of studies are showing that uh, any disturbance in the microbiota in the form of dysbiosis predispose the patient to uh, type 2 diabetes. So uh, again, that uh, the therapeutic implication of this is if you have therapies which can uh, correct this dysbiosis that can improve glycemic control in our patients. So there are other GI diseases which are associated with diabetes in the form of autoimmune gastritis and pernicious anemia. Colorectal cancers are also increasing incidence in patients with diabetes. And pancreatic excrement insufficiency is also associated with diabetes. So ladies and gentlemen, in summary, gut diseases contribute to a significant proportion of complications among diabetic patients. We need to be aware of various manifestations of enteropathy among diabetic patients. So as soon as they complain of early satiety, upper GI symptoms, and abdominal bloating, we need to focus on glycemic control and target uh, strict glycemic control for improvement of enteropathy because there is no obvious cure, but by controlling the glucose levels and uh, improving the glycemic control, uh, one can uh, prevent the progression of enteropathy. And we need to consider screening all our diabetic patients for NAFLD and also vice versa. And anybody we diabetic patient presenting with uh, malabsorption, we should suspect celiac disease. And we also need to be aware of uh, other rare complications of GA complications or diabetes like colorectal cancers and uh, celiac disease, pernicious anemia and autoimmune gastritis. Microbiota is an exciting area in diabetics and uh, one can consider pre and probiotic or in other words symbiotic combination. Symbiotic is a combination of pre and probiotic. Symbiotic uh, supplementation as an additional supplement for better glycemic control uh, in addition to the standard diabetes therapy. Thank you very much. So thank you, Kiran, for sticking to time. And he has, he has got a FRCP London for a medical contribution to medical education. I think he has given uh, for the degree for this talk, short and sweet talk, right? And any questions? Uh, any questions? Yeah, I have one question. The usual practice in our uh, clinics uh, all of our patients have some GI, uh, you know, upset. How much of that is due to metformin as opposed to irritable bowel? Nowadays we hear irritable bowel quite uh, frequently. What should we as diabetologists do to handle GI symptoms in our clinic? Actually, I had a slide on metformin and GI, but I deleted for uh, some purpose. Uh, the very pertinent question, Dr. Sham. So, a uh, lot of patients complain of uh, GI intolerance with metformin. So, my algorithm is... I exclude other possibilities and uh, treat blindly. If the patient is not willing for going for any evaluation, I treat for small intestinal bacterial lower growth and still not getting better and all the investigations are normal, endoscopy, colonoscopy, normal. I recommend to my diabetologist for changing the metformin. I'm anti-metformin uh, person and wherever I go, I, my gastroenterologist, my colleague diabetologist always say that you, all, you don't like metformin at all. So, uh, you're very pertinent question. You need to evaluate other causes first and treat for small intestinal bacterial growth if still pertinent and uh, enteropathy we can't prove but at least metformin we can stop and then look for the benefit we had a lot of experience of diarrhea, diarrhea metformin causing diarrhea so so once you stop it automatically diarrhea is going to stop oh. yeah so see that this thing reduce the doses and see that this, again if you want to start again start with the low doses and try to uh, up, uh, slowly try to operate and uh, kiran there is any uh, difference between before giving a food and after giving food, uh, any GI side effects like metformin, any studies are there? Metformin? Metformin before giving, after uh, giving food. I'm, I'm not aware of any studies looking at that and also I'm not aware of any uh, reduced, smaller dose of metformin is better tolerated in terms of GI mm -hmm. point of view, but a lot of patients come back with a better tolerance, but I tend to change it altogether. But I'm not aware with relation to the food, any studies putting benefit or uh, more harm. 
So uh, that uh, problem is very, very important actually <laughs> to be addressed. So metformin, uh, as surprisingly, many of the patients who have been on metformin for a longer period of time, many years, and they tolerate it very well, but subsequently Correct. they develop a uh, problem and uh, some, some, as you said, like some patients do respond to the stopping of uh, metformin. But again, uh, after few, like after a gap of uh, at least six months or one year or so, again, reintroduction with a smaller dose again, uh, uh, maybe maybe a better option because because that's one of the important uh, uh, anti diabetic medication which we have in our hand so addressing the uh, insulin resistance which is an important pathophysiological mechanism in type 2 diabetes patients so that's what we do in our uh, practice uh, majority of the times sometimes they do respond with the stopping but again reintroduction makes them little tolerable to the metformin that's what we have observed in our practice yes ma'am very true thank you Any, any questions, please? In US, uh, so many people they are giving only metformin for a longer time with higher doses. So that has been ha happened in our family itself. So, what is your comment on that? I mean, I'm anti-metformin only from GI point of view. <laughs> okay, okay. A lot of my patients get uh, metformin-related side effects, but I know metformin is an excellent drug for glycemic control, and I'm sure endocrinologists can uh, comment on what are the uh, long-term effects of metformin, in other words. But GI-wise, uh, metformin is very, very common uh, in causing a lot of side effects and all. People having uh, GI disturbance, they are putting metformin only in US. That is the reason why they are putting and our people are not uh, against of this. What is that? Uh, I don't know whether putting metformin for GA symptoms, madam. I think it's no, called... No. Metformin for the diabetic people having GA symptoms also, they are continuing only with Somebody metformin. Yeah. yeah. So we need to identify and exclude other causes. And once we think the metformin the culprit, we can change and see. And there are some studies done on metformin in relation to fatty liver as well before. So there was some beneficial role was also perceived in these patients. But from luminal point of view, it's it's an enemy. Any questions? Otherwise, uh, uh, you also talked about the gastroparesis, sir. Uh, I'm Dr. Abdul Aziz. The treatment for that, the erythromycin that we give, how long can we continue uh, for that condition, and what side effects can we expect for gastroparesis? Uh, that is, uh, any prokinetic will have a lot of side effects if used on long-term basis. So short-term basis, it's okay. Any prokinetic is okay. and But long-term basis, they lead to a lot of side effects, including QT prolongation and a lot of other side effects as well. And the newer prokinetic, which is uh, procalopridone, is supposed to be slightly better. And sinitapride is, uh, is also supposed to be slightly better. So once we use short-term, then if you think, if you prove that it's only gastroparesis, nothing else, one can resolve to other uh, therapies like endoscopic ther therapies like balloon dilatation of the pylorus and also G poem sometimes. But we have to prove that there is no other pathology. Thank you, sir. So, congratulations for the excellent talk, Dr. Kiran. Uh, I uh, just wanted to, just to supplement what uh, Dr. Uma was saying that, you know, uh, metformin may be given in spite of GI symptoms when it could be because of many other factors other Correct. than metformin intolerance itself. So, how would you sort of practically differentiate these because it could be because of autonomic neuropathy, it could be because of yeah. uh, bacterial overgrowth, it could be, you know, uh, several factors could be causing the uh, GI symptoms in people who are on metformin. So, where would you actually stop metformin and how would you uh, sort of differentiate these features? If you could just highlight that, that will be good. Yeah, we're just uh, talking on that, uh, Dr. Rakesai. So, basically, um, we need to exclude other pathologies, including small bowel lacteal growth by doing hydrogen breast test. The only two differences, we, two conditions we cannot differentiate, cannot prove is okay. metformin-induced entropathy or is it autonomic-induced entropathy. We cannot differentiate. We just have to change the medication and see if it improves, that's the culprit. If not, the probably entropathy, patient has got entropathy, not getting better. Even if you stop metformin, one can continue that. Because there is no test to prove entropathy unless, I mean, we do gastroparesis studies and uh, colonic uh, motility studies and all, but not widely available. So, any, no questions, any, any questions, youngsters, especially we are expecting questions from youngsters. 
So somebody, anybody interested in youngsters, research work, this thing, micro, microbiota, diabetes, obesity, lot of literature is there, you can do a lot of studies, you can become a Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize winners also. <laughs> somebody interested? Otherwise, if there's no questions, we are closing the session. Thanks. For Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for two speakers. And, uh, that's up. That's up. Please get it here. That's Srinivas. So we are after the presentation for you uh, your inspiring academic presentations. Thank you very much Professor Dr. N. Sudhakar Rao Garu, Professor Dr. P. Srinivas Rao Garu for organizing the chairs and thank you very much Professor Dr. Nilaveni ma'am on, on the topic of Turner syndrome as it is one of the common chromosomal dysgenesis. Thank you very much Dr. Kiran Peddi sir on the topic diabetes and gut for the incredible articulation. We are overwhelmed by your presentation. Grateful. We are grateful to all the doctors. We now move into the next part of the summit. I request all the dignitaries and delegates to kindly scan the QR code which is presented in front of you for the updated agenda of the conference. And I kindly request all the dignitaries to synchronize the time management for your presentations. Thank you very much. I would like to designate Professor Dr. Rakesh Sahai, Joint Secretary RSSDI Aero, former Secretary Endocrine Society of India, Founder Secretary South Asian Federation of Endocrine Societies, former Chairman of AP Chapter R, SSSDI and Hyderabad Chapter of API. Associate Editor of Indian Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism. Fellowship of American College of Endocrinology in 2009. Fellowship in RSSDI 2015. Fellowship of Indian College of Physicians 2006. Fellowship in Indian Academy of Clinical Medicine 2008. Senior Lectureship Ordination in Association Physicians of India for 2008. I cordially invite Professor Dr. Rakesh Sahai to occupy Honorable Chair on the stage. Expect big round of applause. Thank you, everybody. I authorize to designate Dr. Sham Kalwalpalli, a consultant endocrinologist at Idea Clinics. I enhance my warm welcome to Dr. Sham Kalwalpalli and appeal him to take his chair of honor. Thank you so much, sir. I request our delegates and uh, dignitaries to syn synchronize with time management with your presentations. Thank you. Is it, uh, should I like to stop? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all for coming today for the conference. Uh, so uh, the next topic is little different from the actual medicine. Uh, it's more about uh, the looking at healthcare delivery. The stakeholders are changing. So in that regard, uh, the 
next topic is given by uh, mr ratnakar samavedam uh, can i invite him onto the stage uh, sir is not a doctor but he understands more about healthcare than many of us uh, he is a chartered accountant by profession he is a iim bangalore alumni uh, so the the one person uh, all youth should probably keep in touch is him if you have any startup ideas in healthcare he is the one who understands both aspects whether it's doctor side of the health industry finances i think he is bringing bangalore to hyderabad in terms of funding so any one who has an idea in health sector wanting to explore so over to you sir to give your talk on uh, this topic dr bhavani garu dr rakesh sahai i am working with all the three of them for last 3 uh, years very closely on various things and currently i represent i represent as a investment director for hyderabad angels we invest in startups we are regularly monitoring what startups are doing today and how things are changing about so one of the topic he requested today is how is the healthcare industry outlook and startup ecosystem in healthcare is changing a lot the reason is i think you are all hearing startup 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 especially 2020 2021 has taken the startup ecosystem 500 times more than what it has happened over a decade so that is one of the critical thing that changed and masked lot of things in this world uh, how the startup ecosystem is changing and startups are also disrupting and healthcare i hope you all agree what really happening in this world so one of the key thing uh, because we look into various reports before investing into startups one of the key thing is the advent of pandemic i think covid has changed healthcare industry a lot not only healthcare fintech ecosystem you are hearing about fintech consumer has been changed a lot so healthcare is no exception and this has resulted technology on one hand technology as a backbone evolved to meet the necessities of tough time on other hand humanity become an assessing factor among many where various medias were used to provide relevant and urgent solutions within the community i hope you all agree with that actually how things are changing so when i uh, look into our technology ecosystem i think phone has been changed a lot when 1g came it is the voice discussing between the two parties 2g came sms two different parties can exchange the notes 3g came internet came on the mobile phone a lot and uh, we started using many application and iphone got introduced in 2007 saying that through internet you can do many applications and 4g has uh, taken the advent to the next level altogether in this technology sector actually and what we are all seeing is 4g the apps are coming data is becoming a very important uh, scenario for many startups today so 4g is helping that now 5g is coming it is changing a lot in 5g 5g what really people are saying is humans and machines machines and machines will start communicating each other with the speed what really happening and this communication between machines human and machines and machines is going to change a lot how we see our next 10 years or so this decade is going to us a lot of difference and we already seen changes in e-commerce we seen change in banking sector i think you are closely watching what really happening over there we are seen very clearly changes in logistics space i think you are all watching the speedy delivery and other things what really happening today and uh, the agri tech is also changing a lot agriculture activity agriculture production is changing and healthcare is no exception healthcare already taking certain toll and uh, now more than 2 years skyfi innovations and important discussions have surfaced under healthcare the healthcare market is predicted to raise 133.44 billion by 2022 that is thrice of fy21 because fy21 has given certain thrust it is expected to grow three times and digital transformation is going to definitely going to make a difference what really we are looking and this is one slide government of india has put on their website why they need to come to india and look at india for the healthcare 
They are saying that the healthcare market in India is expected to reach US dollar $372 billion. They are covering all facets of life, not only doctors, not only pharma, not only medical devices, not only diagnostic, not only pharma, pharmacies. They are saying the overall healthcare market in India is going to be $372 billion. India public expectation on healthcare went to 1.8% in 2021 so there is a lot of pressure on government in india to expand on health care they are saying we are going to and we are going to change and one more thing happened india has uh, bharat covid shield and covax and india another country everybody agree struggling with covid india is comparatively far better phase and third is rising manpower yesterday the news 140 crore next year they're saying we are going to cross china in terms of people in the world so we may be world number one in india. and government is also coming with many policies i don't know how many are really watching there are hundreds of policies are coming to make ease of health care that's what you need to observe what is the biggest challenge today doctors are seeing is anticipated recruitment. I think most of the doctors said uh, recruiting a staff is becoming more and more difficult, which they are saying. And enhanced competition from insurance companies, pharmacies, I think you can say pharmacies and other people have came, grocery stores and other retail entities providing primary and virtual care. Now everybody has come into that area and doctors have been really threatened. And most of the physicians who were working in hospitals burned out. This is the third year of their COVID, they burned out a lot. And they said, what are the, one of the survey both are done in US and India, doctors said they are only spending 20% of the day on the patients, remaining 73% on the administration. This is one area they are complaining a lot, that's what they said. But at this can with these various tools which are coming in the digital market uh, space for the doctors. Digital therapeutics, I think you need to closely watch. There are many startups are coming in digital therapeutics. We want you to see doctors enhance their efficiency and time. That's what we are looking at. Consumer variables, I think uh, one of the key things that is Apple brought ECG on their phone, which is giving They are going to Google and searching what really is their disease. And they are going to need advanced digital tools that empower them to do what will be necessary and possible in future is radically different than what is available today. I think patients started seeing Googles, they started coming with various resources, they are watching their apps on the mobile app, what really happening on the health, 
All these things are changing. I want you to watch. What are the, now you are all heard about artificial intelligence, which is coming very heavily in various sectors. In healthcare, what is that? Huge investments are going to happen by 2026. Robot assisted surgery. I think there is a 40 billion market opportunity which they are going to come. Virtual nursing assistance. I think robots are going to replace nurses. That's what they are saying. Administrative workflow. Already we started seeing a lot of changes in EHR and other things coming. Fraud detection because patient records are growing very heavily into the digital space. They are looking at cyber security and fraud is one area which they wanted to do. Dosage error reduction. Connected machines, clinical trial participation, clinical diagnostic, automated image diagnostics. We started seeing investments in this space. Automated image diagnostic, preliminary diagnostic, clinical trial participation. In India, there are many companies are coming, investments are coming in this space. Robot assisted surgery, virtual nursing, administrative workflow is more happening in Korea and US. Maybe they are going to come to India very sooner. What really changed post-COVID, both in US, Europe, and India put together, they did, uh, they're saying we want to do a lot of activity with the doctor virtually. You can see the slides. Regular uh, mental health visits, they want to do virtually 62%. Initial meeting with doctor, I think telemedicine you are observing, they're saying 52% wanted to have telemedicine as their this thing. Urgent care, even in urgent care, people are looking for 53%. Post-discharge surgery follow-up, they wanted to do virtually 47%. Chronic care check-ins, 51%. Prescription renewal, 62%. This is expected to increase. That blue line is expected to increase further in coming years. The reason is people are born after 2020. They are seeing mobile phones. And they want to discuss people virtually, not physically. That is what we observed. Generation gaps are happening. That is the reason this is expected to increase further. Virtual thing is going to happen. I hope most of the doctors are preparing it. This is a small video which, uh, I don't know whether I can able to play or not, okay. There is a small video on future of health. What they created is every equipment in the home, the mirror, uh, the bed, the monitor, the machines, even in the toilets, all the equipments, what they are using, they are going to give the digital information to you by 2030 and every patient knows what kind of medicine you need to take, what kind of adjustments you need to do on day-to-day -day routine. They are going to see. There is a video on that I will try to share. This is the major things which are happening in the healthcare industry. With regard to startup investment, what really happening? You can see the investments in 2011, which is 1.8 billion, it went to $64 billion last year 2021 this is a huge jump in vcs with the 900 deals across india across the world actually huge money is pouring into healthcare please observe that there so doctors are getting lot of efficient machines around them and you can see uh, us is clearly taking a lead after us china is second and india is third i think you are not able to see because of little bit but if you see total investment across the world U.S. has done almost $37 billion. China has done $12 billion. India has done almost $6 billion investment till date. No other country has got so much of investment. What India is, it is picking up very fast because of the population, what we have as a consumer. And where is the venture capital investing today? A lot of people will be interested. What investments are going from the VC world? Venture capital investment activity moved beyond telehealth to remote monitoring, AI-first products, digital therapeutics, and more. Here the, you can see, initially started with digital care, including telemedicine. Then it moved to remote monitoring and wearables, drug development with AI, digital insurance, surgical robotics, clinical decision support with AI, digital therapeutics, hospital operations, patient recruitment and clinical trials, online pharmacies. I think you are seeing online pharmacies a lot, home test, practice management software and medical coordination. So each area, you can see the dark of the circle, it is getting matured every year, where VCs are investing their money today in the startup world. And where is this investment went in India? And last year, they said the Indian startup ecosystem closed with $42 billion. You would have seen 
in newspapers, in various meetings of the startup ecosystem. $42 billion have been flown in. And one sector which has got big push other than fintech and e-commerce is healthcare. They received $2.2 billion in funding across 131 deals as per INC 42 data. So where is this, how many companies are there in healthcare as per the government records? 3,548 active startups are there in health tech space as of today in India. And most of them which got benefited is online pharmacy. You all know PharmEasy, 1MG, NetMeds, all they have raised huge funds. 33% of the funding went, went for them. Healthcare analytics, 21%. Innova, Innova, sir, this is a company which manages employee database. And they give a lot of digital analytics to them. They have become a unicorn much faster than anybody health. Healthplex, I think, fix I've written. Healthplex is another thing most of the doctors have used. Fitness and wellness, cure fit, I think that is what one area they are doing. Medtech, pristine care is one of them. All of you know that they got 11.6%. Most of the junk they have taken care. Personal health management and telemedicine. Telemedicine at one time, it was number one in India around four years back. It started coming down because it become very easy. A lot of people started using. This is where the money is going out. So one thing which we are bringing to the notice of the uh, lot of doctors and customers is with the explosion of direct to consumer business, using technology to empower people, to personalize their experience with company. Instead of going to doctor office for appointment and testing, telemedicine at home diagnostic will take streamline more stake in the company, in the healthcare system. And modern industry, the trials which we are seeing the business world using artificial intelligence, putting patient first and digitalization of healthcare record is going to change the entire healthcare system today. This is what we are observing in healthcare industry. There are a lot of investments are going on. And as predicted in this decade, in next three, four years, the money flow for healthcare industry is going to increase by tenfold. This is what I can conclude. Any questions, happy to take. Thank you. I think uh, you can join us here. We'll have a discussion at the end. So I'll request, I mean, it's my pleasure now to, uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Santosh Kraletti, who's a senior public health specialist. He's a member of the National Medical Commission uh, and also a member of uh, the National Human Rights Commission. He's uh, the Joint Secretary of Saksham. He's the country director of uh, an NGO called Kamba. He's the founder director of uh, Pranav, which is a newborn follow-up clinic. He's also a founder director of, of Dhatri Ma Mother's Milk Bank. He's founder secretary of uh, Global Illumin and also national health advisor for Doctors for Seva. So as we can see, uh, Dr. Santosh is very active in the space of public health and, and has been uh, uh, involved in very many organizations. He's going to speak to us about uh, data and preventive health. So over to Dr. Santosh. Thank you, Dr. Sahai. Uh, so very good morning to all. First of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Idea Health Clinics uh, for having this wonderful Idea Clinics National Conference. Usually, clinics are, I mean, the speaker who just spoke before me, are lost in either clinic or administrative work. But organizing something of this sort, like a medical college, a research institute, is very, very commendable. So a big round of applause to Idea Clinics. So Dr. Shyam, Dr. Sudhakar, Dr. Bhavani, and, and the team, many, many congratulations for this. And I hope uh, the saga continues year on year. So uh, before I um, um, talk about uh, NMC and probably some of its aspects which I was uh, asked to discuss, I also uh, uh, wanted to share some of the data perspectives uh, as I work very closely with Arugishri and Aishman Bharat as well. So uh, there's a very uh, great uh, gentleman um, called Edward Demings. Edward Deming is uh, a management consultant known for total quality improvement and, uh, and total quality management. So he spoke uh, 
uh, and he designed many, many models on, especially based on data. And he said, uh, in God we trust, everyone else bring data. So, okay, we, we will trust God, but we will not trust anyone else. Anyone else who comes to us, please bring your data. So that's what Edward Deming told. So when we speak or when we formulate a policy, when we formulate uh, an action, a, po uh, a program or a scheme, or even for that matter, even your uh, medication, we require data. So, uh, what I uh, was surprised, uh, especially when I was with uh, Arugishri and later with Aishman Bharat, uh, of course, uh, most of it was an advisory role, that there's huge amount of data. We are sitting on almost uh, Mount Everest and no one is actually looking at the data, no one is using the data, probably sometimes no one is sharing the data. That's also happening. And it is important to compare how much of the expenditures go into Arugashri like health, health programs or Aishman Bharat like health programs. And we have the Honorable Minister coming here. I hope he has few minutes to actually look into these perspectives. And someone actually gives him this perspective. For example, the NHM, Dr. Murthy knows very well, there's a very big program in NHM which deals with, uh, uh, you know, non-communicable diseases. National Program for pro Protection and Control of Cancer, Diabetes, and Cardiovascular Diseases. Now, this is a vertical which was created in NHM, National Health Mission. Now, why we are talking about all of this is because of the reduce the burden on the nation, stay healthy. Now, NHM has this vertical on annual basis, the budget that is allocated for prevention and in primary care and probably to some extent in the secondary care in NCDs, is around 146 crores, 146 crores. It might seem to you very big, and out of that 146 crores of budget, it goes to all the states, all the districts, and out of it, some pilots, what Nano Health did in Telangana, huh? some of those small, small pocket-sized pilot programs to understand the data how much of burden is there. Now, no serious data capture in a systematic manner has happened. But what is the budget of NHM as a whole, National Health Mission? 37,000 crores. And how much is the budget for this NCD? It is 146 crores. So I think you can understand what is the focus that we have as a country on NCD prevention. And this has cancer, this has cardiovascular disease, this was diabetes. Now we all know how much is the burden, so I need not tell you about the burden of disease of diabetes, you, will, you, you know much more than what I know. But this is about the allocation of budgets that is happening. Now if you compare that to what is being spent on an average in Arogishri, for example, in this state or in the state of Andhra Pradesh. In 2013-14, when there was a combined uh, state of Andhra Pradesh, the total budget spent on PTCA, stenting, was 120 crores. 120 crores. And the number of procedures that were done were around 13,000 procedures. Now the data is lying with Arogishri. The data is lying with all the health insurance programs like Aishman Bharat. Very, very sacredly in the history of the patient, it is written about the comorbidities, whether the patient has diabetes, whether the patient has hypertension, whether the patient is obese, whatever. But none of it is being used for policy or probably for the future course of action for this country. 
Now, similarly, bypass surgery's budget in 2013-14 was 90 crores. In single state of Andhra Pradesh at that point of time, only on dialysis, stenting and bypass surgeries, the state of Andhra Pradesh spent through Arogishri more than 350 crore rupees. And the state of combined state of Andhra Pradesh in 2013-14 spent through NHM for NCD data capturing and also for prevention and primary care activities only 3 crore rupees. So prevention, we have an investment of 3 crores. And in tertiary care, we have an investment of 350 crores. So this is the kind of investment that is happening into prevention and tertiary. So now how do we reduce the burden on the nation when nothing is going into, a trickle goes into prevention and then massive Ganga, Brahmaputra together are flowing into tertiary care. So this is what is currently happening in our healthcare system. Now this has already started all over the nation. Ayushman Bharat is uh, now steamrolling across the country. So now the same sort of Arakishi program is going to be pushed across the nation. Uttar Pradesh, Bihar and many other states where previously we didn't have uh, huge tertiary care facilities like in South India. Now small, small hospitals, 100 bed, 200 bed, 300 bed, especially with the kind of investments that we are seeing, some billions of dollars are going to flow to basically take advantage of whatever is happening in Aishman Bharat. So when all of this is happening in the tertiary care sector, what is happening is prime, in the primary care sector is very, very important. And how much of it is going into primary care? So the gentleman who actually presented uh, just now from IM, Bangalore and many such angel investors, I would request them that if there is a way of finding out how much went into primary care investments and how much went, how much went into tertiary care investments, it is also very, very important. I think we require more investments into areas like clinics, like idea clinics or any other clinics which would do more of primary care, more home care, more early detection, more of prevention and more of promotion. And that is key. <laughs> that is key to reduce the burden on our country and on our nation and the whole world. I will, uh, I mean, we all know, we, we can all tell many stories that have happened at our home, in our family, in friends, and how many people we have been losing because of CKD, then the end stage renal disease that is picking up so fast. In Arokishi, for example, when I, I was there, we, would, we were auditing, I mean, we were auditing many cases, and one of the cardiologists with whom we, we were having discussions, who, who spoke about, you know, how to um, do a PTCA uh, in probably a ca in a case which has CKD, should we use Omnipack or VCPAC? You know, that sort of discussions were happening. But the point is, we have, I was speaking to many cardiologists, they say we don't have good data on whether to use Omnipack or VCPAC in a CKD patient. Now, how can we, how can we have data? India is the data mine for all the healthcare companies and investment companies across the globe. Now, why does Microsoft want to come to India or all these investment companies are coming to India? No, no lunches are free. If Facebook is giving you free, of course, it is using you. If YouTube is, using, YouTube is giving you something free, it is using you. So if some Microsoft or some other company is coming and helping in data, it is using India's data to build their own health infrastructure, health analytics, health intelligence, and artificial intelligence. I'm not any other company for that matter. So we have data. We have to use it for ourselves, and I think that is very, very important, and that is key. So what... Uh, I would uh, want to suggest, uh, especially is, and I would want to request, 
Now, many, many stalwarts, especially Dr. Rakesh, who has worked with Usmania Medical College for so long, and many, many professors who are here. I would request you to kindly write um, to organizations like Ayushman Bharat and Arogishri and even NHM and NUHM. We would be more than happy. I mean, there needs to be a lot of policy intervention. There needs to be a lot of data sharing, especially for policy correction in our country in, for prevention and promotion. Uh, for example, now what we are doing at NMC, we have 750 odd medical colleges in India. There was a small committee which was put to understand how the medical colleges are reporting data. We know that a lot of data is fudged. Recently, three medical colleges were cancelled in Hyderabad, in and around Hyderabad, private medical colleges this year. Primarily because their OPD is not even 50, 100. We know the data is, is being fudged. So a lot of data has to be live. So there was a study which NMC did. There's a very interesting project, not in USA, not in Canada, not in UK, but country next door, Thailand. So Thailand has a very uh, interesting program called Thailand Hospital Improvement Program, which they run for all the medical colleges, called TIP. They rate every medical college on 108 indicators. And they have these indicators about uh, door to table time and all of these. So all these medical colleges are being rated. The medical colleges are giving accreditation, are given ranking based on live data. So some of, something of this sort is being envisaged for all the medical colleges across India. So 750 medical colleges will start to report probably on 30 or 40 indicators that we'll start with in next one or two years. So probably one of the biggest indicators that we, want, we would want to have if such national workshops and conferences can suggest is the burden of disease of how many diabetics and hypertensives we have in this country when the patients are coming to these medical colleges. So which is very, very important and the burden is picking up so rapidly. So this is one of the important things that NMC uh, intends to do. So without data, we are just blind and deaf and in the middle of a highway. So with data, we can do many things. And even Sherlock Holmes said it is capital mistake to theorize before we have data. So uh, what my request uh, uh, from this and my, my takeaway from this conference would be that if Idea Clinics can build a huge uh, data warehouse and we can take a lot of policy decisions based on whatever data you are collecting and you are presenting and you will help the policy makers uh, uh, to work in this country to design best, best to the best programs. Especially bring more investment from government into the primary, promotive, and preventive healthcare. So that is what is key. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and let the investments uh, and the, uh, all the new ideas and also startups come up more in preventive and promotive and primary care. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity. We will uh, have a discussion on these two topics and uh, we request Dr. GVS Murthy that we will have his talk after the inauguration because we're going to have the inauguration uh, very soon. So before that, I would like to open up for discussion uh, on these two topics. Yeah, please. Can a mic be passed on to the table there? Yeah, to the left, the first table. Yeah. I'll speak? Yeah, yeah please, please. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Santosh Kumar, uh, for an excellent analysis of, uh, uh, of the data and uh, bringing in a lot of uh, inputs to this hall. Uh, I have a little different opinion about about what you were commenting about uh, investments in primary health care. Investments in primary health care is a combined investment which we actually look into when, when we finally deliver it to, at the level of primary health care. It is, it is just not one NCD or it is just not the NHM or NUHM we look at, but we will also look at 
a common pathway which actually delivers healthcare at the level of primary health centers. And government has come up with very good initiatives in the last seven years or eight years, I would say. Um, there is a lot of good initiative which has come on under the health and wellness centers all across the country. And it is really doing well. I have witnessed in at least seven or eight states in India where these centers are doing very well. And a lot of comprehensive health care is combined here and is delivered as a final common pathway to the general public one. Uh, instead of doctors, they are also now promoting the uh, nurse practitioners to man these health care centers where they look at MCDs, they look at immunization, they look at family welfare, they look at many preventive promotive activities there. So, <coughs> so what I'm trying to say is, uh, recently we have also witnessed COVID immunization. COVID immunization is the largest primary healthcare activity which India has really come up with. So what I'm trying to uh, say is, over the past 35 years, I've been observing the healthcare system and I'm, I'm a part of the government and also a, a part of uh, the other system also. So encouraging things are really, really happening. And I, for, we started from zero, but at least we are now investing something 146 now in the NCTs, which is not enough, I agree. Uh, data also has been improved. A lot of apps, a lot of programs have been put on apps. A lot of data is coming. We are also supporting Government of India in 10 states uh, in looking at the data, the TB-related data, uh, which actually we, we take out the TB-related data and give a meaningful analysis to the states to really respond on to this. So things are, doing, things are going on well. We need to do much better. And initiatives like this also would really add into this. I am very positive. Can you introduce yourself? I am Dr. Satish. I work for an organization called Share India. And Share India. Share India. Share India. Yeah. And also I worked in many, many, many uh, various other organizations. I will have a private interactions with you again. Thank you. But this was my, my opinion about this. Let us not get, uh, I mean, negative on this, but the country is really moving forward and I have seen a sea change in the last seven, eight years. So I, I just want to end that in a positive note. Thank you. Santosh ji is proud to be here because he is one of the two, two members of NMC from Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. He is one of the members. So we, we, he is helping us like in a teaching institutions. Whenever uh, we give a phone call, immediately we respond and he is getting a lot of medical calls to this thing of population. Santosh ji, I have a small uh, thought process. So. Yoga, pranayama, meditation comes under primary care prevention or not? Absolutely. So if those things we are promoting to one party cross population, I think money doesn't need much. Finances, finances, nothing to worry. And that should be the hour of the day for our India. That's my thought process. Absolutely. So primary care, we should include yoga, prana, meditation, and we should do the data and do the studies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Garu. Uh, so I'll quickly uh, summarize. Even today, um, Though 40 to 45 percent of the out-of-pocket expenditure or healthcare expenditure that is happening in inpatients is happening in private sector. Majority of inpatients are still going to uh, government sector. But in uh, outpatient, even today, you have 70 to 80 percent of the outpatients still going to private sector. So the public sector investments still need to improve. So that's the whole point. And uh, point well taken, health and wellness center picking up. And I think uh, it's a very good uh, move to Aishman Bharat that is happening. And hope we see more uh, health and wellness centers which are manned and which are actively capturing data. But there's another pro problem also that we see. Dell doesn't talk to Deloitte, Deloitte doesn't talk to Microsoft. Microsoft doesn't talk to some other company, ABCD. So every state has its own software company and the data doesn't speak to each other. It's a gazillion number of apps and companies that are working in the healthcare system today and none of them speak to each other and the data is actually very, 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 you know, um, you know, haphazardly uh, there. So I think there needs to be some uh, uh, coherence in those aspects also. But frankly, what you've said is a point well taken. Health and wellness centers are picking up and there is something positive that is happening in the ecosystem. Uh, and on an average, 
there's a paper that was published uh, a couple of years back. On an average, any outpatient who is a diabetic spends around 9,000 rupees from his pocket per annum, which is 1.3% to 1.2% for a class 1 employee. But for a class 4 employee, it is 27% of his annual income. Uh, so, uh, uh, so this is something which we really need to think through. So how much more of public health expenditure can happen at the primary care is most important and of course point well taken. Uh, there's an institute called SV Asa in Bangalore, which I had visited a couple of days ago, a um, couple of years ago, and they have published more than 300 papers, and out of them, almost 50 or 60 are peer-reviewed, and with one of the best universities, the collaborations they have got, especially effect of yoga, pranayam, and all of this on uh, diabetes, and uh, for sure, uh, that's one of the way forwards, and that could be one of the greatest gift India can give to the world. Thanks a lot. Uh, I want to, in the audience we have Manish Ranjan. He has done extensive work on data. He is, uh, you know, we should be proud of him having at Hyderabad. He is a IIT ISB alumni. Can you, Dr. Manish, can you share your experience, uh, you know, apart from taking that award from Clinton, uh, what is that in terms of data you can share. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, doctor. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, at first, congratulations for putting all this together, the entire Idea Clinics team, and I know what it uh, takes to do something like this. So, uh, well, uh, um, so I think the most important uh, thing is uh, we, uh, everyone in the entire uh, healthcare is a long, very long value chain. So, right from someone who starts getting, uh, you know, early. Uh, symptoms of diabetes, a lot has happened, let's say, before that. And, uh, you know, a lot, ha I mean, uh, happens after that. Um, I, there are many stakeholders in the entire uh, uh, long value chain, and uh, everyone is looking at one part of the entire thing, be it the diagnostic company, be it the consultants, and, and so on. But what uh, uh, now uh, we are seeing, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, likes of idea clinics and so we have converted that into a long uh, value, I mean like we are addressing the disease as a whole and not uh, only one rising, uh, let's say blood sugar levels or high thyroid levels and so on. Uh, and that is, uh, can be done only by having a continuous uh, data. Uh, if we uh, solve one spike of, uh, you know, uh, sugar levels, that's not enough, that doesn't help uh, uh, much. So we really need to, if we want to be, uh, uh, focus more on the preventive aspects, then we need to do a, a regular periodic engagement uh, with the individuals and that can happen only by combining uh, clinical, operational and financial data together, which is uh, a, a gap today. There are many systems like uh, everyone said, but one is focusing maybe only on clinical side, but only on operational side or on financial side. But only when we combine all of these three together, that is when the real uh, power uh, comes. So, and uh, yeah, so I think overall, uh, definitely uh, we have a positive side, but I think we are, everyone uh, is eager to make it faster and faster. And I think we are, uh, and everyone in the room is supporting, uh, I believe, uh, in their own uh, ways in making that journey uh, faster. So thank you so much and congratulations again. Yeah. Uh, anybody else, anything else have to share? Uh, are there... Yeah, good morning. I am Ashok Tiwari from CSIR ICT. Uh, I have heard both positive as well as uh, the shortcomings. Shortcomings will always be there. If there are no shortcomings, how do we improve and move forward? Healthcare has improved, indeed, no doubt. And as COVID has given uh, us, in particular, uh, maintaining healthy lifestyle, the clinic idea 
the diabetes endocrinology research update uh, this uh, obesity adiposity and endocrine disorders these are uh, as a biomedical researcher i i see these are lifestyle related diseases as sir has pointed out here uh, that people education towards health and healthy lifestyle has improved as we increase improve the public education and healthy living i think the disease burden will certainly be reduced and dependence on the medicine will ultimately reduce and the burden ultimately to our um, second guards what you call the clinician the doctors will happen the real need is public education and healthy lifestyle there we have to um, uh, invest more uh, in the form of uh, whether finance or idea is concerned data will come see uh, i joined uh, phd in institute of medical sciences banaras in the university in 1986 hardly there were research publications coming out of medical institutions you see internationally now uh, indian um, uh, physicians are contributing uh, to the clinical research and so many data is coming Uh, out of that one clinical studies and uh, when i was doing my research associateship uh, i was dependent on european data and the pathophysiology and so many things now we have uh, indian scenario um, uh, japi is well known journal sir you people might be knowing and excellent articles are coming into that one uh, improvement are there we have to march forward we have to uh, have a positive note only uh, citing the negative aspects we don't have this we don't have that uh, that create a negative mindset whatever little positive we have if we promote that that will give us uh, a, a boost and impetus for the people who are uh, opting into the, these disciplines with this note i thank you all inviting me here in this great audience and uh, this great conference thank you very much i think i am um, dr bhavani i am not a diabetologist or an endocrinologist i am a pediatrician and neonatologist just a comment and um, continuation of uh, what dr satish right satish garu said um this is regard to i know santosh is very much aware of um, the snc use the special newborn care units in india they have a common database there is a common snc use software where the data is entered across the neonatal units in india and it is captured i think that is the way forward where we should have um, a common um, data across india then um, i think it will be um you know very very uh, it's very important for us to capture the data in single database so one nation one data should be our uh, um motive i think yeah thank you yeah i am dr prasad rao in continuation with dr tiwari so i am ceo of amaya life what dr tiwari has told the education awareness so we have done school health since past 10 years and screened 6 lakh children especially for last 3 years for each year 1 lakh tribal students in the maharashtra government we are giving the services where we do the same thing health education health awareness initial problems primary care and preventive care so like our organization so many organizations has to come and associate with the scientific uh institutions like csir so we have associated with csir and developed a, a snack for students especially we found lot of anemia cases 60% more than 60% in our data in last 3 years we found this uh, anemia anemia malnutrition so we have associated with this uh, research organization and developed a, uh, a snack for them a scientifically proven snack for them to improve their anemia and uh, other things like that so there is a good synergy between the research institutes and the organizations definitely there will be an improvement in the health in primary and preventive health care 
I'd just like to make a point. I'm uh, Dr. GVS Murthy. I don't want my back to be facing anybody, so I'll go back. Very interesting comments. I just want you to reflect on one thing. 1947 to 1999, our life expectancy increased by 45 years. But between 2000 and 2022, we've just added another five years in our life expectancy. In terms of investments in health, a large chunk of money has flown in in the last 10 years compared to what was available earlier for healthcare. So there is a dichotomy. And the dichotomy is not in terms of how much we have spent in the quantum. We need to look at on how many people will spend that. We need to look at a per capita expenditure or investment if we want to make a big difference. And unfortunately, when we're talking just in terms of 300 crores becoming 800 crores, we are forgetting that the base on whom that 800 crores is being spent today is very different from the base on which 300 crores were spent on. And therefore, the per capita expenditure on health is the right indicator. And what we need to see is that our life expectancy goes beyond Sri Lanka without the civil strife, before Sri Lanka's strife, they had a better life expectancy, three years difference between our life expectancy and Sri Lanka's life expectancy. Between Thailand and us, four years. So we are investing more, the return is going to be on increased life expectancy. And I think that is where we would need to concentrate. Let's look at what we've done correctly and what we need to do to see that we get that ultimate outcome of healthcare, which is increased life expectancy. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to uh, add a small comment to what Dr. Murthy uh, uh, sir has said. The most important and pertinent investment to increase the base, I mean, what he has actually stated directly, it must and must go into primary care. It must go into preventive care. It must go into prom promotive care. And that's where we can address the maximum amount of people. If we look at programs like Ayushman Bharat, they'll become very huge. And governments will go on investing more and more into Ayushman Bharat or Arugishri Healthcare schemes. And it will be very difficult for the government to pull out any financing out of these models because the expectations will grow. So we will have to positively impact the policy uh, on investments into primary care, primary care and primary care. Thank you. So our Honorable Chief Guest Shri T. Harish Rao Garo, Minister of Finance and Health, Family Welfare, are going to be arrived within five minutes for the inauguration ceremony. Uh, in fact, I think we should Move on with the next talk, uh, Dr. Murthy Garu, if you can carry on with your talk, sir, while we wait for the inauguration. Uh, we would uh, over to you. So, Dr. GVS Murthy is uh, currently the director of P Institute of Public Health uh, in Hyderabad. He work, his work revolves around improving global health and fostering international partnerships to improve the health status of the population. He has uh, been working in this area of public health for a long time. He's, he has established the first community ophthalmology department in the public health sector in India and headed the department from its inception at the RP Center, Dr. Rajendra Prasad Center for Ophthalmic Sciences in the, at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. He also established uh, the Overseas Center of Excellence in South Asian Center for Disabilities Inclusive Development and Research in Hyderabad. And also 
is been on the collaborative project between between this organization and the public health foundation of india so we are honored to have him here today with us he is going to uh, speak to us about uh, his work in this area of uh, community ophthalmology prevalence and associated risk factors and effective models to manage the magnitude of diabetic retinopathy in india so over to dr gvs mohit Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sai. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, listen to all the excellent discussions that took place earlier. So I was lucky that I was not late. Uh, luckily, it is a Saturday, so the traffic is less. So thank you all for the opportunity to share some of my thoughts. I may be an outlier in the sense that regarding the complications. like diabetic retinopathy there may be less of an emphasis but professor sahai has seen to it that when we look at diabetes the importance of a comprehensive model of care is critical and that is why i really appreciate uh, this opportunity to be here when we look at diabetic retinopathy and we look at say 20 25 years ago it was then the 20th you know one of those also had conditions in terms of the causes of blindness and within a span of 20 years it's moved up to be the fifth most important cause of blindness globally as well as in india and that speaks volumes of the importance of diabetic retinopathy in terms of both the global context as well as the indian context also remember that people with diabetes also have higher rates of cataract early cataract a higher risk of glaucoma higher risk of myopia so it's not just the numbers with diabetic retinopathy but the other eye conditions to which diabetes per se predisposes are also important to keep in mind so it's a huge number that we are dealing with if you look at the global perspective 2.6% of all blindness and about 1.9% of moderate to severe visual impairment which is less than the blindness threshold but is not normal vision and if you compare that with the situation in south asia where we are based we are slightly higher than the global average and the global average translates into about 0.8 million people blind and nearly 3.7 million people who are visually impaired if you look at those numbers and the fact that next year we overtake china one out of every four of those people will be resident in india and that is why looking at diabetic retinopathy and the sight loss that diabetic retinopathy leads to is important if you look at the global data there have been a series of meta analyses which have been done and the most important one or the path breaking one was the one in 2010 by yao et al and that for the first time looked at what the global prevalence of diabetic retinopathy is and that looked at the fact that there was about one third of all people with diabetes who would have some amount of diabetic retinopathy and looking at the 2010 data it was estimated that 93 million were people with diabetic retinopathy and these are studies on people with diabetes it's not general population estimates there have been more recent meta analyses done and this shows that the overall prevalence seems to have dropped from about a third that is 34% to about a fifth that is about 22% good news it means that if we do things properly we can actually make a difference on vision threatening diabetic retinopathy as well as overall diabetic retinopathy the bad news is this has happened mostly in the high income countries that decrease from 34 to 22% is mostly because of the difference that we see 
in high income countries where screening programs have been very active and have made a big difference. So the bad news is for us in India, for those in South Asia, for other low and middle income countries, we know what has to be done, but we are not doing that at the moment. And that is the gap that needs to be bridged. If we look at what we are doing today, and if things remain constant in that manner, then by 2045, we are looking at about 160 million people with diabetic retinopathy and 44 million people who have sight-threatening or vision-threatening diabetic retinopathy. So once we know the answer and we do not act towards that answer, it is, you know, the only few people who crack JEE are the ones who are successful. The others, we should not be counted amongst them because we know what the answer is. We need to work towards that. And here is the opportunity that this is something which is avoidable and we could try and make a difference. When you try and look at what the situation in India is, looking at some of the estimates that we have from India, most of these have been conducted through what is called as a rapid assessment of avoidable blindness, which does not have the same finesse as a bigger uh, survey, which is a more detailed examination of the funders. Despite that, we get some estimates, and these estimates in India are lower than what has been projected from the meta-analyses of the global data. And we find that if you look at the prevalence of diabetic retinopathy, we are in the range of about 10 to 15 percent. So say we can average it on to around 13 to 14 percent. But amongst that, if you look at sight threatening diabetic retinopathy, it's almost 6 percent. So compared to what we see in the global analysis, where the proportion of diabetic retinopathy to sight threatening diabetic retinopathy is more wider, we see that in India, that gap is less. So for almost every two people with diabetes, you're seeing, uh, every two people with diabetic retinopathy, you're seeing one with sight-threatening diabetic retinopathy. That's not a good feeling, because it's something which can be rectified. I won't go through all that data here, but just the top-line findings that here, for every two people with diabetic retinopathy, we have nearly one with sight-threatening diabetic retinopathy, and that should be reversed. The risk factors, all of you are well aware of these risk factors, but I like to categorize them into four boxes. The first is biological. I'd like to change my age, I'd like to look like a 21-year-old for the rest of my life. Unfortunately, even if I look like that with Botox, my limbs will not work in the same fashion, so it doesn't make much of a difference. The genes play a role, as do the ethnicity and our sexual dispension, our male or female distribution. And the fact that pregnancy both increases the progression as well as the incidence of diabetic retinopathy. Metabolic, the two most important things that we need to keep in mind are the duration of diabetes and the glycemic control level. Lifestyle, which compounds the misery, alcohol, smoking, abdominal obesity, which is more of a predictor for diabetic retinopathy than just body mass index and serum lipids. The other factors are again very critical. The access to healthcare, where you are residing, like you say, the postal code in the West, here we look at rural urban residents as an indicator of whether you are suffering from a higher risk. Your beliefs, your behaviors, your attitudes towards taking medications all determine the way diabetic retinopathy pans out. Systemic comorbidities is again an important thing to consider. But amongst all these risk factors, the most important that we need to look at is what are those which are modifiable. We put our attention on modifiable and you want me to? 
break now. <laughs> music. 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 <laughs> we feel honored to have with us the Honorable Chief Guest Sri T. Harish Rao Garu, Minister of Finance, Health, Medical and Family Welfare Government of Telangana. T. Harish Rao Garu is an Indian politician. So he's a man of distinct vision, fountainhead of illuminating ideas, a dynamic leader. His integrity and good conscience made him energetic and strong people's leader. On behalf of Idea Clinic's National Conference, Diabetes and Endocrinology Research Update, we would like to extend a grand welcome to our prestigious chief guest, T. Harish Rao Garu, Health Minister of Telangana. Okay, sir. So moving further, it is time for us to begin with the inaugural session now and we finished it. So I request uh, Thank you very much, sir, for the magnanimous, gracious uh, offer for me to complete. So, in terms of the modifiable risk factors, we were looking at access to healthcare as an important modifiable risk factor for diabetic retinopathy. You club that with a biological factor like gender, and then we realize why access to health services, access and affordability to diabetic care is so critical because women are the one who stay back, do not come forward for treatment, and therefore do not and do not have a voice in their management of diabetic retinopathy. And that is why we see this gender disparity, which increases with age. As you get older, this disparity continues and also increases. So that is something that we can make a difference and should make a difference. We did this survey in 11 cities where Professor Rakesh Sahai was also part of this study to look at what the client perceptions are in terms of complications of diabetes. And if you look at this particular slide, 41% of people with diabetes who were interviewed ranked vision loss as their most dreaded complication. All the other complications are also important, but they were worried that if they would go blind or visually impaired, 
and live the rest of their life, it would be a misery for them. And therefore, vision is so critical when we're looking at diabetes. What were the barriers that people talked about? 50% of people with diabetes do not know that they have diabetes. The complications occur over a long period of time, a prolonged period of time. And therefore, the perceived seriousness Kal dekha jayega, you know, that sort of an attitude sets in, and it's there for all of us. The cost of care, modifiable and something that we can act upon. The need to visit different locations. For eyes, I have to go to one place. For my kidney functions, I have to go to another place. For my diabetic care to another place. For my neuropathy to another place. So people felt it is very difficult to go to different places for one condition and therefore that becomes a barrier. The tediousness and lethargy of lifelong medication. You ultimately get bored. If you like biryani, but every day if you have to biryani, ultimately you get bored after some time. It's worse with medications because there is nothing palatable about medications. The other thing that we have to remember is that if there is one person with diabetes in the family, it is difficult to cook for that one person exclusively. So the whole family's attitude has to change that diabetic diets or diabetic causing diets have to be looked at for the entire family rather than for one individual within the family. From the provider side, there's so many people who are providing instant magical cure, practitioners at the local level. And that is a barrier because Allopathic medication is not something which is a magic bullet. It can reduce the situation, but will have to be continued for a long time. The lack of communications between the ophthalmologists on one side, the diabetologists on the other side. With the same person, we do not even share notes, and that, I think, is a big barrier in the system. The paucity of a comprehensive diabetic care setup, and because Sir is here, I think this is a great opportunity that at least a couple of comprehensive diabetic care centers could be set up in the state of Telangana to become a model for the rest of the country. That is the request we would have, where everything is done under one roof and a person with diabetes does not have to go to five or six different locations. treatment The patient will comply better compared to going to five or six places. Uh, involving the community, task shifting. So, sir, kisi ko aank dikha, diabetes mein complications like eye complications are there, kidney ki complications hoti hai, nerve complications hoti hai. To ophthalmologist aankho ko dekhta hai, to he has to go to an ophthalmologist alag jaga, diabetologist ek jaga baithte hai. So in all, there was a combined center in Goa, the medical college had started in Goa, where they had all the services provided in one room. It will be a lot of difference from that. Sir, there is a question from the audience. The other thing is about task sharing. Everything does not have to be done by the ophthalmologist. We have, if we have good trained nurses, Images achi tara leye ja sakte hain and they can then immediately tell the ophthalmologist ki is particular person ko immediate care ki zarurat hai. Just looking at the ophthalmologist doing everything is a waste of resource kyunki bhoat aur kaam hai. Cataract has to be done. You have to look at glaucoma. You have to look at refractive errors. So trying to look at task sharing where people with some skills can be trained to pick up people with retinopathy. That will be an excellent way to go forward. Alag-alag screening modalities hain. Iske upar mein abhi charcha nahi karunga. Just to say that there are cameras that are now available aur jhaan pe you can get a very good image aur agar aap dilate karke dekhte hain then you get a much better image. And nowadays we have ultra wide field fundus camera where even without putting a dilation, you can still get a very good view. They are costly, 
but again a couple of centers like osmania medical college can actually and sarojini devi eye hospital can actually look at something going in that direction bahut se screening modalities hain it could be either in hospitals or in the community and people have experimented with these facilities in india very successfully and we can learn from some of these successful stories we did this queen's trust diabetic retinopathy project across 10 states in india where dr rakesh sahai was also part of that and we showed that you can work very successfully and make a difference if you have a primary care approach which is where diabetic retinopathy hamare jitne primary health centers hain community health centers hain and district hospitals can become the basis for diabetic retinopathy screening alag alag kisam ke logon ne trials kare hain very successful and will be very happy to share these models with you sir just before i end i will talk about artificial intelligence aajkal hum jahan pe bhi jaate hain pehli charcha yahi hoti hai ki artificial intelligence se humne kya kiya but artificial intelligence is not the only answer and this is recently a study done in the us jahan pe unhone seven different artificial intelligence ke algorithms test kare to see how good they are when we are looking at artificial intelligence or in fact any diagnostic test 90 pratishat 90% sensitivity or 90% specificity halanki that is when you detect somebody how many of them are positive agar main 10 logon ko dekhta hu nine of them must be truly positive that is sensitivity unfortunately the seven image out of the seven systems only two had sensitivity better than a clinician so the artificial intelligence models that are available at the moment need to be improved upon to see that they are better than the human diagnosis we have a shortage of human resources so how do how does artificial intelligence help by supplementing the human resource agar agar aapke paas sensitive artificial intelligence system hai then it actually acts as a positive you know, spin for the care of people so what we now need to do to tap the potential task sharing not the ophthalmologists not the physicians lekin hamare optometrists jo hain ophthalmic assistants jo hain nurses jo hain they can be trained to take images and that will reduce the burden on the ophthalmologist and that agar hum artificial intelligence ko is tarah improve kare taki uski jo detection rate hai goes up beyond 90% cost reduce karenge access improve karenge aur reach improve karenge which is the goal for fighting diabetic retinopathy thank you very much sir it's an honor to speak in front of you thank you very much sir so now i take privilege to have with us honorable chief keshriti harish rao garu minister of finance health medical and family welfare government of telangana i'll just uh, talk two minutes about sir taneru harish rao garu is a indian politician serving current minister so just one minute so, sir is not allowing me <laughs> fine sir definitely so i cordially invite professor n sudhakar rao garu to few, to talk few words about the session i welcome you all for this conference again and uh, it's a pleasure and it is a really honor for us dr arish rao garu minister for finance and health is inaugurating this conference and uh, i requested him to come for this just 10 15 minutes for the this committee uh, this one and uh, i really 
he is uh, seeing, uh, you, you know that he is going around the state for various, uh, prime, up to primary center, it is well equipping with the uh, systems. Including, we have a diabetic care, in, even in primary center, with a uh, utmost care, and the glucometer is arranged in every primary center, sub-centers also. And uh, it is going on improving very well. All the, not only that medical side, the education side, even in the field of uh, public health side, he is taking care so that it will improve under dynamic leaders of KCR, the teacher Chakrava. The now I also welcome Dr. Raghunand, the IMA North President and uh, Dr. Uh, Santosh, member National Medical Council, NHRC, and uh, Dr. Murthy, Public Health Foundation. And uh, I uh, welcome my colleagues, Dr. Sahaya, Dr. Srinivas Rao, Dr. Shyam Kalwapalli. And uh, I, th I uh, once again, I don't want to stand between the chief guest and him. So I thank you for the opportunity given to me. Now, Rama, next. So I next invite Dr. Raghunandan, uh, sir, I am a North President, guest of honor, to talk few words about the conference. So I am very happy to uh, be associated with the idea clinics can, uh, for conducting the endocrine uh, national uh, conference and uh, I'm very happy to welcome you all for the conference and appreciate uh, uh, idea clinics for conducting this national conference and uh, I'm very happy that we are to see finance and, finance and uh, health minister with us. It is a very uh, happy moment for us. Thank you very much. So I request Honorable Chief Guest Dr. Harish Rao Garu to please come on to the stage and talk few words about the conference. Um, I am not doctor. <laughs> you made me doctor. Eh? Gauranilu, Atmilu, Shala Grozulunchi, O Manchi Doctor Ga, Manchi Praja Pratanidiga, Atu Prajalo, it Doctor Lalo, Manchi Pethech Kuna Twenty, Pedalu, Doctor N. Sudaka Rogaru, E. Samavishanki, Nandu Kachitanga Ravalani, Varu Ahwan in Chirum Jagindi, Adevitanga. Dr. GVS Mutigaru, Dr. Sham Garu, Dr. Rakesh Garu, Dr. Srinivas Rao Garu, Dr. Santosh Garu, and uh, Dr. Raghavind, Raghavendra Garu, sorry, and Raghunandan Garu, I'm sorry, and uh, all the doctors and media friends, and their Namaskar. Nijaniki Atlantic Conference look around on Dwara, Arokishaka Mantriga, Menguda Chala Nets Kunta Chala Vishal, and the Kante E. Seminar Slow. The speakers will be all, from all over the India, sometimes all over the globe. In fact, Makuda, Ilanti meeting so, Prabhutum, Erekamina Vilhanalu, Avalam Benchali, Maruthuna twenty trends, Saint E. Prabhutum Guda, Mari Prajalak Vaidya Mandin Chadam Lo. Marutuna twenty Samajamlo Ostuna twenty Marpulgani, 
ప్రపంచవ్యాప్తంగా వస్తున్నటువంటి కొత్త టెక్నాలజీస్ కొత్త ఐడియాస్ను మేము నేర్చుకొని వైద్య ఆరోగ్య శాఖను మరింత బలోపేతం చేయడానికి మాకు కూడా ఉపయోగపడతాయి ఇన్ఫ్యాక్ట్ యాజ్ డాక్టర్స్ మీకు ఎంత ఉపయోగపడతాయో మరి గవర్నమెంట్ కూడా ఈక్వల్లీ ఇలాంటి సెమినార్స్ మాకు కూడా అంత ఇంపార్టెంట్ అని నేను అనుకుంటాను బికాస్ మీకు ఇయర్లీ ఆర్ బై ఆల్టర్నేట్ ఇయర్స్ అయినా మీరు ఇట్లాంటి కాన్ఫరెన్స్ పెట్టుకొని గ్లోబల్ ట్రెండ్స్ను ఇవన్నీ కూడా మీరు రివ్యూ చేస్తూ బెస్ట్ ప్రాక్టీసెస్ను నేర్చుకోవడానికి ఇట్లాంటి కాన్ఫరెన్స్ మీకు అన్ని డిపార్ట్మెంట్స్ కూడా తప్పకుండా చేస్తూ ఉంటారు అండ్ విచ్ ఈస్ వెరీ యూస్ఫుల్ టు యూ అట్లే మాకు కూడా ఇది చాలా ఉపయోగమని మేము కూడా అనుకుంటూ ఉంటాం అయితే జనరల్గా ఈరోజు దేశంలో కానీ ప్రపంచంలో కానీ చూసినప్పుడు డిసీజెస్లో ఒక మార్పు అనేది వచ్చింది ఇంతకుముందు వచ్చేటువంటి వ్యాధులు ఇప్పుడు వస్తున్నటువంటి వ్యాధుల మధ్య చాలా తేడా కనబడతా ఉంది నాన్ కమ్యూనికేబుల్ డిసీజెస్ కమ్యూనికేబుల్ డిసీజెస్ ఒకప్పుడు ఈ కమ్యూనికేబుల్ డిసీజెస్ చాలా ఎక్కువగా ఉండేది కానీ మారుతున్నటువంటి ఆహార పొలవాట్లు జీవన శైలి ప్రజల ఆలోచన విధానంలో కొంత మార్పు రావడంతో మరి ఇప్పుడు ఈ నాన్ కమ్యూనికేబుల్ డిసీజెస్ బాగా పెరిగిపోతూ ఉన్నాయి అందువల్ల ఇవాళ ప్రభుత్వాలు కూడా ఏం ఆలోచించాల్సి వస్తుందంటే నిజానికి ప్రైమరీ హెల్త్ కేర్ను బాగా స్ట్రెంగ్తెన్ చేసి మనము ప్రాథమిక దశలోనే ఈ షుగర్ బీపీ లాంటి నాన్ కమ్యూనికేబుల్ డిసీజెస్ను అరెస్ట్ చేయవలసిన అవసరం ఇవాళ గుర్తించాల్సి వస్తూ ఉంది దీంట్లో రెండు ఛాలెంజెస్ ఉన్నాయి ఒకటి ప్రజలు ఏంటంటే తనదాకా వస్తే కానీ గొంతు మీదకి వస్తే కానీ కథలని ఒక మనస్తత్వాన్ని కలిగి ఉంటాం వాయిదా ముందు పుడుతుంది డెసిషన్ అనేది లేట్ ఉంటుంది ఎప్పుడు కూడా ఇంకా ఆ రోజు నడవలేకపోతున్నాను ఇంకా ఆ రోజు ఏదో ప్రాణం మీదకి వచ్చిందంటేనే వాళ్ళు కదులుతుంటారు మనం ఎంత చెప్పినా కూడా ఏమైతుందంటే ఇది చిన్న వ్యాధి అది అది ఏమైందంటే అది ముదిరిపోయి చెదలు బట్టి మొత్తం గొంతు మీదకి వస్తే కానీ ప్రజలు దాన్ని అర్థం చేసుకోలేని పరిస్థితి వచ్చింది అంటే దీనికి ఎడ్యుకేషన్ అనేది చాలా ఇంపార్టెంట్ ప్రజల్లో ఒక అవేర్నెస్ను తేవడం అనేది చాలా ఇంపార్టెంట్ ఈ మధ్య కాలంలో మేము ఎన్సీడీ స్క్రీనింగ్ పెట్టి రాష్ట్రం మొత్తం కూడా బీపీ షుగర్ను ఖచ్చితంగా మన ప్రతి పౌరుణ్ణి కూడా చెక్ చేయాలని ప్రయత్నం చేస్తే కొన్ని ఆశ్చర్యకరమైన ఫలితాలు బయటకు వస్తున్నాయి ఈ మధ్య నిమ్స్లో కూడా మేము కిడ్నీ పేషెంట్స్ చాలా ఎక్కువ వస్తుంటే ఒక అనాలిసిస్ తీసుకోవడం జరిగింది నిమ్స్లో వస్తున్నటువంటి డయాలసిస్ పేషెంట్స్ను కిడ్నీ వ్యాధిగ్రస్తులను ఒక అనాలిసిస్ చేస్తే ముప్పై ఏళ్ళు నలభై ఏళ్ళ వయసు వాళ్ళకు కూడా కిడ్నీ సమస్యలు వస్తూ ఉన్నాయి ఇంత చిన్న వయసు వాళ్ళకు వస్తూ ఉన్నాయి అసలు ఎందుకు ఈ వ్యాధి ఇంతగా పెరుగుతుందని చూసినప్పుడు మోస్ట్లీ దట్ ఈస్ బికాస్ ఆఫ్ షుగర్ చాలామంది కూడా అందులో కొన్ని సంవత్సరాల తరబడి బీపీతో షుగర్తో బాధపడుతున్నటువంటి వాళ్ళు అందులో కొంతమంది తెలిసి బాధపడుతున్నారు కొంతమందికి వారికి షుగర్ బీపీ లాంటి ఇబ్బందులు ఉన్నాయని వారికి ఇప్పటికీ తెలియనటువంటి పరిస్థితుల్లో కూడా ఉన్నారు మొన్న వరల్డ్ బీపీ డే హైపోటెన్షియల్ డే జరిగితే ఇలాంటి ఇంకొక టీము హైదరాబాద్లో వాళ్ళు ర్యాండమ్గా వెళ్ళి అక్కడక్కడ కొన్ని చెక్ చేసినారు ఆన్ బిహాఫ్ ఆఫ్ దేర్ డిపార్ట్మెంట్ అండ్ దేర్ వింగ్ వాళ్ళు వెళ్ళి మన బీఆర్కే ఆర్ పార్క్ దగ్గర ఉదయాన్నే వాకింగ్కి వచ్చే వాళ్ళందరినీ దొరకబట్టి బీపీ చెక్ చేసినారు హైదరాబాద్లో వేరియస్ లొకేషన్స్లో ఈ మార్నింగ్ వాకింగ్కి వచ్చే వాళ్ళను జాగింగ్కి వచ్చే వాళ్ళను లేదా కొన్ని కార్పొరేట్ ఐటీ ఆఫీసులు అదర్ ఆఫీసెస్ గవర్నమెంట్ ఇన్స్టిట్యూషన్స్ దగ్గర నిలబడి ఉదయాన్నే అందరు చెక్ చేస్తుంటే నాకు బీపీ లేదు ఐమ్ ఆల్ రైట్ ఐమ్ ఆల్ రైట్ అని వెళ్తున్నారు దొరకబట్టి కూడా చేస్తే దెన్ దే ఫౌండ్ దట్ దేర్ సఫరింగ్ విత్ బీపీ సో అట్లా ఒక గమనిస్తే అంటే అఫ్కోర్స్ వాళ్ళ దాంట్లో చాలా ఎక్కువ వచ్చింది అనుకోండి ఎవ్రీ హండ్రెడ్లో థర్టీ మెంబర్స్కి బీపీ వచ్చింది చాలా ఎక్కువగా వచ్చింది అఫ్కోర్స్ కానీ ఎంత సర్ప్రైజ్ అంటే అంత ఉందని అసలు ఎవరు ఊహించలేదు అప్పటిదాకా వాళ్ళకు కూడా తెలియదు వాళ్ళకి బీపీ ఉన్నదని మేము రాష్ట్ర ప్రభుత్వం తరఫున ఎన్సీడీ స్క్రీనింగ్లో ఒక కోటి ముప్పై నాలుగు లక్షల మందిని మేము స్క్రీన్ చేస్తే అంటే అఫ్కోర్స్ మేము చేసింది ఎక్కువ గ్రామీణ ప్రాంతాల్లో దీని ప్రివలెన్స్ ఏమో ఎక్కువగా పట్టణ ప్రాంతాల్లో కొంచెం ఎక్కువ ఉంటుంది బికాస్ ఇక్కడ లైఫ్ స్టైల్స్ డిఫరెంట్గా ఉంటాయి అండ్ వీళ్ళ పని ఒత్తిడి కూడా ఎక్కువగా ఉంటుంటుంది భార్యాభర్తలు ఇద్దరు ఉద్యోగం చేయడం కానీ ఇంకా ఈ వర్క్ స్టైలు లైఫ్ స్టైలు పొల్యూషను స్ట్రెస్సు స్లీప్లీనెస్నెస్ దీంతో కొంత సమస్యలు ఎక్కువగా పట్టణ ప్రాంతాల్లో ఎక్కువ ఉంటాయి 
బట్ రాష్ట్ర ప్రభుత్వం చేసిన ఎన్సిడి స్క్రీనింగ్ మేజర్గా మేము గ్రామీణ ప్రాంతాల్లో జరిగింది నవ్ స్లోలీ వీఆర్ ఎక్స్పాండింగ్ టు టౌన్స్ త్రూ బస్తీ దవాఖానాస్ అయితే మేము గ్రామీణ ప్రాంతాల్లో ఒక కోటి ముప్పై నాలుగు లక్షల మందిని ఎన్సిడి స్క్రీన్లో చేసినప్పుడు ఆరు లక్షల మంది షుగర్ వ్యాధితో బాధపడుతున్నట్టుగా మేము గుర్తించడం జరిగింది అట్లే బీపీలో కూడా చాలామందిని గుర్తించారు ఇప్పుడు వాళ్ళందరికీ కూడా మేము రాష్ట్ర ప్రభుత్వం తరఫున ఎన్సిడి కిట్స్ అనే ఒక కిట్స్ తయారు చేసి వాళ్లకు నెల నెల ఉచితంగా వాళ్ళ డోర్ స్టెప్లో మందులు ఇవ్వాలని చెప్పి ప్రభుత్వం నిర్ణయించింది సో వాళ్ళకి ఏంటంటే ఎవ్రీ త్రీ మంత్స్కి ఒకసారి మళ్ళీ పిహెచ్సి సెంటర్కి వాళ్ళని తీసుకొచ్చి స్క్రీన్ చేయడము మంత్లీ మంత్లీ మాత్రం ఏఎన్ఎమ్ ఆశ వాళ్ళ డోర్ స్టెప్లోనే వారిని స్క్రీన్ చేసి వారికి అవసరమైనటువంటి మందులను ఉచితంగా ఒక కిట్ ఒక బ్యాగ్ కూడా తయారు చేసినాం తయారు చేసి మార్నింగ్ అయితే ఒక కలర్ పోచ్ ఆఫ్టర్నూన్ ఒక కలర్ పోచ్చు నైట్ అయితే ఇంకో కలర్ పోచ్ పెట్టి ఆ మూడు పోచెస్లో అవసరమైన మందులను లోడ్ చేసి వారి ఇంటి దగ్గరనే ఇచ్చి వీటిని మీరు జాగ్రత్తగా వాడండి కానీ దాన్ని కూడా నేను సర్వే చేయించిన మనం మందులు ఇస్తున్నాం ఎట్లా వాడుతున్నారు అంటే అఫ్కోర్స్ వీ జస్ట్ స్టార్టెడ్ ఇట్ ఇంతకు ముందు కూడా ఉండేది కాకపోతే కొంచెం బెటర్ దాంట్లో ఇస్తాం చెక్ చేస్తే ఏం జరుగుతుందంటే మన ప్రభుత్వం ఇంత ఉచితంగా ఇంటి దగ్గర వెళ్ళి మందులు ఇస్తే వాడుతున్నటువంటి వాళ్ళు ముప్పై నుంచి నలభై శాతం మంది మాత్రమే వాడుతున్నారు కొంతమంది పాక్షికంగా వాడుతున్నారు కొంతమంది అసలే వాడడం లేదు అంటే ఓ సమస్య ఏమైపోయింది ఉచితంగా వచ్చేసరికి దాని వాల్యూ లేకపోవడము దాని ఇంపార్టెన్స్ గుర్తించుకోకపోవడము వాళ్ళకు ఉండాల్సినంత అవేర్నెస్ లేకపోవడం కూడా ప్రధానమైనటువంటి సమస్య అందువల్ల ఈ షుగర్లో బీపీలో ఇవాళ మనం గమనించింది ఏంటంటే అన్ని వ్యాధులకు మూల కారణం ఈ రెండు డిసీజెస్ చాలా వరకు మోస్ట్ ఆఫ్ ద డిసీజెస్కు దీస్ టూ ఆర్ ప్రైమరీ ఇష్యూస్ వీటిని కరెక్ట్గా మేనేజ్ చేయగలిగితే వీటిని కరెక్ట్గా అడ్రస్ చేయగలిగితే మీరు మిగతా వ్యాధులను చాలా వరకు కూడా టెర్షరీ కేర్ను చాలా వరకు మనం నిరోధించడానికి అవకాశం ఉంది టెర్షరీ కేర్ పెరగడానికి కారణం ఏంటంటే ప్రైమరీ కేర్లో మనం అవేర్నెస్ లేకపోవడము ప్రైమరీ కేర్ను స్ట్రెంగ్తెన్ చేయకపోవడము ప్రైమరీ కేర్లో మనము ప్రతి ఒక్కరిని కూడా ట్రీట్ చేయకపోవడం గైడ్ చేయకపోవడం అవేర్నెస్ పెంచకపోవడం గుర్తించిన వారిని సరి సక్రమంగా మందులు వాడకపోవడం వల్ల టెర్షరీ కేర్ మీద లోడ్ పెరుగుతూ ఉంది ఫైనల్లీ టెర్షరీ కేర్కి పోయిన పేషెంట్ ఎంతైనా యాక్సిడెంట్ అయిన బండి ఎట్లా ఉంటుందో ఒకసారి టెర్షరీ కేర్కి పోయొచ్చినటువంటి బాడీ కూడా మోర్ ఆర్ లెస్ అంతే వాల్యూ ఉంటుంది బట్ ఈ రోజుల్లో మనం దాన్ని అవేర్నెస్ పెంచాల్సిన అవసరం అందుకే ఈ మధ్య గౌరవ ముఖ్యమంత్రి కేసీఆర్ గారు కూడా పల్లె దవాఖానాలు బస్తీ దవాఖానాలు అనేటువంటి ఒక కాన్సెప్ట్ ఇప్పటివరకు మేము మూడంచెల వ్యవస్థనే ఉండేది ప్రైమరీ హెల్త్ కేరు ఈ తర్వాత వచ్చేది ఈ హేరియా హాస్పిటల్స్ దీంట్లో మేము కొంత వైద్య విధాన పరిషత్ హాస్పిటల్లో కొంత చేసాం టీచింగ్ హాస్పిటల్స్లో కొంత చేసేవాళ్ళం ఇప్పుడు ఇంకొక రెండు అంచెలు పైన ఒకటి కింద ఒకటి యాడ్ చేయాలని ఈ ప్రైమరీ హెల్త్ కేర్ను బాగా స్ట్రెంగ్తెన్ చేయాల్సినటువంటి అవసరాన్ని గుర్తించి ఈ ప్రతి పిహెచ్సి పరిధిలో మరొక మూడు నాలుగు పల్లె దవాఖానాలు తీసుకొచ్చే కార్యక్రమం ఈ పట్టణ ప్రాంతాల్లో కూడా హెల్త్ డిపార్ట్మెంటు ప్రజలు బాగా పట్టణ ప్రాంతాలకు వేగంగా వెళ్ళడం ఇప్పుడు మన తెలంగాణకు వచ్చేసరికి ఆల్మోస్ట్ ఫిఫ్టీ ఫిఫ్టీకి వచ్చేసినాం ఫాస్టెస్ట్ అర్బనైజేషన్ ఈజ్ హ్యాపెనింగ్ ఇన్ తెలంగాణ సో అక్కడ ఏమవుతుందంటే దానికి అనుగుణంగా మన హెల్త్ డిపార్ట్మెంట్స్ యొక్క పనితీరు అక్కడ పెరగాల్సినంత పెరగడకపోవడం వల్ల అక్కడ దెర్ ఇస్ ఎ హ్యూజ్ గ్యాప్ ఇన్ఫ్యాక్ట్ గ్రామీణ ప్రాంతాల్లో మీకు ఖచ్చితంగా ప్రతి వెయ్యి మందికి ఒక ఆశ ప్రతి రెండు వేల మూడు వేల మందికి ఒక ఏఎన్ఎం ఉన్నారు గ్రామీణ ప్రాంతాల్లో ప్రతి మండలంలో ఒక పిహెచ్సి కొన్ని చోట్ల రెండు మూడు పిహెచ్సీలు కూడా పెట్టాం సిస్టమ్ కొంచెం దగ్గరగా పనిచేస్తూ ఉంది బట్ అర్బనైజేషన్లో ఏమైతుందంటే ఆ కరెక్ట్ క్లాసిఫికేషన్ లేకపోవడము డాక్టర్స్ దగ్గరగా లేకపోవడము మనం రిక్రూట్ చేసినా కూడా అక్కడ ప్లేస్ దొరకకపోవడం ఆ ప్లేస్ను బైఫర్కేట్ చేయకపోవడం వల్ల కొంత గ్యాప్ అయితే చాలా స్పష్టంగా ఉంది ఇప్పుడు దాన్ని ఇప్పుడు బస్తీ దవాఖానాల రూపంలో మనం ప్రజల దగ్గరికి వెళ్ళి దాన్ని ఎలా గుర్తించాలనే దాని మీద కూడా మేము పనిచేయడం జరుగుతూ ఉంది సో అందువల్ల ఏది ఏమైనా కూడా మరి ఈరోజు ఈ షుగర్ అనేటువంటి వ్యాధి మరి ఇది ఒక సైలెంట్ కిల్లర్గా ప్రజలను మరి చాలా ఆందోళనలకు గురి చేస్తున్నటువంటిది సో దీంట్లో ప్రజలు కూడా అందరినీ మనము యాజ్ డాక్టర్స్ సరే రోగం వచ్చిన తర్వాత నయం చేయడానికి డాక్టర్స్గా మీరు ప్రతి ప్రయత్నం చేస్తున్నారు కృషి చేస్తున్నారు ప్రభుత్వంగా మేము కూడా అవసరమైన సహాయ సహకారాలు ఆసుపత్రులు ఏర్పాటు చేస్తూ ఉన్నాం బట్ బేసిక్గా కూడా ఇది జరగాల్సింది ఏంటంటే ఈ ప్రతి ఒక్కరిలో కూడా చిన్నతనం నుంచి మొదలుకుంటే పె
కొంత వాకింగ్ కానీ ఫిజికల్ ఫిట్నెస్ని యొక్క ఇంపార్టెన్స్ని మనం బాగా గుర్తించాల్సిన అవసరం ఉంది ఆరోగ్యమే మహాభాగ్యం అన్నది పెద్దలు ఒట్టిగానే అనలేదు మరి ఒక్కసారి దెబ్బతిన్న ఆరోగ్యం తిరిగి రాదు జీవితంలో మీరు ఏదైనా తిరిగి సాధించగలుగుతారేమో విద్య కావచ్చు ధనం కావచ్చు ఇల్లు కావచ్చు మీరు ఏదైనా తిరిగి పొందగలుగుతారు తిరిగి సాధించగలుగుతారు కానీ ఒకసారి దెబ్బతిన్న ఆరోగ్యాన్ని మాత్రం తిరిగి మనం పొందలేము దాన్ని ప్రతి ఒక్కరిని కూడా మనం చైతన్యం తీసుకురావాల్సిన అవసరం ఉంది అందుకోసం ప్రతి మనిషి తన తన కోసం తాను తన కుటుంబ సభ్యుల కోసం ప్రతిరోజు ఒక గంట సమయమైనా సరే వాళ్ళు కేటాయించి ఈ ప్రాణాయామం యోగా వాకింగు ఫిజికల్ ఎక్సర్సైజ్ అనేటువంటిది తప్పకుండా చేయగలిగితే చాలామంది కూడా ఈ షుగర్ నుంచి బీపీ నుంచి మనం రాకుండా జాగ్రత్త పడడానికి చాలా అవకాశం ఉంది వచ్చిన తర్వాత ఎంత బాధపడ్డా దాన్ని పోగొట్టుకోవడం అంత సులభం కాదు కానీ రాకుండా ఉండే విధంగానే ప్రతి ఒక్కరు కూడా కృషి చేయాల్సినటువంటి అవసరం ఉంది దానికి ప్రభుత్వ పరంగా మేము కూడా దీనికి ప్రజల్లో ఒక చైతన్యాన్ని తీసుకురావడం దీని యొక్క పర్యవసనాలు దీనివల్ల కలిగేటువంటి ఇబ్బందులను ప్రజలకు మనం బాగా చెప్పగలిగి ప్రజల్లో ఒక మార్పును తేయగలిగినప్పుడు తప్పకుండా ఈ వ్యాధిని అరికట్టేటువంటి అవకాశం ఉంటుంది అయితే ఇది అంత భయానకరమైనటువంటి వ్యాధి కూడా కాదు ఎప్పుడు కాదు మీరు సక్రమంగా డాక్టర్ యొక్క యొక్క ప్రిస్క్రిప్షన్ను మీరు ఫాలో కాగలిగితే మీరు ఒకసారి షుగర్ వచ్చిన తర్వాత కంప్లీట్ నీ లైఫ్ స్టైలే మారిపోవాలి నీ దినచర్య మారిపోవాలి సమయానికి మేము చూస్తుండే వాళ్ళు లాస్ట్ టైం నేను ఇరిగే ఇరిగేషన్ మినిస్టర్గా ఉన్నప్పుడు మేము ఎప్పుడు మీటింగ్ పెట్టినా డేట్ మారాలి అనేది అనుకునేవాళ్ళు మేము రాత్రి పన్నెండు లోపు మా మీటింగ్ అయ్యేది కాదు కూర్చున్నాం ఇంకా సాయంత్రం అంత అన్ని ఫీల్డ్ విజిట్స్ చేసుకొని ఐదింటికి ఆరింటికి వచ్చి కూర్చున్నామంటే ఉదయం ఒంటి గంటకో రెండింటి వరకు నా మీటింగ్లు జరిగేది పాపం చాలామంది ఇంజనీర్లు చాలామంది ఆఫీసర్లు షుగర్ పేషెంట్స్ ఉండేటోళ్ళు వాళ్ళు తొమ్మిది అయింది అంటే బిస్కెట్లు తినడము చక్కెర బుక్కుడు పాపం మేము భోజనం చేసి వస్తామని చూసినప్పుడు నాకు అప్పుడు యాక్చువల్ నాకు అంత నాకు కూడా అవగాహన లేకుండే వాళ్ళని చూసినప్పుడు అది ఏంది ఇంత ప్రాబ్లం ఉంది అని చెప్పి వాళ్ళు అడిగితే సార్ ఈ షుగర్ ఉంది మాకు తిప్పేతుంది మేము పడిపోతాము మాకు ఎక్కువైనంత కష్టమే తక్కువైనా కష్టమే అని చెప్పి వాళ్ళ ఇబ్బందులు నేను చాలా క్లోజ్గా చూసేవాడిని అప్పుడు చూసినప్పుడు అప్పుడు నేను అర్థం చేసుకునేవాడిని వాళ్ళు కూడా నాకు చెప్పేవాళ్ళు సార్ మీరు కూడా మార్చుకోవాలి ఫ్రమ్ వన్ డే యూ విల్ ఫేస్ ద ప్రాబ్లం అన్నారు నిజంగానే వాళ్ళు అన్నట్టు నాకు కూడా షుగర్ వచ్చింది నవ్ ఐఎమ్ ఏ పేషెంట్ ఎవ్రీడే పొద్దున లేవంగానే ఒక ట్యాబ్లెట్ సా ఇప్పుడు ఒకటి పోయి రెండో ట్యాబ్లెట్ రాత్రి ట్యాబ్లెట్ కూడా వచ్చింది ఇప్పుడు రెండు ట్యాబ్లెట్లలో ఉన్నాం ఇంకా ఇప్పుడు నేను కూడా తేరుకొని ఐ స్టార్ట్ డూయింగ్ యోగా అండ్ ప్రాణాయామం ఎవ్రీడే ఐఎమ్ ట్రయింగ్ టు కంట్రోల్ మై షుగర్ అండ్ మై బీపీ ఐ హ్యావ్ బోత్ షుగర్ అండ్ బీపీ కానీ ఏమైపోయిందంటే ముందు నేను జాగ్రత్త పడి ఉంటే నాకు వచ్చి ఉండేది కాదు వచ్చిన తర్వాత ఇప్పుడు దాన్ని కంట్రోల్ చేసుకోవడానికి జాగ్రత్త పడాల్సి వస్తా ఉంది ఇది ప్రతి ఒక్కరు కూడా వాస్తవానికి కొత్త నిర్లక్ష్యం వల్ల జరుగుతూ ఉంది అవగాహన లేకపోవడం వల్ల జరుగుతూ ఉంది ఒక ప్రభుత్వాలుగా మేము తప్పకుండా దీన్ని ఇంకా చైతన్యపరిచి ప్రజల్ని అర్థమయ్యే విధంగా చెప్పడానికి ప్రజాప్రతినిధులుగా ప్రభుత్వంగా మేము ప్రయత్నం చేస్తాం ప్రాథమిక ఆరోగ్యాన్ని కూడా బలోపేతం చేసి ప్రైమరీ హెల్త్ కేర్ను మనం స్ట్రెంగ్తెన్ చేయడం ద్వారా ప్రజల ఆరోగ్యాన్ని ముఖ్యంగా షుగర్ను మనం నియంత్రించవచ్చు వచ్చిన వారిని కూడా జాగ్రత్తగా మనం కాపాడుకోవచ్చు దీనికి మేము తప్పకుండా ప్రయత్నం చేస్తాం యాజ్ సజెస్టెడ్ బై డాక్టర్ పేరు మూర్తి గారు గోవాలో ఏదైతే ఒకే దగ్గర ఆల్ సర్వీసెస్ ఎట్ వన్ ప్లేస్ చేస్తున్నారు దాన్ని నిర్ధారించడానికి అని అన్నారు ఇప్పుడు తెలంగాణలో కూడా పెద్ద ఎత్తున ప్రభుత్వ మెడికల్ కాలేజ్ తెస్తున్నాం బిఫోర్ ఫార్మేషన్ ఆఫ్ తెలంగాణ స్టేటు మన రాష్ట్రంలో ఐదు ప్రభుత్వ మెడికల్ కాలేజీలు ఉండేటి ఇప్పుడు ఇన్ సెవెన్ ఇయర్స్ వీ హ్యావ్ ఇంక్రీజ్ ఇట్ టు సెవెంటీన్ నవ్ సెవెంటీన్ గవర్నమెంట్ మెడికల్ కాలేజెస్ మనం ఎస్టాబ్లిష్ చేసినాం సో ప్రతి మెడికల్ కాలేజీలో డాక్టర్ గారు అన్నట్టు మనకు అందరు స్పెషలైజ్డ్ డాక్టర్స్ ఉంటారు తప్పకుండా నేను ఒక రివ్యూ తీసుకొని ఇన్స్ట్రక్షన్స్ ఇచ్చి ప్రతి ప్రభుత్వ మెడికల్ కాలేజీలో కూడా అన్ని సర్వీసెస్ అందుబాటులో ఉంటాయి కనుక ఈ వీరందరినీ కూడా ఒకే దగ్గర పరీక్ష చేసి వా వ్యాధిని నిర్ధారించి వారికి సేవలు అందడానికి గోవా మోడల్ను తప్పకుండా మేము స్టడీ చేస్తాం ఆ మోడల్ను మన రాష్ట్ర ప్రభుత్వంలో ఉండే అన్ని మెడికల్ కాలేజీల్లో కూడా మనం తప్పకుండా దాన్ని అమలు చేస్తాం ఇట్లాంటి మంచి సజెషన్స్ మేము వీటికి వచ్చినప్పుడు మీ ద్వారా మేము నేర్చుకోవడం జరుగుతుంటుంది సో రాబోయే రోజుల్లో మేము కూడా మీతో ఒక రిక్వెస్ట్ ఏంటంటే మీ కాన్ఫరెన్సెస్ జరిగిన తర్వాత ఆ మినిట్స్ మాకు కూడా పంపండి వి విల్ ఇట్ విల్ బీ యూస్ఫుల్ టు ద గవర్నమెంట్ ఆల్సో ద సజెషన్స్
अल्टिमेट मन अंदर प्रजक जवाबदारी उठा प्रजाक मेल चेयर कू दटरी हेल्थ डिपार्टेंट सो मेर पंपते तपकड़ा को उपयोगपड़ी सो अंदर कल पे मरी देश प्रपंचव्याप्त दादा याबाई को मंदी षुगर तो बाधपड़ी विंटू उ प्रती वरिदर खचिंग मिनीम उ चिंल मोटकवा दाकूड वस्तु इंत मुदेमो अरवे दाटते षुगर उ बीपी उड़ेद इप्ड वयस तो निमित्त लेकिन वस्तु पैस्थिंद कड़ता बट एनी हूँ काफर नह्वाचन चाल सतोष मी अंदर की पेर पेरन धन्यवाद ना इंका मीत चाल सब मुख्यमंत्री गारो इंपारटे सवेश पार्लमटरी पार्टी मीट उड़ा वाल नैन मुझे डाक्टर गार अमतनी विश्चेदा मैं मे नीचे वे सूचन सलहकदा चेपी सवेश जीमान प्रभुत्म गौरव मुख्यमंत्री गार नायकत्व में प्रजल ओक आरोग्य परक्षण कोसम मारकूं मूडंल व्यवस्था अल ईदल व्यवस्था मार्चि इट प्रईमरी के पल्ले दवाखा बस्ती दवाखा दी अदे विधा पैन सूपर स्पेषालिटी आस्पत्र मैं राष्ट्र में चूस्ते डेबई एल अदे उस्मािया अदे गांधी तप कूपर स्पेषालिटी आस्पत्र रे अंदवल इप्ड मेम वरंगल और टू थौज बेडेड सूपर स्पेषालिटी हास्पल निम्स इंकोक टू थौज बेड्स तो मरुक सूपर स्पेषालिटी आस्पत्रि निम्स ने एक्सपैंड निम्स इपू मन फोर्टी हंड्रेड अं फिफ्टी बेड्स उ नौ वी आर् ऐडिंग अनेदर टू थौज बेड्स पक्ने उड़े एर्रमंजिल कॉनी में मुफ्ई ईद स्थला निम्स को प्रभुत्म के अब टू थौज बेड हास्पल निम्स हईदराबाद नल दिख मन चस्ट हास्पल्ल गचीबौली अदे विधा अलवा मन एल नगर गड्डी अन्न फ्रूट मार्केट बैठक तरली कौज बेडेड सूपर स्पेषालिटी हास्पलूं मुख्य सीट्स बेचुतना अंत डाक्टर्स अवेलबिटी बरगा विद्या वैद्यम रे अबा की रावाले वा राष्ट्र में उड़े प्रभुत् एमबीबीएस सीट संख्या एड वल सेवन हड्रेड टूडे इट इज़ टू थौज एट हड्रेड अड्ड फारटी इन गवर्नमेंट सैक्टर वाट ऐम टाकिंग इज़ इन गवर्नमेंट सैक्टर सेवन हड्रेड वर्स टू थौज फारटी सेवन हड्रेड इन सी इयर्स टू थौज एट हंड्रेड अंड फारटी इन सैवन इयर्स अंड फ्यूचर मुफ मूड जि मुफ मूड प्रभु मेडिकल कॉलेज प्रभुत् रंग एमबीबीएस सीट संख्य वे रे संवरा वेल रे वलभ की पचोता राष्ट्र प्रभुत् रंग में प्रति संवस टू हड्रेड अंड फारटी स्टूडेंट विल बी अडमटेड इन एमबीबीएस को इंकू पि चाइना को लेते उक्रेन को रशिया को पे एमबीबीएस चलवा अवसर लेलंगा ईल रेल नलभ सीट प्रभुत् रंग में एर्पट्टा दा तो पारा मेडिकल को अदे विधा नर्सिंग कॉलेज का टेक्नीशियन इप्ड मारा अवसर वे मन को थिटर टेक्नीशियन वेरे उ डयलिस टेक्नीशियन वेरे उ अटे डिपार्टेंट वैज टेक्नीशियन अवसर पड़ता है वेल ट्रेन वेल एक्विपड रात अवसर अंदम अन्नी डिपार्टेंट वैज़ टेक्निक स्टार्ट टेक्नीशियन थिटर्स नर्सिंग स्टाफ मल्ल स्पेषलेशन स्टार्ट दाखिल ट्रैनी आर्स स्टार्ट यूनर्सीटी मध्यकाल निर्णय तस्कते एमबीबीएस सीट तो पीजी सीट सूपर स्पेषालिटी सीट बेत इयर्स मैं पी सीट डबल सूपर स्पेषालिटी सीट डबल इपड़ मैं स्टार्ट सूपर स्पेषालिटी आस्पत्र अन्नी चोट सूपर स्पेषालिटी सीट्स को अवसर मैंने इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर क्रियेट आलमोस्ट वी वाट टू मेक् दाँ फाइव टाइम्स सूपर स्पेषालिटी सीट फाइव टाइम्स पीजी सीट टेन टाइम्स प्रणा तो मुझे बोतना अकाडमिक इयर आलमोस्ट वी आर् इंक्रीजिंग फोर हड्रेड पीजी सीट अकाडमिक इयर अन्नी इंस्ट्यूट पीजी सीट नलगो महबूब नगर सूर्यापेट सिद्धिपेट निजामाबाद अन्नी चोट पीजी को स्टार्ट ईवन एग्जिस्ट गांधी उस्मािया इंका सीटू मोर अं मोर अवेलबिटी अटे पिल इपड़की कर्नाटक पे चलो इंकड़को पे चवे पैस्थ निजा अवसर उ 
దాని అనుగుణంగా అటు ఎంబీబీఎస్ సీట్స్ను ఇటు పీజీ సీట్స్ను అటు సూపర్ స్పెషాలిటీ సీట్స్ను పెంచడం టీచింగ్ హాస్పిటల్స్ను పెంచడం ద్వారా అవైలబిలిటీ అంటే అలా ఏమైతుంది కెన్ వీ ఇమాజిన్ ఒక భూపాలపల్లిలో మెడికల్ కాలేజీ ఇమాజిన్ చేయగలుగుతామా ఒక ములుగు జిల్లాలో మెడికల్ కాలేజీని ఇమాజిన్ చేయగలుగుతామా ఒక సిర్సిలలో ఒక మెడికల్ కాలేజీని అంటే మెడికల్ కాలేజీ వెళ్ళడం అంటే వైద్యం ప్రజలకు దగ్గరగా వెళ్ళడం వైద్యాన్ని ప్రజలకు అందుబాటులోకి తీసుకురావడం విద్యతో పాటు వైద్యాన్ని తీసుకొచ్చేటువంటి ఒక గొప్ప ప్రయత్నం ఐ థింక్ ఇండియాలోనే తెలంగాణ విల్ బి ద ఓన్లీ స్టేట్ టు హ్యావ్ ఈచ్ అండ్ ఎవ్రీ డిస్టిక్ ఏ గవర్నమెంట్ మెడికల్ కాలేజ్ అండ్ ఏ గవర్నమెంట్ నర్సింగ్ కాలేజ్ దట్ టు యు ఆల్ నో పది జిల్లాలు ఉన్న తెలంగాణని ఇలా ముప్పై మూడు జిల్లాలు తెలంగాణగా చేసుకున్నాం ముప్పై మూడు జిల్లాల్లో ప్రభుత్వ మెడికల్ కాలేజీలు తీసుకొచ్చేటువంటి ఒక గొప్ప విప్లవాత్మకమైనటువంటి కార్యక్రమానికి ముఖ్యమంత్రి కేసీఆర్ గారు శ్రీకారం చుట్టినారు బట్ ఏది ఏమైనా ఈరోజు ప్రాథమిక ఆరోగ్యాన్ని బలోపేతం చేయాలి ప్రాథమిక ఆరోగ్యంలో అతి ప్రధానమైనటువంటివి షుగర్ అండ్ బీపీ వీటిని పూర్తి స్థాయిలో ఒక హెల్త్ ప్రొఫైల్ అనే ఒక ప్రోగ్రామ్ తీసుకొని ఈ రాష్ట్రంలో ఉండే ప్రతి పౌరుని యొక్క ఒక హెల్త్ ప్రొఫైల్ తయారు చేయాలి వాళ్ళందరికీ ఒక డిజిటల్ కార్డు ఇవ్వాలి వాళ్ళందరి యొక్క ఆరోగ్యం ఎలా ఉంది అనేటువంటిది ఒక స్పష్టంగా వాళ్ళకు తెలియజేయాలనేటువంటి ప్రోగ్రాము సిరిసిల్ల ములుగు జిల్లాల్లో పాయిలెట్ ప్రాజెక్ట్ పూర్తయిపోయింది అండ్ వెరీ షార్ట్లీ తెలంగాణ అంతా కూడా ఈ హెల్త్ ప్రొఫైల్ ప్రోగ్రామ్ను తీసుకువెళ్ళి ఈ రాష్ట్రంలోని ప్రతి పౌరుడికి ఒక హెల్త్ ప్రొఫైల్ కార్డు ఇవ్వాలని మేము సిరిసిల్ల ములుగులో చేసినప్పుడు కూడా మాకు మీరు మీరు చెప్పిన విషయమే దే డోంట్ నో దట్ దే హ్యావ్ షుగర్ దే మెనీ ఆఫ్ దెమ్ దే డోంట్ నో దట్ దే హ్యావ్ బీపీ సో మేము ఆ హెల్త్ ప్రొఫైల్లో వాళ్ళకు మెసేజ్ వెళ్ళిపోద్ది మన టీ డయాగ్నోస్టిక్ సెంటర్ ద్వారా ఆటోమేటిక్గా వితిన్ ట్వంటీ ఫోర్ అవర్స్ వాళ్ళ యొక్క శాంపుల్స్ బ్లడ్ ఫిఫ్టీ సెవెన్ టైప్స్ ఆఫ్ రిపోర్ట్స్ మేము తీస్తాం అవి వాళ్ళ మెసేజ్ వెళ్ళిపోతుంది ఇఫ్ ఇట్ ఈస్ నార్మల్ జస్ట్ లైక్ దట్ మెసేజ్ విల్ గో ఇఫ్ దెర్ ఈస్ సంథింగ్ ఈస్ చేంజ్ ఏదైనా అబ్నార్మల్గా ఉంటే కింద ఒక మెసేజ్ పంపుతుంది మీ షుగర్ ఇట్లా ఉంది మీ బీపీ లెవెల్స్ ఎక్కువగా ఉన్నాయి ప్లీజ్ గో టు ద లోకల్ పిహెచ్సి అండ్ అప్రోచ్ ద డాక్టర్ అని చెప్పి కూడా ఒక ఆటోమేటిక్ మెసేజ్ పర్సనలైజ్డ్ మెసేజ్ వీఆర్ సెండింగ్ టు ఈచ్ అండ్ ఎవ్రీ సిటిజన్ ఆఫ్ అవర్ స్టేట్ సో అట్లా టీ డయాగ్నోస్టిక్స్ ద్వారా కూడా దాన్ని కూడా చేస్తామని ఇప్పుడు ములుగు సిరిసిల్ల జిల్లాలో చేసాం రాబోయే రోజుల్లో మొత్తం స్టేట్ అంతా కూడా చేసి అందరికీ ఒక డిజిటల్ కార్డు కూడా ఇవ్వాలని చెప్పి ముఖ్యమంత్రి గారు నిర్ణయించినారు సో దట్ ఆ కార్డ్ ఈజ్ రీడబుల్ యూ గో టు వెదర్ యూ గో టు ప్రైవేట్ హాస్పిటల్ ఆర్ గవర్నమెంట్ హాస్పిటల్ యువర్ టోటల్ హెల్త్ పారామీటర్స్ అండ్ ద బ్యాక్ ట్రాక్ యువర్ రికార్డ్ విల్ బి దేర్ విత్ దట్ so that to me treatment lo quality berugutadi speed berugutadi anetuvanti uddesham tho prati paurudi yokka oka health profile card kuda cheyali ani cheppi kuda prabhutvam mundu pothu undi but the government has recognized the importance ee sugar nu bp ni control cheyalsina yokka importance nu idi chinna vyadhi aina kuda pedda vyadhulaku moola kaaranam pedda vyadhulaku repatiki beejam baddatte sugar ochindi beejam bp ochindi ante neeku pedda vyadhulaku vittanam baddattu lekka ఇప్పుడు నువ్వు ఆ విత్తనాన్ని జాగ్రత్తగా పెంచి కాపాడుకొని నువ్వు దాన్ని నిర్మూలించగలిగితే యు ఆర్ సేఫ్ అదర్వైజ్ ఇట్ విల్ రీడ్ టు ఏ బిగ్గర్ ప్రాబ్లం సో దాన్ని ప్రభుత్వం గుర్తించి దాన్ని కంట్రోల్ చేయాలి దీన్ని ఎట్లా ముందుకు తీసుకుపోవాలనే విషయంలో తెలంగాణ ప్రభుత్వం పూర్తి స్థాయి దృష్టి పెడుతుంది దీని ఇంపార్టెన్స్ను ప్రజలకు వివరిస్తూ దీన్ని కంట్రోల్ చేయడానికి ఒకటి రాకుండా చూడడం రెండు వచ్చినటువంటి వారు క్రమం తప్పకుండా మందులు వాడి తమ ఆరోగ్యాన్ని ఎలా కాపాడుకోవాలనే దాని మీద ప్రజల్లో చైతన్యం తీసుకురావడం మందులు అందించే కార్యక్రమం తప్పకుండా ముందు ముందు తీసుకొని వెళ్తాం ముఖ్యంగా ఈ ప్రాణాయామం యోగా వాకింగ్ ఫిజికల్ ఫిట్నెస్ యొక్క ఇంపార్టెన్స్ని కూడా ప్రభుత్వం తీసుకువెళ్తుంది ఈ మధ్య అన్ని ప్రభుత్వ మెడికల్ కాలేజీల్లో నర్సింగ్ కాలేజీల్లో వి మేడ్ యోగా ఈజ్ కంపల్సరీ పొద్దున్న లేవగానే పిల్లలకి ఒక యోగా ఇన్స్ట్రక్టర్ను మీరు ఎట్లయితే అదర్ ప్రొఫెసర్స్ ఉన్నారో ఒక యోగా ప్రొఫెసర్ని కూడా పెట్టి పొద్దున్నే యోగా చేయించే కార్యక్రమం కూడా స్టార్ట్ చేయించినాం ఆల్మోస్ట్ ఇక రాబోయే రోజుల్లో అన్ని ఇన్స్టిట్యూట్లో కూడా తేవాలి ఒక కార్యక్రమంగా దీన్ని తీసుకొచ్చి ప్రజల్ని ఫిట్నెస్ ఇంప్రూవ్ చేయాలనేటువంటి దిశగా కూడా ప్రభుత్వం ప్రయత్నం చేస్తూ ఉంది సో వన్స్ అగైన్ థ్యాంక్ యూ వెరీ మచ్ ఫర్ కాలింగ్ దిస్ థ్యాంక్ యూ వెరీ వెరీ మచ్ సార్ పబ్లిక్ హెల్త్ అవేర్నెస్ గురించి హెల్త్ ప్రోగ్రామ్స్ గురించి గవర్నమెంట్ ఎగ్జిక్యూట్ చేసే ప్రోగ్రామ్స్ గురించి ఈవెన్ ఇంపార్టెన్స్ ఆఫ్ హెల్త్ కానీ ప్రివెంటివ్ మెడిసిన్ గురించి స్ప్రెడ్ చేశారు థ్యాంక్ యూ వెరీ మచ్ సార్ నవ్
So I request uh, Sudhakar Rao Garu to felicitate our chief guest with idol of Dhanavantri. Dhanavantri is considered as a medicine. It is a common practice in ancient days to pray Dhanavantri, seeking his blessings for sound health. So this is an emotional connection between God of Medicine and Health Minister. So thank you very much, sir. Atidi Deho Bhava. So I request uh, Professor Sudhakar Rao Garu to felicitate guest of honor. IMA President So I request Harish Rao Garu, Health Minister of Telangana to felicitate IMA President, not President Raghunandan sir. Thank you very much sir. So, so now I request uh, Dr. Sham Kalwalpalli to convey his word of thanks to our honor of guests. Please welcome, sir. Expect grand round of applause. I request Harish Rao Garu to felicitate Dr. GVS Murthy, sir. Thank you, sir. Someone rightly said, gaining knowledge is the first step to wisdom and sharing with others is first step to humanity. Uh, I think uh, very inspiring health minister we have. Uh, we are really honored to have him. And Sudhakaragar, uh, Manaki, doctor community, Manaki, Elano, Harish Taru, health minister. I think Mave Pninchi, Yengaulana, we are willing to help. Uh, I think Milan uh, Twalke, we can do big things. Uh, the Ante uh, Mano, India low, you put to say, UK low, thirty percent doctors Indian Sunar. US low, 10% doctors Indian Nusunar. Manakanka, uh, if we work together, I think when uh, big people work together, great things will happen. India's, India's time has arrived. Uh, I, I probably think in the next coming years, uh, India can do wonders. We can take the position of uh, an IT industry, Ella Boom, out in the healthcare industry. for inauguration, inaugurating our conference ceremony. Thank you very much, sir. Oh, sure. So, as we proceed, further to action on the topic global disruption in healthcare new front by eminent proficient experts may i request vaishnavi Shupnika, and kritika to take charge of this intellectual academic event please welcome Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd okay. like to introduce Professor Vijay Sundar Garu. He's a professor of operations management. He's an affiliate at the Max Institute of Healthcare Management and an advisory board director for executive edu education at ISB at Walter E. Mason Thought Leader in Quality Management, ASQ Crosby Medal recipient faculty. 
such that I'd like you um, had to come onto the stage. Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me here for this conference today. Uh, I have been uh, listening to the talks of uh, speakers and also to the Honorable Health Minister. Great pleasure to learn many things from these conversations. So, coming from the Indian School of Business, especially associated with the Max Institute of Healthcare Management, there we are currently working on research projects related to the digital. Interacting with uh, so many allied doctors and uh, healthcare scholars in this conference gives me, on behalf of Indian School of Business, a great pleasure here and share our knowledge and insights. Thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, next, we have Dr. Ashok Kumar Tiwari. Uh, he, he did his PhD from Institute of Medical Sciences of Banaras Hindu in University. He completed his research associateship awarded by CSIR New Delhi in Banaras Hindu University. He joined CSIR Indian Institute of Chemical Technology Hyderabad as QRS Fellow in 1998. He was appointed as Scientist EI in CSIR Indian U Institute of Chemical Technology Hyderabad in 2001. Presently, he is the Chief Scientist at the Center for Natural Products and Traditional Knowledge. He's also a professor of biological sciences at the Academy of Scientific and Innovative Research, a university promoted by CSIR and created through the Act of Parliament. Sir, I would like you to invite to the stage. So I request all the dignitaries to please be seated and maintain silence as an important event of panel discussion is going ahead. It's a sincere request. Uh, indeed, this is a great pleasure and honor for me to be a part of this panel discussion of this IDEA conference. Uh, I hope uh, the discussions will be fruitful and will go well, well to the society and the public at large. Thank you. Next, I would like to introduce Professor Ullas S. Kultur, sir. Uh, he's a research faculty at TIFR from 2008, PhD from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, India, postdoctoral fellow at I IGM IGBMC, Strasbourg, uh, Swarna Jayanti fellow from Department of Science and Technology, India, foreign researcher fellowship, uh, uh, foundation research, Medicaid, France, uh, postdoc word research fellow in some. I'd like you to invite you to the stage, sir. Expect big round of applause, please. Um, well, I think introduction has happened. I would rather wait for the panel discussion to happen. Next, Pro Professor Subbanaran Rath. He's a uh, He's currently the head of biomedical department and associate professor at IIT Hyderabad. He received his PhD from National University of Singapore, MBBS from MKCG Medical College, and Masters in Medical Science and Technology from IIT Kharagpur. Sir, I'd like to invite you to the stage. I would like to introduce Mr. Ra Rajesh Manthena, sir. Sir is currently the executive director of the Cancer Centers of America and the vice chairman of Hyderabad Angels. He works to establish, direct, supervise, and coordinate the overall clinical and business operations of the company's Indian Cancer Centers. Sir is an integral sciences and bioinformatics at IIT Hyderabad. He has been in IIT Hyderabad for over a decade and has worked in protein folding, ion channels, heterogeneous nucleic acids, and metal nanoparticles. He has ob obtained awards such as INSA Young Scientist Medal, DBT IYBA Award, and AICTE Young Teacher Award, and more, rec more recently, the JSPS Invitation Fellowship. 
and he has also attained the, the Distinguished Lectureship Award by the Chemical Society of Japan. Sir, I would like to invite you. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Dr. Hemachandran K. Sir. Sir has been a passionate teacher with 13 years of teaching experience and five years of research experience. He's a vital educational professional with a scientific mind and is highly skilled in AI and ML. After receiving a PhD in embedded systems, he worked with prestigious institutions in Hyderabad and Chennai. He was bestowed as eminent faculty at Ashoka Institutions in 2019 and 2020. He was a critical member in JNTUH inspections, NAAC, NBA, and event organizer. Sir, I would like to invite you. Uh, lastly, I would like to introduce Mr. Ravi Varma, sir. He is a managing director and the president of Black Knight India. He played an instrumental role in starting and building Black Knight India, and he is responsible for the division's oversight and management. He has over 25 years of experience in serving as a CIO, CTO, and CEO for several technology companies in the technology training, consulting, and mortgage banking industries. He also holds a M an MBA in marketing and finance from the New York Institute of Technology. I'd like to request uh, Dr. Rakesh Sahai, sir, and uh, Dr. Sham to proceed for the felicitation of um, these uh, professors. Thank you. Oh, and Sudhakar Rao, sir, also. Thank you. So I request Dr. Sham Kalwalpalli to felicitate Dr. Okay. And Dr. Bhavani Ma'am to felicitate Dr. N. Sudhakar Rao Garu and Rakesh Sahai sir. So I do remember a famous saying by seeing this summit with a lot of experts. Kindly permit me to say this. The world is full of diamonds and germs. We are having some of them here today to build the summit. Thank you, sir. So I request, I request Dr. Shyam sir and Bhavani ma'am to felicitate Rakesh Sahai sir on this platform. Glad to have all your presence sir. Thank you so much. Thank you all. I think there is some confusion, uh, but uh, because of the minister's visit, there was some uh, change in the order. But uh, uh, outright, the purpose of panel discussion is, I think we as uh, doctors, we were always living in our own world, but healthcare is changing. There are so many big brains out here. So time has come for us to share our thought processes, ideas, and bring on change. Because uh, I think uh, we are poised to be in the right place, right situation. Uh, if we can have some collaborative work, I think we can do wonders. That's the intention of this panel discussion. Over the next few minutes, we would want to share uh, and understand from you, uh, you know, the, the true leaders of, uh, in the healthcare as to what doctors have to, uh, you know, contribute or support because end of the day, we are the ones who will be facing patients. So 
what is that you expect from us, how we can collaborate, how can we work together. Uh, uh, fortunately, in Hyderabad, uh, you know, we have some of the great institutes. It's unfortunate we are working in, you know, at our own individual levels. I think some collaborative work might be useful. So we brought in professors from Usmania Gandhi, corporate world, and uh, people like you. I think let's see where we can, uh, it's an initiative uh, we started now. Hopefully in the coming years we can work further. So in that background, to just kickstart uh, the purpose of panel discussion, I think uh, we all know healthcare is changing, we all know stakeholders are changing. Uh, historically, stakeholders used to be only doctors and patients. Now, uh, you know, all these startups and a uh, lot of tech-driven, data analyzed, all these new things are happening. Patients' expectations are changing, innovations are happening, and patient needs are changing. So, in that context, the intention is to get together uh, all the stakeholders and work together. And it all boils down to life expectancy. Uh, what is the ideal healthcare? Should it be in the private sector or as minister said, should health all be in the public sector? What is happening to the rest of the world? If you see this graph, health expenditure uh, versus the life expectancy, the y-axis is life expectancy and the x-axis is expenditure. Americans do very badly uh, in terms of, uh, you know, that's the graph. And all the European country and uh, frontline countries uh, their uh, life expectancy versus health expenditure is favorable. But if you see where India is in this graph, India is not even in this graph because we are not living till 70. Our average life expectancy, so this graph starts from 70 till 85 on the y-axis. So uh, we are talking about life expectancy where India doesn't even have, uh, you know, a graph to show because we are dying early. We are all having premature deaths. So how can we ensure that future generations, our life expectancy will match up to Western, uh, you know, standards? And as you can see, uh, you know, the big killers are non-communicable disease, cancers, and infections. Uh, so when it comes to non-communicable disease, uh, that's where we, Idea Clinics, we were working together. Institute of Diabetes, Endocrine, and Adiposity addresses all these. So these are the major non-communicable diseases. Uh, problem with diabetes is it's extremely expensive now. If you develop complications, uh, one in 10 Indians as of today have diabetes. It's the biggest reason for kidney failure, uh, foot problems, heart attacks, strokes, and it is affecting our quality and quantity of life. And the success lies in preventing and uh, uh, improving. Same holds true with cholesterol. That's another major reason. And uh, same holds true with cholesterol. That's another major reason. And uh, obesity. India is third most obese country now in the world. One in every four Indians are obese. In fact, in our practice, now people who are normal weight, they are coming and asking to put on weight because the rest of the country are overweight. We all, you know, thin, healthy individuals want to put on weight. That's the society we are, you know. That is because uh, lack of awareness, our uh, lifestyle, everything has uh, been. This hormonally, PCOS, I don't know if you are aware, one in 10 uh, girls of India, women of India have PCOS. Six girls of, you know, six of them are teenage girls from, you know, all these people who go to uh, 11th and 12th. And 80% of PCOS women are obese. So they are present with irregular periods, unwanted hair, weight gain, uh, mood swings, infert biggest reason for infertility today is PCOS. And again, that boils down to lifestyle. So in this background, the last one is mental health. As a society, um, we, we are an anxious, depressed, uh, middle class population we are becoming. Every one in 20 Indians suffer from depression right now. Uh, there is a big stigma in terms of mental health in India. So educating people about awareness, and these are all different directions. Today, the, one of the things we want to explore from people like you is how we can work together, bring in change, use technology, uh, and create value to us and rest of the world. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sham, for that uh, wonderful introduction. So I think now we can move into the panel discussion. Um, yeah, so uh, like Dr. Sham mentioned, healthcare is changing. There's a lot more, there are a lot more factors involved. Like traditionally, it was just an interaction between a patient and a doctor, but um, that soon changed into um, uh, real estate became a factor with hospitals being built. And then after that, there was uh, brands and um, marketing, like the traditional marketing. And then during the COVID era, that changed even more. Um, so technology and digital marketing started um, becoming way more um, necessary and important. So with all of that, um, we can say that technology can enable experiences but not replace hands-on human expertise. Um, so, Professor Shubhanarayan, sir, if you could share your thoughts on this, it would be great. Hello. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the question. So, uh, I would uh, start my talk uh, as a doctor perspective because I happen to be a medical student. So, I remember in my medical school days uh, when uh, an investigation was done for a patient, we used to run around, get the um, uh, investigation data and come to the patient and tell something. I remember how much uh, we are walking every day, minimum five kilometers just for this reason. So now coming to this stage, when I go to hospital now, not only the investigations are given by WhatsApp, even uh, patients do not go out of their uh, uh, house actually. So what I understand, Technology is the uh, uh, enabler for uh, assessing of the healthcare to every patient very easily. And uh, let us all accept that. And the best uh, uh, word would be, as doctors, uh, we, I mean, uh, maybe you, not me, but as doctors, uh, you should uh, adjust, adapt, and evolve with the situation. So, of course, many things are now changing. Doctors need to adapt and there are some outdated uh, technology or something is there, it need to be actually upgraded. But at the same time, uh, I must say the uh, direct experience of a patient, what he, he or she feels with a doctor, that cannot be taken out. So we know now uh, many patients, they go from one doctor to another doctor just for second, third, fourth consultation without understanding the uh, means without getting the empathy from the doctor. So once they get that, uh, that empathy, I feel all doctors understand that, how the patients stick to them. Even sometimes they do a bad decision, they stick to them because that personal connection is very vital. I don't think that will technology can enable. So in a way, technology can uh, make uh, the assessing of the healthcare and other things easier. However, the hands-on experience or direct uh, experience is a must. That's what I was. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was very insightful. Um, Professor Deva Priya Kumar, sir, if you could add on to that. Yeah, thank you, Tasta. Thanks for having me. So, you know, maybe I will, um, you know, talk a little bit about what we uh, do and the importance of data because in the, in the last, in the, you know, in the morning, you know, I was here by 10.30 or so and there are several, uh, you know, speakers mentioned about how, um, you know, data-driven technologies and artificial intelligence are kind of, you know, you know, pos uh, at least, you know, we do see a potential in them making, um, um, you know, breakthrough in, in, in uh, healthcare in general. Right, so, um, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, AI or data-driven technologies for um, healthcare, you know, there are several aspects, you know, you know there was someone who mentioned about uh, image-based diagnostics, right, you know, come up with solutions that takes images and then, um, you know, gives, the, you know, clinical decisions or developing clinical uh, decision support systems, you know, based on different kinds of data, right. So, uh, in that sense, you know, nothing is going to change in terms of, how the healthcare actually is going to work, you know, the doctors are actually going to face the patients, that's not going to change, right? But then when you have new technologies that come in, who is going to create these technologies and who is going to, um, you know, use these technologies and how, how, you know, it's going to kind of uh, make an impact, right? So, you know, now we are at a situation, you know, at least I even hear, you know, two years ago where people say that, you know, AI, you know, even from medical um, practitioners, we say, you know, AI, I don't think, so. you know, there are several concerns, you know, whether it, in terms of privacy or in terms of, um, you know, interpretability or uh, fairness, 
um, or um, in terms of other, you know, related, uh, you know, data related concerns. But that kind of, you know, going away right now, um, because people are talking about it and trying to do something about it, right? The, the other aspect is the medical practitioners themselves are trying to be part of these things. You know, you know, like for example, some of the projects we do, we work with uh, NIMS, Tata uh, Memorial, and then um, Homi Baba Research Institute, Grace Cancer Foundation, and several other, you know, hospitals and uh, NGOs who are directly connected in the domain, right? So, and then we have scientists, you know, data scientists and machine learning engineers who, you know, work with us, and then there are other kind of engineers who try to put together, you know, these solutions and trying to, you know, put out products. And, uh, you know, there was also mention of how does all this happen, because you need an ecosystem that has to support these things and bring to the market. I'm sure, um, you know, he will uh, sp speak more about, you know, how these technologies can be brought to the market through startups and other aspects as well. So, it, so we are at a crossroads right now where, you know, there are several of these disciplines come together, right? So whether it's, you know, medical professionals or data scientists or other, you know, um, IT engineers and then uh, humanities and so on, right? So there is a crucial uh, need for these people to come together, right? So if, if you know, if, if I sit together, you know, with my students and engineers in the lab and then develop a technology and then go out and then say, hey, can, can you know, it works really nice, you know, diagnostic tool, can you use it? No, doctors are not going to use it, right? So doctors have to be part of this, you know, because, you know, they understand it well. The government has to be part of this so that, that the implementation can actually happen, right? And the policy interventions have, can happen and so on. So it's kind of a, you know, the, it, it's, it's absolutely necessary to, to have this potpourri of different kinds of, you know, people come together to come, you know, uh, to uh, create technologies that can actually be used, right? So maybe you can discuss, you know, uh, further on this, yeah. Uh, thank you, that was uh, great. So basically, uh, as useful as technology is, as helpful as it is, um, I think hands-on expertise is always necessary along with the technology that's being developed. Um, would any of the rest of you like to add on to this? We'd like to hear your thoughts as well. Or else we can move on to the next question. Okay. So. Um, yeah, like we just spoke about, as healthcare is ever-changing, um, there are a lot of new additions that are coming. Uh, so now there are also multiple different stakeholders in the healthcare industry. For example, we have patients, the staff, doctors, um, and now also investors, as um, healthcare is also seen as a business now. Um, and of course, the government and the nation. So how would you say all these stakeholders pay, uh, play a role in healthcare industry? Um, Mr. Rajesh Mantena, sir, if you could um, speak about this. So, I mean, uh, we've heard a lot of speakers today and even on the panel today, you know, one of the common themes we see is that, you know, patient is at the center and, you know, focusing on primary health, whether it's data, et cetera, how to make healthcare available, right? Accessible, affordable is the central theme. Right, and uh, you know, as you rightly said, in terms of stakeholders with patient in the middle, uh, whether it's healthcare delivery, hospitals, uh, clinics, etc. On the other side, manufacturers of devices or pharmaceutical industry, governments being involved, now startups. It's important that you know uh, the goals are aligned. Uh, we've seen time and again that. The intent is there whenever somebody actually comes, you know, whether it's a, a private player, government, we've, we've uh, seen uh, the health minister talk eloquently about what the government is doing, which is very, very encouraging to see, right? Whether it's, you know, creating uh, pill packets and delivering it home. So I think the effort is there from everyone, but from a, a delivery perspective, as long as uh, everybody kind of believes in it, that education happens, alignment is there in terms of, you know, we're all working towards the same goal of, uh, you know, making that best healthcare available, uh, accessible and affordable to the patient. It's difficult to create. I'm, I'm, I come from a, uh, you know, a private uh, healthcare delivery platform, right? Uh, so we create uh, cancer centers in tier two, tier three centers. The reason we create in, it in tier two, tier three centers is to kind of solve that issue of, you know, urban rural divide, right? There is, uh, you know, a lot of focus on, on cities these days. You know, we only have about 35% of the population 
living in cities, but 70, 75% of the, the healthcare delivery happens in the cities. So there's, there's sort of a inverse uh, flip in terms of where the need is versus where the services are provided. So one way we're solving it is by actually going into tier two, tier three cities. Of course, it is difficult to, you know, hire doctors there, make, uh, uh, you know, quality care available at those prices. But again, uh, to get back to your question of ecosystem, it's important that everybody is aligned and everybody is, uh, and, and now what the startups, right? You know, I'm also the uh, vice chair of Hyderabad Angels. We, we see a lot of... Uh, Startups come in and it's relevant, you know, the topic today, I think we're sitting here and talking about disruption in healthcare. Uh, you know, I think it's sort of a misnomer because, you know, healthcare has changed, is changing, but also has remained the same for the last 70, 100 years, right? So, you know, uh, thinking that somehow it's going to change. It's a traditional uh, industry, with, uh, you know, talking about medicine, uh, emotion, so thinking that it will somehow change in a day, when we think about disruption, you're thinking about, you know, changing it in a day, month, year, right? I think it, 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 it takes some time. So I think people, uh, all the stakeholders uh, involved, thinking that this is a long-term play, you know, whether it's private or government, uh, making sure that we all understand what is at stake and, you know, uh, making self, ourselves aligned to that long-term goals, I think is the right way to look at it. Yeah, thank you, sir. That was great. Um, Dr. Ashok Kumar Tavari, sir, if you would like to add to that as well. Um, thank you. Uh, in fact, I would say at the first outset that don't worry. There is no disruption. We have been moving. We will be moving and we are moving. Technologies have changed. They have no doubt improved our uh, lifestyle. Ease of life and ease of doing business and so many things in uh, every walk of our life. There is nothing to worry. Only thing is that we have to keep our eyes, ears open and mind broad. We should not narrow our thinking. In Srimad Bhagavad Gita, uh, I heard um, a professor from Osmania University was saying, uh, uh, Gandhi Hospital was saying we do pranayama, yoga, and other things. Now these words have become very common. They were lying in our classical textbooks. Now it, it has become global practice for lifestyle ma disease management. I am working in those areas. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Prasad uh, Rao is there, uh, we are collaborating with that one. In Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, Sreyu hi Gyanam. The best thing is that accumulate knowledge, have knowledge, go in search of knowledge. That is why Rig Veda had told, Ano bhadra karto yantu vishwataha. Anywhere in the world, any corner of this world, knowledge is available. Have that. That good knowledge. And today we are globalized. We are in information age. Just at a click of your fingertips, you are connected to the world and you are connected to the literature. As I said uh, in my previous um, uh, remarks uh, that things are changing. Did we ever knew that EMRIs will come, uh, X-ray will be replaced with, with portable things? So many technologies have changed. When I joined my research, I was working um, with hands. We were washing test tubes. Nowadays, 96 plate, uh, well plate is there. You run uh, automatic platforms are there. Technologies have changed. Things have changed. 
we are looking at cellular and molecular nutrition label. We are looking at the metabolomics. We are integrating and isolating every molecule in our, our, our food item. Individual food item, what one is doing. So there is nothing to worry. Only thing is that we have to continue working and sincerely working. Things will be getting integrated. Uh, when I was seeing uh, Dr. Syam was making his presentation, at, for every problem, there was a solution written uh, at the, uh, um, uh, down the line of every, uh, every slide. We have to educate our people, we have to educate ourselves, and things will obviously improve. There is nothing to worry. When you worry, there is diabetes, there is hypertension, so many things. Diseases of common soil arise from worries and stress. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. That was a very interesting perspective you shared there. Uh, yeah. um, healthcare is looked at differently by a patient or the, and the investor. A patient wants it as a service, or, and an investor looks at it as a business. How do we formulate a balance between healthcare as a service and healthcare as a business? Um, Professor Vijay Sundar, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, in fact, this is an interesting question. Is healthcare a service or healthcare a business? Now, the answer to this question lies to whom we are, through whom, whose eyes we are looking at answering this question. Healthcare as a service and healthcare as a business, if I have to address this question more from a commercial perspective, more from a private sector healthcare angle perspective. So if we have to see health and industry, it is like service and business or like two sides of the same coin, right? Now let us first define what healthcare as a service really means for us to ponder more on what does it really mean as a business to us or not. Now talking about services per se i mean services is not like how i how i manufacture this phone and sell it to someone right because if somebody buys this phone then only when we use the phone only when i start consuming the product it is when it is felt in the mind of the customer but as a service healthcare is not like that it's unique because as soon as somebody touches you, when a doctor touches you to check the health of the patient, it is instantaneous that the patient feels about what is happening with that relationship with the doctor. So it is more like, more like, which encompasses a lot of constituents a doctor prescribes. So as a service, I think the purpose of the healthcare exists as a service. It is only because it is a service, there is a business angle to it. If it is not a service, then healthcare as a business doesn't make any meaning. Now, talking on the other side of the coin, healthcare as a business, it is the business models which help us to provide that quality care to the patients. So, and most of the doctors in this room would agree, because it is not a purely a commercial business. There is... So if you have to put it in a right word, I would say healthcare is more like a responsive business where without service, the business cannot exist and without the business angle, the service cannot be facilitated. So striking the balance is the key, at least in the current digital era, it becomes more an essential uh, ingredient of the healthcare. That's my opinion about it. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, can I add on a very nice uh, response, very useful for us. This is where we, we all struggle, doctor community. The healthcare in India is very, very transactional. Uh, people have to pay for their consultation lab. There is a, the, the trust, is, trust deficit is huge in India. In Western world, the insurances or government, uh, the, the whole monetary component is bypassed. So, so this is where the conflict arises. And in India, the problem is there are different state, you know, sections of people, the poor, middle class, their expectations are different. So always, now there are 
whether it's diagnostics, medications, uh, a middle class may not, uh, uh, you know, middle class or low class may not afford what to, you know. So uh, the other problem we have is these diagnostic chains, the pharmacy industry, you know, they give a, for example, they give 20 discount. In traditional healthcare, what doctors traditionally we do is, for poor, we almost do free, we, like for a type 1 diabetic, we provide insulin for free till they are 16. But we cannot sustain 20% discount across all sections. So this is where there is a lot of conflict, uh, where we should strike the balance. To outside, it looks very good. So the perception problem is another big worry. Patients perceive now the healthcare industry is not as respectful as it used to be, uh, you know, in yesterday years. Uh, this is where the conflict is happening between doctor community and patients. And how to strike that balance is a very key element uh, because patient spectrum varies from rich middle to poor. Interesting point, and let me add to what our friend has been. I completely agree that strength is not as easy as it is said. But today, we are living in this digital era, right? Today, we are talking about wearables, we are talking about real time monitoring of patients. Now, the catch here is digital expensive to make healthcare more as a commercial business. Because when you put a digital layer over the healthcare processes or as a system, is it really becoming an expensive affair overall to provide it to the beneficiary? Or is it trying to create a bottom line impact on a healthcare provider which can be translated as a cost advantage, as an affordability benefit to the class of people whom we spoke about, the, the low or the middle class? So that is an important question to ponder. So, connecting back to the theme of the technology per se, to this question and a, and a good discussion that I would, I would put it this way that digital is an opportunity for us to gauge, to strike a balance between this spectrum. If we are able to leverage the digital technologies and pass on the cost advantage to the beneficiaries, there develops a new business model. In fact, some of my research talking about digital health for the bottom of the pyramid addresses exactly this issue of balancing both the availability and the affordability class of people in our country who cannot see healthcare only as a transactional business but a lot more as a service which they can afford. So digital could be one way of looking or trying to solve the problem. But anyway, research to answer these kind of questions, but this could be one way of looking at it. Yeah. Thank you. Sir, I would like to add. Hello. Yeah. See, uh, I'm from Watson University, and I'm the program chair for MBA Business Analytics, where uh, we have a center of excellence in the area of artificial intelligence and robotics, and been a collaboration with Red J J Strasbourg Croatia where uh, we have a, a problem statement, especially uh, how we can build an app, especially that app is mainly for uh, uh, kind of peoples, where especially who have been suffering with diabetes and uh, cholesterol problems. And uh, the niche we assigned as of now is building of uh, ND, uh, model uh, for uh, diabetes patients. And what it will do is, you don't need to go for any doctors or anything, just if you have a blood report, if you scan it through your mobile, automatically it will detect change of your um, the sugar level and uh, your cholesterol level. And uh, it will suggest you that do the yearly diagnosis also and it will suggest you whether in future you will get the pre uh, diabetes or now you are in pre-diabetes or not. Or uh, if the cholesterol level is too high, then you will be in a higher level of getting a heart attack disease like that. One thing, apart from that, those app will suggest you the diet plan too, where uh, what kind of diet you should take based on uh, uh, the level of uh, sugar level and cholesterol. The second thing. And the third thing is, it will consult you uh, where 
if the level is high you just need to go to the doctor and meet morning when uh, when i am uh, listening to harish garu sir uh, thing that really it strikes that uh, the government has been doing all those things the bp level and they're sending a message to all those peoples so we we when we look into it that we are in a right way i thought and uh, we are planning to launch this app it's a free of cost for all of them and uh, everyone can utilize this so this is what from my side we need to say when we all discussing about this business plan model thank you yeah maybe i'll just say a couple of things um, give a very different perspective the stakeholder is not you the stakeholder is the stakeholder is not us the stakeholder is the person and the patient um, i worry this is my concern that we all talk about the industry being the stakeholder the doctors being the stakeholder and the government the stakeholder. real stakeholder is the public whose health is concerned which means all this so as long as you create models that take care of the stakeholder your sustainability and your trust factor will always be high as far as you think that you are the stakeholder or we are the stakeholder our interests are largely going to be governed by how we can sustain our activities not the ones that matter at the delivery bills the delivery is what is more important the digitization and digital health all of these are useful for us to gain access but not necessarily to deliver if you have to deliver please create models where stakeholders are the patients and other public and not the industry uh, which is then you will make more sustainable models uh, where you can probably strike the balance that he was talking about thank you thank you sir um, ravi amma sir would you like to add anything to this and uh, according to you what do you think is um, success in the healthcare industry sure thank you i think the the question actually revolves around is it when you say uh, service i think is a service a social service or, or or healthcare itself as a service it's a business right end of the day it is a business somebody is getting educated paying fees to become a doctor they're spending money they're spending infrastructure to go build a hospital to provide that service so when you talk about service if it's social that belongs to what like our honorable minister talked this morning right it's in the preview of social welfare organizations or government where government does provide exceptional service in india compared to most of the developed nations right when then you talk about service as a business it is a business at the end of the day right no other you know we provide software services we are somebody coming to us even though it's a service is expected to pay for it so that is a separating healthcare into business of services i think is is not accurate portrayal of of the business it is a business at the end of the day so, but the question is with, with the advent of most webmd doctors right what is the service that they want everybody who wants it uh, when when government is providing a service nobody wants to go there at the same time as minister uh, was mentioning you know when medicine is provided to their doorstep because free and there is a social service being provided the adaptation is only 30% right but whereas if you go to an apollo hospital or some place right and and um, and that medicine when it costs they have people complain about cost at the same time it is more highly adaptable adapted and and used so uh, i think um, for the industry like all the people who are here as doctors right i'm not a doctor but uh, i think Uh, professor there was mentioning the the stakeholder is actually the patient right if if as a business if if the the centricity of that business is around the patient not around the hospital infrastructure cost or the 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 economic bottom line i think it will work itself out right that's what i could say thank you that was really insightful um currently uh, nlp could i just share my perspective i just thought um, it's um, uh probably relevant um i spent uh, the best part of a couple of decades out of india and i recently came back to hyderabad and um, what i noticed is that um, in india there are two different strat of people what i mean by that is when i first came to hyderabad and roamed in gachipoli area i was just like really gobsmacked at the amount of you know the the development and everything but also later when i went with the, our marketing guys to some of the uh, in inside places in hyderabad there are patients who um, are paying 50 rupees per consultation to 
um, uh, an RMP doctor or somewhere, and mind you, the line there is huge. Like, you know, I felt jealous at the number of patients that person is attracting, and none of the patients there had any idea of what what these, you know, the various things are. They don't have wearables, they don't have a smartphone. Maybe they do, but they don't have the apps um, through the digital era and uh, disruptive technologies. I'm not really convinced, at least at that point, of their penetration. Like, whatever we're trying to do is only reaching the strata, strata of the people that are willing to have it or they have the resources to have it, but really the other part of the the population, they have no idea what this is all about, and I don't know how to reach them. And also, um, this is what they mean by the gap between the rich and the poor is growing in, not only in America, in, in India as well. So I, I think it's important because the number of people in the other strata are huge, are humongous. Thank you, sir. Can I quickly respond to that? Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, that's a you know, very, um, you know, valid point, right? But the, the, you know, one of the important questions that we should ask, I think, uh, you know, starting from the point whether, you know, it's a business or a service, right? You know, irrespective of what we are talking about, somebody is paying for that. It's either the government or the patient himself or the insurance uh, company. Somebody is paying for that, right? So in that sense, you know, there is a huge economy that kind of goes into this service. Right, so coming back to saying, you know, how do you handle, uh, for example, uh, the, the, you know, set of people, um, you know, who possibly do not have access to this kind of technology. I think the, the question that we should ask is, you know, how can technology help us take, you know, healthcare solutions at the population scale, right? We don't, we don't put the onus on the patient to seek for that kind of technology to get that service, right? You know, it's, it's you know, as, um, you know, uh, Professor Vlas was saying, you know, it, it, the patient is at the center, but, you know, as healthcare providers, what is it our contribution to take technology to, you know, maximize the number of people we reach and minimize possibly the costs associated with uh, certain, you know, uh, screening or diagnostics and so on, so that, you know, we democratize, right, or, you know, make the healthcare access to a larger population. I think that, that that's the important question to, for us to ask, yeah. Thank you, sir. Currently, NLP and ML research focuses on areas like physicians' productivity, quality of care to improve patient experiences. Dr. Hemachandran, sir, uh, what do you think NLP and ML research should focus on in the next five years? Yes. Um, if you see now, in I had written one article in uh, Times of India. It, in that, it is mentioned that uh, from 2019 to 2025, the AA, in, especially in the healthcare sector, the CAGR level goes up to 51%. And uh, how it has been happening is based upon uh, data. If Nowadays, if you see uh, around 38 zettabytes data is being present in the cloud storage as along of the globe. But if you see in 2023, they are saying that uh, around two, uh, 200 plus zettabytes data will be there. So if you have that much of data in artificial intelligence sector, we can do a lot of wonders, the first thing. And second thing, uh, recently I read one more article which has been uh, published in Helion, uh, where uh, the professor name is Michael and uh, he is in the Department of Surgery and in the University of Hong Kong. Uh, recently they developed one chatbot especially using natural language processing. Uh, it's mainly for, uh, during the COVID situation, uh, the undergraduate students of uh, medical university can't able to do cases of our patients, we can say. So that there are a lot of drawbacks happened over there. So to train them, how we can train them. So what he had done, he created one chatbot where uh, the chatbot will act like, uh, it will be uh, pre-installed with uh, uh, case studies and a lot of case scenarios. So the students can access that and uh, they can learn from their own, uh, like uh, uh, what is the problem. If it asks what is the problem, it will say that uh, we have a breast cancer like that. So what is the solution can be given? All those things like the students can learn on their own. So this is a drawback when a COVID situation occurs and they're given a solution by preparing a, building a chatbot with NLP and they're given. 
So this is an advancement we can say. And an another advancement we can say is, uh, nowadays if you see, sir said that many of them are standing in a queue to uh, meet the doctors. But in future, what will happen, there will be nothing like that. Uh, like, uh, uh, if you want to see a, a particular patient or a doctor, so what, once you go fix an appointment, in the doctor table automatically, the total uh, report of that particular patient will be there. And by one click, it totally get analyzed from the birth to till date, what has happened for him and what are the uh, uh, diseases previously occurred and what is the tab tablets has been taken. Everything will be analyzed and just uh, uh, you will get a sample one page report. So that automatically you can analyze all the things and finally if the patient comes, you can just give a consultation, that's it. So no need to put that much of time in that. So this is what the advancement which I think and in 2025, this combination of both natural language processing and machine learning will go higher and much even the healthcare sector will grow higher with the help of this artificial intelligence. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your input. Um, but uh, Deva Kumar, sir, would you like to add anything? No, I, I think, you know, I, I respect, <laughs> you know, what is said, but, you know, I think it's very, very ambitious and, uh, you know, it'll be nice if you can, if you are at this, you know, at that level, it'll be really nice, but very, very ambitious, yeah. <laughs> uh, let me add something that, again, uh, respectful goal, and I think we'll get it, uh, where we are today, right? Uh, we have to be practical in terms of how the industry is, you know, en masse, how we actually make it available as, as projects, as cool things to do these things make sense, you know, just to give you a couple, to be negative on this, but, uh, you know, if you think of, uh, you know, large guys getting into this, trying to use AI and chatbots, right? You know, what is the IBM Watson is a big, big spent about uh, $5 billion, which is, I don't know how much is, is that in uh, rupees, maybe 35,000 crores, right? Uh, they shut it down, I think, uh, two years ago, three years ago. Right. Uh, after spending all that, they had 7,000 7, employees. Uh, I think Berkshire Hathaway, J.P. Morgan, and uh, and Amazon opened a company to kind of revolutionize healthcare and bring down the cost. Right. They shut it down two years ago. I mean, there are large people involved. Microsoft has Health Vault. I mean, people are trying to solve the problem by using technology, etc. But you know, uh, uh, in reality, uh, you know, absorption has been slow. Right, so uh, you know, choosing uh, our area, I think we can't solve it all in one go. It won't be a one size fit all. We all have to kind of choose our own area, make sure that you know what we're de delivering makes sense to the industry. Again, from a private player perspective, you know, it is true that uh, when Dr. Sham mentioned, you know, healthcare has a you know bad rap today, right? You know, people actually have that mistrust, saying, okay. I you know, unnecessary tests are done or I'm spending more. But I also think on the, from the industry side, you know, there are a lot of healthcare providers that are struggling, right? Despite of the best intention, you know, it is difficult for uh, it as an industry to make, uh, uh, make it work, right? Of course, COVID is an exception, you know, people did make merry, all that. But also, you know, with the best of intention, whether it's real estate costs or uh, cost of getting educated, uh, all this, when you put it all together, right, it's a, it's a sort of a tricky industry on the private play, player side to make sense, right? So, you know, we have to put our heads together, you know, you can have the best of technology, you can have the best of people working on it, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it has to make sense even to provide it as a service, right? So, you know, things have to be aligned. Uh, Thank you, sir. Sorry, can I, can I just ask? Um, no, thank you very much for that, um, uh, you know, that we are going into new technologies and, um, um, you know, maybe a chat, uh, a bot diagnosing something or, um, you know, giving the advice as well. I mean, in this context, actually, I would like to ask Rakesh Kumar Sahai, sir. Um, Sahai, sir, um, we are talking about, uh, you know, the latest technology and um, uh, a bot diagnosing things, but uh, traditionally um, a doctor and um, as, as uh, you know, we, we, were, we learned a lot of clinical skills and um, uh, we, we need uh, 
that, uh, you know, the moment you look at the patient physically and then you have so much to talk about it and then you don't even touch but the look at it and then you get a diagnosis in most of the cases and that is how we were traditionally taught. So what do you think in the future, sir? I mean, is it going to be the future students are going to be less clinically skilled or uh, the, you know, I, I would like you to comment on this, sir, because you are a teacher, I would like you to. So I think, uh, I think when we started off, Dr. Subha said that, you know, he was saying that uh, although all this technology is going to come in, but that, uh, you know, the, the amount of people coming, uh, going through Google and uh, reading about many things and coming to you, which you, you pick up by just, you know, looking at them or just saying a, a word with of uh, making it simple for them to access you or, uh, I mean, or, or get information or something like that. But I think uh, that part will, uh, will, will certainly remain. Thank you, sir. Professor Ulla, sir. Yeah. So, of course, um, I'll go back to what I said. Pharma and the doctors, mostly because of the sustainability model, the research is largely aimed at solving the problem after the problem has you know, surfaced, which means the cost of delivery is high, the cost of maintenance is very high, which means um, most of our focus will be drained into finding a drug that can cure. While that's important, that's not going to really be a problem because you will still have the problem which is sustained in the population. I'll just give a simple example. Most of us would like to believe that diabetes and obesity is something that happens after you reach a particular age. I don't know many of us will know that this is largely caused because of nutritional deficiencies that can be tracked as early as in pre-pregnancy, during pregnancy, early awareness, research platforms that will tackle the entire life cycle of an individual population belonging to different social groups. The lifestyle is not something that is uh, you know, commonly acceptable for all of the people. So you have very, very, very lifestyle. Uh, you're putting pharma and academicians under of problem solving will not be useful. Because prevention is not very economically appealing. Neither is it appealing from a um, you know getting visibility perspective. So therefore, governments leading role in this. That the opportunities like this and clinics like IDEA could also play a big role. And for example, again, we have, we have initiated a mega program on malnutrition and double burden because malnutrition age seems to be the biggest driver of all of this that we are talking about in middle life. There is a little uh, uh, effort that has happened. A public health initiative been largely deprived of and the crosstalk. I believe more, more such dialogues where we bring in the stakeholders and I would probably take this as an opportunity to say academicians should reach out to the clinicians. The reason these clinicians are always busy solving the problem. As somebody said, the burden of treating the the patient to doctor are very skewed. So you can't expect probably the doctors to reach out to the academicians to, you know, help. Probably academicians should take the first step to reach out to the uh, doctors to say, can we help solve the problem? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Subna Rayanrat, would you like yeah. to add something? Yeah, actually, I would like to ask uh, rather, I would defer in many of these other person's opinion because uh, my points will come that way. So, so let's talk about the example when this uh, pandemic started. So at that time, um, almost all academic institutes suddenly closed. Everybody is asked to back. Um, I um, if it hurt somebody, I will say um, most of the academic institutions almost did nothing except lockdown in their houses. 
same time uh, as my all the doctor friends are not only working they are overworking and uh, sadly i am saying some of my uh, senior and juniors of my age they actually are dead now because they are doing the service okay so then coming back to that time i i feel um, again differing from the other opinion the stakeholders cannot be only one person by rule stakeholders whoever involved they have to be involved there so whether it is research innovation happening or in the um, prior uh, comment about the only patient the stakeholder i must say everybody must be brought to the table and everybody's opinion matters because uh, by rule the doctors cannot just do this cannot just do the service and uh, they have to uh, know also their comfort and their way of giving services so coming back to the innovation and research point what i say uh, in many foreign countries where i worked actually the doctors are given the main uh, pa role because they know it is ultimately going to be applied and they kind of decided everything rather um, in many country like germany the entry point doctors actually fee and then their salary everything is more because they are given the due respect and uh, responsibility so coming over to the indian scenario this is actually i know lacking because uh, doctors are really overworking here our uh, doctor patient ratio is uh, very low and they are really overworking here so um, uh, luckily as a clinician turned researcher i joined here i actually try my best to reach out to doctors and i get the best idea innovative things from them actually really great idea so i think in um, this time it taught us uh, instead of um, thinking the doctors will reach us we should go out to reach the doctor and uh, until that situation come and which is coming very soon where the hospital and engineering um, or the research institute should be together that means uh, no need to reach out under the same table we can sit and discuss and plan things if possible so again um, to make this all things um, understood i will tell Uh, i have gone to one high school in university of tokyo so there they we are supposed to do innovate in many things so the first thing they asked us even as a faculty to go to field visit so we want to innovate let us say for some mall they asked us to go to mall find the all the problems and then get the solutions there so in that way i personally feel any medical innovation we academicians need to go to hospital take the advice suggestions from the um, uh, doctors and we have to follow as per their timings available actually they are not easily um, available also i agree they are overworking and then only the innovation will start until that happens uh, india will still depend on foreign countries to import stuff i personally believe that no i don't think we differ i think we said the same thing um i think doctors are busy doctors are saving lives academicians should take the burden to reach out to the clinicians and it's not going to be easy route again something that i've done i walked this uh, path you have to constantly go to the doctors talk to them and let them define the problem often academicians define the problem and it's quite likely that's far from reality of what's happening in the clinics so it's always good for the clinicians to define the problem and the academicians come with up a solution and that's what we are doing actually so uh, we've been to rural hospitals community health uh, development centers as uh, remote as in parts of tamil nadu in in many other you know even northeast countries uh, sorry northeast states um, going there you will realize what the real issues are and talking to the doctors you will know what the solutions are useful for them to even have a translatability otherwise we sit in silos and we talk about what is translation what is digital health that may not be able uh, uh, be able to solve the problem because it's not reaching to whom it matters so i think academicians should uh, take the burden of reaching out to the doctors and the last thing is um, there should be programs even within clinics like idea where probably you allow your doctors to also spend time in an academician's lab or allow academic students to spend time in your clinics unless we cross that bridge i think we'll always remain on two sides of the table we talk about solving problems but i don't think anything is going to come out of it fully agree that thank you yeah uh, very nice point made in fact it is the doctor who looks at the patient and finds the issues those issues should be brought to the researchers 
and the academicians sitting in their lab, they will find out what would be the solution. Because it, it, it is their full-time job of researchers. Uh, I, I would e utilize this forum to read uh, today's uh, editorial, see, 16th July in uh, Lancet. And uh, it entitles that measuring the future of humanity for it. Uh, this is the editorial. Lancet, volume 400, July 16, 2022. The notion here is that reduce the burden of nation, stay healthy. How do we stay healthy? Unless and until we take uh, care of basic cause of the uh, unhealthiness. I, I pick up a few points that estimating the future is fraught with uncertainty. In the league table of nation, India will pass China as most powerful country in 2023. Although the global life expectancy continues to increase, large inequalities exist, as a, uh, one gentleman inquired, of poor people seeking the health and the richer people getting uh, uh, through that one. The percentage of people ages 65 years and older is expected to increase to 16% in 2050 from 10% in 2022. Uh, the countries uh, are experiencing sharp increases in working age population in coming year. From the planetary health perspective, the relationship and uh, relation and the geography of humanity and migration shift will be inevitably will inevitably take place during future decades will influence urban food and health system in transformative way. We are seeing very often that migration from villages to the cities are increasing. And, and that, that is not only increasing the number of population um, uh, in, in urban cities, but that, that is becoming burden to the healthcare and other systems also. How do we stop the migration and and provide facilities and employment education there itself, unless until we take care of these things, nothing is going to happen. Everybody, I am a stakeholder of my health. My stakeholder is not somebody else. I have to take care of myself. And this is, one have, has to have, um, uh, realize the responsibility of oneself. And these four, uh, they now say that these forces shaping human movements across the globe are inevitable and must be impressed, embraced and managed, not dismissed or resisted. The voice of a, an independent union that represents the interest of people, not politician, has never been more important. The, very important point in this editorial is that how we are going to provide healthy food to the people. Because the, uh, when minister was also asked, uh, saying his details, uh, I am very poor, I do not understand, but I can sense uh, the language uh, that in his busy hours, the cheapest food are sugar rich food. Nutrient depleted food, are the cheapest food now available to um, the people. And they have penetrated even the, uh, the, the, the tribal belts. And at the cheaper price, healthy food and nutrient-dense food are becoming very costly. How do we expect health when we do not have a healthy food? We have to meet these requirements at every level and, uh, and work towards this, provide uh, in fact, technology is very important. Our kitchens are vanishing from our uh, homes 
and we are looking for ready-made food. See, how do you think that Swiggy and Zomato will be providing you a, a very healthy food? You don't uh, see the kitchen, you don't know who is making that, in, what, in which condition it is being made. Food, uh, in Tetri Upanishad Slok, I, uh, I recite, that Jatan Annena Vardhante, um, Jatan um, uh, Annad Bhutani Jayante, Jatan Annena Vardhante, Annam Hi Bhuta Nam Jestham Tasmat Sarva Ausadi Uchate. We, we are born, we live, we survive, we grow, we grow and we die consuming food. You have every get get in your house, you don't have food. Do you think can you survive? Food is the first medicine and that food should be healthy. Chandogya Upanishad says, Ahara Suddho Sattva Suddho Dhruva Smriti Smriti Lambe Sarva Granthi Nambi Pramokshas Tasmai. If our food is healthy, is nutritious, it is rich with all the uh, micronutrients, micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, and, and what are so many phytochemicals. Uh, we are hardly going to develop these lifestyle related disease. First, our emphasis should be provide healthy food, rest will be taken care, burden on the nation and the clinic will get reduced, and society will become healthy. I am happy to announce here that one of our partner, Dr. NSD Prasad Rao is here. And I am glad to announce that so many of my research in the laboratory has got translated into the clinic in a positive way. And we are in the process of making products out of that one. And um, uh, there is a need of people coming out um, uh, from their clinic uh, and doctors associating with the biological researchers uh, where indigenous research can be translated into the clinic and ultimately if things are translated into the clinic there are people they will make the pro and uh, we will move forward towards a he making a healthy society absolutely there is no doubt thank you Thank you, sir. That was a very interesting answer. So, moving to the next topic. Uh, as we know, a healthcare institution can be private or governmental owned. So, uh, Mr. Rajesh Manthena, sir, in your opinion, which healthcare entity do you think is better for patients and for doctors? A tricky question. I'm not going to say, you know, which is better, but uh, let's talk about, you know, what happens today, right? Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, who, who, who amongst us has actually went to a government institute for health? You know, it's a simple question to answer. I mean, I, I don't remember going to a government hospital uh, the last time, neither I would expect that, you know, the same would be the answer from most of us. Uh, having said that, it's a, it's a large problem to solve, you know, uh, I mean, that answer because we're sitting in uh, Hyderabad, you know, comfortably, um, if uh, we were to be sitting in a tier 3, tier 4 city, you know, in a Bihar or UP in Telangana, in a Tanda somewhere, the answer would be different. Uh, uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a large problem to solve. I think, you know, both private and uh, uh, governments uh, uh, have a big role to play as a uh, uh, the health minister, Rarish Rao, uh, expressed, you know, the government, I think, is doing their part. But again, uh, education is key. Uh, if uh, medicine that is delivered at, do at a doorstep, right, uh, by the government is only being consumed at a 35, 40% rate, right, then that, that, that kind of is a, is a uh, sort of microcosm of, uh, you know, what the condition today is, right? Uh, it is in education, it is in early detection, it is in uh, making sure that, uh, you know, the right kind of uh, training happens at the paramedical level because it's all sort of falls on the doctors today. But if you go down a level, right, you know, are the nurses trained properly, are the paramedical staff trained properly? A lot of things to do, you know. Uh, primary health is something 
easy where the government can actually get involved, which I think they, they are trying to solve. Education is something uh, where government can solve. So I think it's a, it's a mixture of both. Uh, but today, you know, uh, a large portion, or at least on the secondary and tertiary care, it falls on the private players. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the answer. Thank you, sir. I was uh, waiting for a point to be made in the previous discussion also and here also. It is going to be short, 30 seconds. Uh, for my previous this thing that uh, research, academicians, medical colleges and all. So I have a lot of experience in uh, uh, doing the uh, technology solutions research. And as a part of that, we have actually uh, tested a jet injector on, a, on an audience there. And uh, we found that the stakeholder, the beneficiary, and the researcher. Everyone has to actually come together only to make a logical conclusion, uh, to give a meaningful solution to the, to the last point, end user, and the person who is going to use that. So it's very important that everyone comes together, and who most, who has to approach, and all these things. I, th I feel all three together has to have to sit together and actually uh, get these things done. So jet, inject jet injector example I wanted to give because uh, we tried this on small little kids in one of the hospitals here, and the, the, the first prototype we, we, we tested was like a gun, like, like a pistol. And the moment the pistol was seen, the kids started screaming there. Then the moment we changed that gun into a small toy, it suddenly became very uh, friendly to the, uh, to the kid. So what I'm trying to mention is that the end user, the beneficiary, and the person who is going to use is it's very important there. Similarly, another uh, one, one more example I want to give is we, we tested some uh, uh, cutters, some cutters, some, uh, some needle cutters we have we tested, and we wanted to give a good maintenance to that needle cutter so that the cutters last a long life. And so we advised uh, all our healthcare workers to actually lubricate those two drums properly every month. And uh, when, we, when we went as a part of research to in, uh, individual institutions, a few of the institutions were not doing well, the drums were just jammed. And when we went to some other institutions there, they were perfectly functioning. One of them was perfectly functioning. And so then we asked, how is it working here and why it's not working there? So she said, the, the worker said, uh, if you don't scold us, we will tell you a solution for this. So I said, what is it? So uh, everyone complains that there is no oil available within the primary health centers. Who will get the coconut oil from home and then who will do this? So then she said, I have found a solution. I just picked up a uh, condom packet put it on my finger, I just lubricated the drum, and it's perfectly working. So what I'm trying to say is, any formative research, any research, the final person who is going to implement that, the solution lies there. We need to really work out with them very closely to really find those solutions out. So I would say equal partnership by everyone, uh, whether it's academician, whether it's a person who is taking research, or the stakeholder, everyone should participate. And the second, <coughs> second example, like she asked the question like who, where will you go, whether you will go to a private or uh, a government, no. it depends upon the services which, which we are satisfied. Like all my children I have taken to the government institutions for immunization. I have, I have purposely avoided the pediatricians, the private practitioners because the cold chain system in the government system is the perfect cold chain system. And there is a lot of investment which has gone in the cold chain system. Uh, we have personally trained all this, so we were very confident that the immunization, the quality of vaccine which is being received by the kids is the best in a government. So I would say I would go to the government. If I get TB, where will I go? I will definitely go to a government institution because there are very good protocols set in, there is a lot of investment which has gone in, there's a good quality drugs which are, which are provided there, so I would prefer to really go there. So it all depends upon the confidence of the people on the system, where would I get a best service? The best service plus quality. It is just not the lip service, talking good and not giving a good service. It is service, quality, everything put together will really matter. So whether it is government or whether it is, we need to concentrate on quality, good services, and also the patient satisfaction matters here. Thank you. Um, okay, so I think we're running a little short of, uh, or short on time, so um, if we keep it brief, maybe we can accommodate a couple more questions. Um, 
So basically, from multiple research papers, we have seen that, um, and also just general knowledge, it's, or you can see that um, an increase in life expectancy can result in a multifold increase in total GDP. So how would you say that um, healthcare industry can play a role in the country's GDP? Professor uh, Vijaya Sundar, if you could answer that. Um, I mean, we can, we can look into healthcare sector from an economic standpoint at two levels, right? At a macroeconomic level, the question is more towards the macroeconomic level. So first, let me address that. So today, if we see the healthcare sector is one of the largest contributors of uh, Indian economy, right? It is growing at a compound annual growth rate of about 22%. We are talking about an industry which is 375 billion US dollars. That is healthcare industry in India today. There are so many factors, economic factors, which can add or disrupt this equation which we are talking today. Today, because we are in the world where it is constantly changing at a higher pace and momentum, right? So firstly, looking at the aged population in our country, it is about 8.6% of our overall Indian population is the aging population. But I won't, I won't, I won't mean to say that it is because of the aging population, the economic system disrupted because if we see other countries like Japan or Italy, they have a more than 20% of Japan's population is aging population. But still, they are a developed economy, right? But it could be a factor, is what I'm trying to say, number one. Number two, we are getting into an age where the public-private partnerships in healthcare are growing at a tremendous level, number two. Thirdly, we are also witnessing what is called the digital interventions in healthcare, which also can disrupt the equation of what economy uh, contribution by healthcare can add value there, right? Number three. And number four, again, the growing middle class population leading to many lifestyle diseases. Now, as some of our friends here spoke about how can we focus on preventive healthcare starting from the food and lifestyle itself? Even those aspects would have an impact on the overall macroeconomic contribution by the healthcare industry. But all of these are at a macroeconomic level. But if we put this question, squeeze it into a microeconomic level, at a healthcare organizational level, at a hospital level, today the buzzword is digital. And I am not a big fan of digital, neither I am trying to say digital doesn't work. But some of my research work specific to digital health at microeconomic level says that 70% of digital interventions, the investments which go via hospitals on digital fronts fail. 70% of digital investments fail. Now this has an impact on the microeconomics of a hospital. How? Number one, it is going to put the investment and we try to see the results immediately, which is not going to happen in an industry like a healthcare, because we talk about uh, 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 things like uh, the digital profiling. Today, the Honorable Minister spoke about the pilot of digital profiling in a couple of districts in Telangana. Now, putting an investment of that kind will not reap a result immediately, because we are talking about gathering data about people, which has to be a mammoth activity to perform. Now the efforts and the investments which go into this will reap the economic benefit only in a short, in a, in a midterm, not immediate on a short term basis. Now this is the digital myopia which most of the healthcare administrators today are living with. That I put money on digital, what is my ROI on it? The ROI will not translate into a readily seen economics immediately. It's not going to happen overnight because there is a lot of change management which has to happen three layers and as one of our friends just mentioned to uh, as a response to other question it all boils down to patient centricity on patient centricity layer lies the process layer and on the process layer lies the technology layer now if we re don't respect the patient centricity layer if we don't respect the process layer and the focus and the investment goes into the digital interventions alone it's not going to reap the benefit and this is the trap of digital myopia 
which is impacting the microeconomics of hospitals today. Right? So I tried to answer your question both from a macroeconomic perspective and microeconomics, but open to any other thoughts from others. Yeah, that was um, a good insight. Thank you. Um, would anyone else like to add to this? Um, all right. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Life. <laughs> it is possible to discuss for one day, two days, three days. It will be a lifelong process to discuss. We are discussing a difficult, very difficult topic. Such time is happening. Never ending process is going to happen. How to lead a married life? Okay, we can discuss. How to live happy married life? Uh, I completely opposite to we, we, we both are friends but we have a different view my question is in terms of GDP see India's growth we should owe that to the engineers the IT the, all these Western world's back-end office happens in India. Can there be a day where we become the back-end office for healthcare at global perspective? The, re the reason I'm saying this is 30% of doctor community in the UK are Indian. 10% of doctors in the US are Indian. The richest community uh, is not Jewish in US, it's the Indian community. Can with technology help India's GDP uh, in the health sector as well, as a, the way it's happening for software. Yeah, I'll add a slightly different perspective. The kind of, the kind of ethnic diversity that we have, the kind of genetic diversity that we have, the kind of dietary diversities that we have, I think any solution that India finds will be applicable to the rest of the world. So it's not just about providing back office solutions, but potentially investing in this sector will also probably provide solutions to the rest of the world, given the diverse, everything from socioeconomic to lifestyle that we have in India. So there is a huge potential for Indians to invest in this sector so that most of the technology will thrive here will definitely thrive anywhere else in the world. So that's the viewpoint that I want to bring in. Also because this kind of population is very difficult to get anywhere else. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, so I think this will be the last question. Um, so as a patient, like, what would you say is the best way to choose a good healthcare provider? Like, would you base it off of doctors or facilities, the brand reviews, um, the cost or any other factors. So how would you say is the best way to go about it? Um, Ravi Varma, sir, if you could um, give some insight. Thank you. First, uh, I'll keep it very short. I think um, our audience are falling like flies just waiting for lunch. So that said, I would first like to thank uh, Idea Labs and, and uh, Dr. Bhavani and Dr. Uh, Sham and Dr. Srinivas for arranging this um, and, and putting all of us on, the, on this panel. Right? And uh, going to your question, um, my choice always stands with, with right? It's, uh, I know there is a lot of conversation. I think somebody here mentioned about, about uh, Watson or, or uh, the Amazon's investment into, neural, uh, into, into healthcare and them falling out like flies. Um, after multiple billions in investment. So the, the end of the day, I think when this panel started, there was a conversation about, about how the connection between the doctor and the patient is personal. So the choice of, of a healthcare solution, personally for me, has always been, uh, been the doctor. 
that followed by the amount of uh, facilities or technology that's available. But always, I think there's a long way for us to go in, in, in making a change through, through technology, but uh, I think the fact that the connectivity between you and your doctor is the most important aspect. That's it, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, would do any of uh, you have another perspective on this? All right, okay. Yeah, thank you so much for all of your um, inputs and your time, your thoughts. Um, if any of you would like to make any final concluding statements, we could go ahead with that. Um, anything you would like to convey to the audience? Or if the audience has any questions to ask. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for all your time, your effort, your uh, input. It is much appreciated. I think we all gained a lot of um, knowledge through this discussion. Uh, I request you all to just, uh, I think, remain seated on the dais for a couple of minutes. We'll have the felicitation and then we can break for lunch. Yeah. Thank you. On behalf of Idea Clinic's National Conference Diabetes Endocrinology Research Update 2022, we sincerely convey our appreciations to all the official dignitaries on their appropriate conversation at this point of time, where we are considering new initiatives for the growth of healthcare sector. Thank you, one and all. Now, I request Dr. Shyam and Dr. Rakesh to felicitate our panel members. Kindly welcome both of you. So the same, the same one or uh, any changes? Professor AJ, sure. So on behalf of IDA Clinic's National Conference Diabetes and Endocrinology Research Update 2022, We thank Professor Vijay Sundar and Dr. Ashok Kumar Tiwari, Professor Ullas Yas Koltur, Professor Subhanarayan Rath and Rajesh Mantena, Professor Devapriya Kumar Yu, Dr. Hema Chandran K and Ravi Verma D. Thank you very much one and all. Your presence made this conference overwhelmed. So someone very rightly said that gaining knowledge is the first step to wisdom and sharing with others is the first step to humanity. So all our panel members proved this on this platform. Thank you very much one and all. Expect grand round of applause.
So I sincerely thank Dr. Shyam and Dr. Rakesh for felicitating our board of delegates. Thank you very much. time for a lunch break. I would like to request all our guests and delegates to move towards the lunch and is waiting for you outside. We will resume here at 2 p.m. Thank you. I mean, it's already 2 p.m. <laughs> so we'll resume after half an hour. Thank you, Professors Rakesh Sahai and Professor Neelaveni. I'm indeed uh, honored to be on this dais with two stalwarts of endocrine stalwarts in Telangana. I'm really delighted to be a part of the Idea Clinic CME. I thank uh, Dr. Sudhakar Rao, Dr. Uh, Sham for the kind invitation. Earlier we thought it was a reproductive disorder, but then now the title aptly says it is not so. It is a disorder which occurs across the lifespan. And then more so today, a woman with PCOS sees n number of clinicians for various consulting.
Now this is, uh, so the first, summarizing the first case, so this girl, uh, uh, she has um, irregular cycle, she, her menarche is more than one year, and then she had a cycle of more than 90 days. She has hyperandrogenism, she has a family history, and the obese and acanthosis, and she also has possible psychological issues and obstructive sleep apnea. Though we do not give a diagnosis of PCOS in, in young girls, this particular girl has a very robust evidence of uh, uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, and hence she has PCOS. So the criteria again, uh, what is the difference between adolescent and an adult? So the adolescent criteria are very stringent and in adult, in addition to this, you have infertility, hypertension, diabetes, and endometrial hyperplasia. So the reproductive phenotype which occurs in young women as uh, um, once the woman becomes an adult, you find that the reproductive phenotype becomes less robust and the metabolic phenotype is more dominant. Now the second part is management of reproductive disorders. This is a case uh, of a 32 year old woman with PCOS wishing, wishing to conceive. She, uses, uh, she used contraceptive pills for the last 10 years and stopped six months back. Her BMI is 42, thyroid and prolactin are normal. Her total testosterone is 63 nanogram per DL and she wants to plan her pregnancy. So how do we plan pregnancy? So fertility management is, again, to start with, is lifestyle modification and weight reduction. Unfortunately, we see majority of women undergoing ovulation induction without a proper uh, um, lifestyle modification measures and weight reduction and a, a screening for diabetes, dyslipidemia, and depression, and optimizing metabolic control. All this is very important prior to ovulation induction. The reason is that we need to minimize the adverse pregnancy outcomes in women with PCOS. Then ovulation induction, um, the drug of choice is uh, Litrosol. It scores over clomiphene in that it has a lesser uh, incidence of uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Then of course metformin and uh, the IVF are the other modalities. Now the third case is a 32 year old lady with PCOS presence with hirsutism. This lady, I saw her a couple of weeks back. She is married and she has a nine-year-old child. So she was lost for follow-up. She, she uh, suddenly landed up and then she was worried about her cosmetic appearance. And she is frustrated with his hirsutism. She is depressed. The only sentence she said is, Doctor, I just don't want to survive. I feel like committing suicide. I cannot go out. I cannot socialize. I don't want this life. This is the question she said. So dermatological manifestations are very frustrating. They're really, you know, one of the causes for depression in women with PCOS. So her BMI is 30, she has acanthosis, FG score is 18, total testosterone is 75 nanogram per DL, normal prolactin TSH, lipids A1C are in the normal range and how will you treat her? So treatment of dermatological manifestations. So hirsutism, it is again the the drug of choice is the combined oral contraceptive pills. You give a, a combination of uh, ethanylistradiol and a, and, a, and a progestin, which is either neutral for androgenic or anti-androgenic properties. Topical uh, anti-androgen spironolactone is, uh, and uh, finasteride are used. If they don't respond to combined OROC pills, then of course we have topical eflornithine, laser hair reduction, and electrolysis. Acne, again, combined oral contraceptives, pyronolactone, along with topical retinoid, salicylic acid, and benzoyl peroxide. Now, remember, these manifestations really, they, the skin manifestations uh, wonderfully resolve with the combination of uh, uh, combined oral pills and spironolactone. So women, it is quite rewarding, and women feel happy for this. Then acanthosis, difficult to treat, metformin and lactic acid solution are usually chosen. Then hydradenitis, oral doxycycline and topical chlorhexidine loconate are given. So these are the, um, uh, now the third part which I'm going to discuss is the cardiometabolic disease and treatment options. 35 year old woman with PCOS with a BMI of 55. Now she's concerned about her weight and metabolic risk. She is on calorie restriction, exercises regularly, but has difficulty in losing weight. So this is the problem for all obese women. The, they do exercise, they are uh, uh, restricting calories, but losing weight is indeed a challenge. 
She has a levonorgestrel IUD in place and she is amenorrheic. She has not had any significant hirsutism. Her A1C is 5.9. She takes two grams of metformin. Her lipids and thyroid are normal. How do you help her with her metabolic risk and weight loss management? Again, a very different, difficult aspect. So the strategy is obesity. How common is it in PCOS is around 40 to 85 percent of PCOS women are obese. So the strategies for weight loss start with nutrition, of course, physical activity, and uh, pharmacotherapy. The drugs are metformin and GLP-1 receptor agonists, and then bariatric surgery. So uh, a word about uh, the emerging role of GLP-1 agonists in obese women with PCOS, published later in uh, JCM, showed that uh, there is quite a very good response, uh, weight reduction in with the usage of GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists. Now, weight reduction matters a lot because, you know, the moment the woman loses at least 5% of her weight, her cycles first restore to normal. So that is, uh, that is the importance of weight loss. And then, of course, there is one latest paper in this month's edition of the JCEM which shows that, uh, showed that efficacy of bariatric surgery in the treatment of women with obesity and PCOS, uh, there is a, a very good uh, response. At the end of six months, a good number of women with PCOS went into remission. And uh, the article says that probably bariatric surgery should be prioritized in obese women with PCOS. Of course, still more data is needed on this. So consequent to obesity, we have the metabolic, cardiometabolic consequences. The increased risk of, again, metabolic syndrome as high as 45%. Again, hypertension, uh, dyslipidemia, and dysglycemia. And an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, looking at the literature of PCOS and the risk of diabetes, coronary heart, heart disease, and stroke, some interesting data is coming up. Uh, one of the publications in Diabetes 2021 they did a genetic study of PCOS and they looked at the risk of diabetes, coronary heart disease and stroke. So this study is a Mendelian randomization study to investigate the association of genetically predicted PCOS with type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease and stroke. And they found that there was no association of genetically predicted PCOS with diabetes, CHD and stroke. But indeed, PCOS by itself does not increase the risk of these outcomes. It is obesity, it is elevated testosterone and low SHBG that are responsible for the cardiometabolic disease in PCOS. <clears throat> so some surprising, some we are getting some new data in, in these aspects. So targeting these factors, these risk factors is uh, what is of paramount importance. Uh, another uh, uh, interesting study from the Journal of American Heart Association 2022 looked at the trends, predictors, and outcomes of cardiovascular complications associated with PCOS during delivery hospitalizations. This was a, a, a longitudinal study over a period of so many years, 17 years as you can see. So they found that women with PCOS had a higher risk of preeclampsia, eclampsia, peripartum cardiomyopathy, and heart failure during delivery hospitalizations. So this again signifies the need that we need to improve the pre-pregnancy metabolic outcome in women with PCOS. Hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and uh, uh, association of self-reported PCOS, obesity, and weight gain. The study concluded that it is obesity and weight gain that more predicted hypertensive disorders in in pregnancy rather than PCOS. So why I shared all this is it is not, it is uh, really we are not sure whether it is uh, PCOS alone or whether it is hyper and
alcoholic fatty liver disease and sleep apnea in PCOS are the other comorbid uh, disorders. There is a very high prevalence of NAFLD as high as 30%. See, both, of, both NAFLD and PCOS, the pathogenesis is partly insulin resistance and that is the reason of uh, missing. Similarly, higher prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea. Both NAFLD and obstructive sleep apnea are correlated with BMI in PCOS. So higher the BMI, more is the prevalence of NAFLD and obstructive sleep apnea. And what is the consequence of NAFLD and OSA? The consequence is that these women have a higher prevalence of cardiometabolic disease. So PCOS, NAFLD, OSA, all a combined put together a very high prevalence of cardiometabolic disease. So screen for obstructive sleep apnea and NAFLD in all women with PCOS. And if uh, OSC is documented, a CPAP, a continuous positive airway pressure, definitely is beneficial. And when you treat this uh, OSC, they, there are studies which found that there is improvement of insulin sensitivity and probably a decrease in the hyperandrogenemia and a reduction in the diastolic blood pressure. So these are all some of the benefits. Now endometrial cancer again is uh, two to six fold higher risk in women with uh, PCOS. What is important is that we need to prevent endometrial hyperplasia. The guidelines do not recommend, uh, uh, routine screening is not recommended, but what is important is endometrial surveillance and prevention of endometrial hyperplasia. Now how do we take care of endometrial health? Again, it is combined oral hormonal contraception or a cyclical progesterone every three months for a long-term progestin is what is, uh, uh, will take care of uh, prevention of endometrial hyperplasia. Metformin, role of metformin. Metformin has a role as far as uh, for restoring the anovulatory cycles uh, in, in women who have, uh, who are uh, not, uh, you know, not able to tolerate the uh, OC pills and progestin, metformin is a good option. So in addition to, you know, uh, glucose intolerance, one important, metformin doesn't benefit, that is, is useless for treatment of hirsutism, but metformin may be useful for uh, management of uh, oligoamenorrhea, in addition to the glucose intolerance we, where we routinely give metformin. So screening at diagnosis and yearly, all women with PCOS at diagnosis and yearly have to be screened for a for, a, a, for disc glycemia, hypertension, dyslipidemia, liver enzymes, of course, OSA and quality of life survey. Now, finally, this is my uh, last slide. So what are the treatment modalities of PCOS? They all have to be patient-centered. Well, this excellent diagram is from our uh, Indian Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism. Our colleagues who did a uh, wonderful write-up, they have given uh, the, the title of this uh, article is a practitioner's toolkit for PCOS counseling. Now you look at the diagram, you can see the treatment uh, modalities across adolescent, a pre-marriage, preconception, and post-family, right? So psychological support is in the center. At all steps, they all, they need psychological support. And if you see, whether it is any phase, all of them need lifestyle modification. Then of course in an adolescent, it is cosmetic therapy which matters. And a woman, a young woman, uh, planning conception, fertility treatment matters. And post-family, uh, adult woman, you have to continue to look for treatment comorbidities, treating comorbidities and complications. So the take home message is that PCOS is a disorder with varied presentations across lifespan. So in adolescence, again, I think a very important message is that we need robust criteria to say that a girl has PCOS and uh, because there is a very uh, good overlap between obesity and ovulatory cycles and PCOS in an adolescent girl. The importance of healthy lifestyle and weight loss has to be emphasized at every time and the ongoing evaluation for uh, all the screening modalities which have been discussed should be emphasized. And finally, as, a, as I said, my first slide, a multidisciplinary team approach really uh, matters in taking care of women with PCOS. I thank you thank all you, for your thank kind Thank you, thank you, Dr. Maitri, for please join us here and we'll have a discussion at the end of the session. I will request Dr. Nilaveni to introduce Dr. Meher Prasad. Right. So good afternoon, everyone. and. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Vai Meher Prasad, MRCPCCT endocrinology. He's a consultant endocrinologist. 
Dr. Y.D. Meher Prasad uh, is a diabetologist, general endocrinologist, and obesity specialist at, at, in Kodambakam, Chennai. He practices at Prana Medical Center, specialist center for uh, pediatrics, diabetes, endocrinology, obesity, and multi-specialty clinic in Kodambakam. Presentation. Chennai branch of Idea Clinics, Chettinad Health City, Srinivasa Priya Hospital. And he is going to uh, speak to us on patterns of weight gain and onset of puberty. Over to you, Dr. Meher Prasad. There's some problem in the presentation. It has to be downloaded, is it? Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Mayer Prasad will just take a few minutes to get his slides on. So, meanwhile, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, I have pleasure in introducing Dr. Meeta. Menopause. We'll, we'll fast track to menopause and then come back to patterns of weight gain during adolescence. So, uh, Dr. Meeta is a well-known gynecologist and obstetrician at, uh, at the Tanvir Hospital in Hyderabad. She has more than 22 years of experience in these fields and she has been uh, the past president of, uh, of the Indian Menopause Society. She's uh, a very active member of the Fox CN several other societies. Uh, she's also very active at the, with the International Menopause Society also. And uh, so I have great pleasure in inviting her. She has been the editor-in-chief of, uh, of, uh, of the Journal of Midlife Health. And uh, so I invite her to speak on menopause. She's going to speak about, uh, about various aspects of menopause and probably focus on, on hormonal therapy. And yeah, Surprise. that's been, that's been her, her, uh, her interest. And so uh, let's see her, uh, what she's going to say, speak today about menopause. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh and uh, respected colleagues on the dais. And I would like to thank Dr. Sudhakar, Dr. Uh, uh, Sham, Dr. Rakesh, Idea Clinics for inviting me on this very interesting topic, menopause. I know a super speciality meet is always a challenge for a simple gynecologist like me to talk on a topic. So now forgive me if I'm, you know, talking, because the topic given was menopause, 20 minutes. So I really didn't know what I should be doing. So I just went back to the basics. And I hope uh, you will like the basics that I'm going to present. So menopause is, you know, like uh, we should make it like a radiant Indian summer. And um, there's always been a debate all the time, whether it's a normal developmental experience or is it some pathology which, you know, you're hunting for uh, a magic cure. So it's a debate between the two. But I think nature is guided best when we let it go and we, you know, help it out. You shouldn't interfere when there is no need to interfere, which is 90% of the time. It's only 10% of the women who need attention. And so I have two colleagues of mine who had different experiences. So 90% of them fall in that one experience where they don't need any help except for you know, the, all the regular screen, which every one of us need now with the environmental pressures and the social pressures that we have. But 10% of them need attention. So how do we go about it? Uh, <clears throat> so the dis discussions are a little bit on facts and statistics, challenges and strengths that we have in India. How to set up a menopause clinic is what I thought going back to the basic and implementing that knowledge. So the vision is 
from my side, it's always been from the past 15 years, we should have menopause clinics just like antenatal clinics. And a midlife woman should not be passed off like an attender of the pregnant woman or of the adolescent girl or something like that. She has to be looked at as an individual. And uh, all the more the need is increasing because the average lifespan of a woman in India is increasing from 60s to 70s now, 72 and it's going to increase further in the next couple of years. So we have more number of midlife women to deal with in the next few years. So all the youngsters have to start taking an interest in midlife and not just laparoscopy and you know, the infertility, which is much more alluring. <coughs> so longevity versus disability. So none of us would like to be disabled. And as you're growing older, it is the quality of life which is very important. So metabolic syndrome at perimenopause in India uh, is 22% rising to 32% at postmenopause. So that is what is happening during the menopause transition. That means from the perimenopause to the menopause, there are a lot of changes, metabolic changes which are happening. So it's not just the vasomotor symptoms you're worried about. We are worried about so many other things that happen which will present at a later stage. So 30% of the Asian Indian adolescent with normal BMI and waist circumference are hyperinsulinemia. I think that was a wonderful talk, very simply put with excellent examples examples by uh, uh, the previous speaker and I think that th this is uh, one of the facts which come out of that. So Indians definitely all of us know that higher percentage of fat especially the abdominal obesity so it's not just the BMI that we talk about it. So lean PCOs who have this abdominal obesity are still going to be that group which need that cardiovascular uh, metabolic changes which are going to happen in the old age. And uh, so it's not just the myocardial problem. Type 2 diabetes we know happens a decade earlier compared to the Western counterparts. 25 years back, 70% of the breast cancer patients were above 50 years of age in India. And probably because the obesity was not so bad. And the physical activity and exercise were far better. But today, almost 48% of patients are below 50, 50 years. And it's surprising that we have breast cancers even 30 years, 35 years old. So we are getting them at much younger age. So breast cancers in the young are hormone positive in 48% of the women. And apart from that, endometrial cancers, which would never get before menopause, we find them before menopause now because of the PCOs and the, uh, you know, the uh, changes in the atmosphere. And also, uh, this is a well-known fact that osteoporotic fractures occur 10 to 20 years earlier. And but luckily, though the diagnosis is more, the number of fractures are a little lesser. So I don't know, but uh, uh, surprisingly, even our, I mean, we are bad with the muscle health. So in spite of that, there is something which is helping us. Probably our neck, femur necks are better than the spine. Something is not, doesn't fit in that well. But then 20% of our postmenopausal women also have the low muscle mass. So, and trends in cancer, like I've already alluded that cancer cervix is lower, breast is increasing, uterus is increasing. So what are the medical challenges that we have in India which are different from the rest of the world? One is earlier median age of menopause. And all of us are aware that whether it is a POI or whether it is early menopause, the minute we say menopause is happening, there are a lot of changes happening, metabolic changes happening. So that is actually predisposing, setting a stage for metabolic disorders and osteoporosis. Thyroid diseases also again start happening then just like in the adolescent period. So we need to, in India, 46.7 uh, is the average age at menopause, hospital-based studies. We still need to have population-based studies for that. So we need to redefine what is premature and delayed menopause in India. Early onset of declining fecundity. We know that you know after the age of 30, the ovarian reserve starts falling in India compared to the 35 in the West. So there's a beautiful study which was done uh, in the Spaniards and the Indian, the same group. And they found that the ovarian reserve in infertility treatment, the Indians did very badly compared to the Spaniards because the ovarian reserve was low. So why is it, it could be, you know, transgenerational. It couldn't have happened uh, any time. Maybe, you know, in utero problems happening over generations and that is why we are where we are now. So it is either dietary excesses or deficiencies in India. Deficiency of calcium, vitamin D, B12, folic acid. I'm sure all of you are finding this all the time. And on the other hand, we have to do, deal with the overtreatment that is happening, excess of vitamin D levels that we find now. So dominance of the non-vasomotor symptoms with us. Widespread use of complementary and alternative me medicines which are not standardized. So these are the medical challenges that we face in a menopause clinic. But then we also have our strengths. I think uh, I removed that slide, but uh, yeah, we have, I have it. So calcium intake, you know, studies done by the good groups of uh, 
group of endocrinologists from India have shown that an Indian average woman doesn't take more than 250 to 300 milligrams of calcium. Do you think that's enough? Absolutely not. And it's 300 to 400 maximum in the urban area. So it's really not. It's really below the average standard that we should have. So th what are the strengths? I think the best strength that we have is the faith. The faith and the traditional mindset, the culture, and we are a happy lot. We are not, you know, so depressed like in the Western countries, but of course, westernization is causing a change. The comfort and the cushioning of our traditional family has actually made a lot of difference into our mind process. Our diet and lifestyle is definitely far better because when you look at the Caucasians, it's all the stored food and the packed food that they have, whereas we are still have the pleasure of having the fresh food every time. We have the pleasure of getting the fresh fruit and vegetables. And our lifestyle was much better earlier. So the faith and spiritualism and menopause is accepted as a natural part of life, God's will. So we, earlier we were never worried about the wrinkles. We used to think the you know stoppage of periods was welcome because you are given a senior state in your family, you are better off. So this was the my uh, strength. So we have to work on the strength. So I always believe that working with what you have, where you are, and not with what you wish for is the principle that each of us clinicians should follow in our practice. So wherever you are in the urban, rural, any setting, we can do best for our patients with whatever we have. And this is the uh, menopause book that we have from the Indian Menopause Society. And very important as to why should we have a menopause clinic like, an, uh, like your diabetic clinic or an antenatal clinic is to uh, offer a comprehensive, friendly services where you're looking at this midlife woman in totality. And that is why we should be having these specialized women uh, menopause clinics all over India. And I think this year there has been a great thrust on it and we have already started a couple of them, um, many of them in India and we are all already also talking to uh, government hospitals where they can start menopause clinics. So the basic requirement is a core team. Core team of course will start with a gynecologist but endocrinologist also can start it as long as they have somebody who could you know, do an internal examination and a pap smear. I think that's the only place where there will be a little difference. A nurse, a receptionist, second team of visiting consultants. So, uh, you know, the basic uh, equipment that we need. Then we have two levels of care. One is the primary care unit and multidisciplinary care unit. So anybody can start a primary care unit. It's just like a general physician's clinic. But then for a more advanced work, you definitely need to have multidisciplinary con consultants because after the age of 40, we know we have so many problems which are coming in, which come in. And uh, like the PCOs, you need to have a multidisciplinary approach for a level of care. So, and documentation becomes very, very important. So a menopause performer, just like an antenatal card that we have for nine months, but this is like for a lifelong. So you see them once in six months, uh, then once annually, but then that card should be there. And uh, like a lot has been talked about metabolic disorders which are picked up during pregnancy, picked up with the PCOs, annual follow-ups. So when the annual follow-ups, you're doing the annual follow-ups, but if you're not documenting them, what's the point? So documentation is very important. So I said, forgive me if I'm going back to the basics, but I think these basics are very important, especially for the younger generation. So when a menopause specialist role and approaches, it's not just about menopause. You also have to look at the aging aspect in that woman. So you stage the menopause, just like how we stage labor, we need to stage menopause as to which stage she is falling in, the perimenopause, the menopause transition, early postmenopause, late postmenopause. So when you're staging them, in your mind, you know what you should be asking the questions, what are the tests to be de the done, and what are the problems that you may pick up at this particular point of her life. So then you divide them between uh, symptomatic and asymptomatic. That is 90% no symptoms, 10% may have the vasomotor and the non-vasomotor symptoms. Then you do the risk assessment for disease and you, you, of course, first and foremost is the preventive health and then is the treatment. So this is how, in a nutshell, you do it. <coughs> I, I like this, this particular picture of mine because very simple tools. You just need a measuring tape, you need a BMI chart, you need an OSTA chart, you need a cardiovascular risk assessment chart, and you need probably, <coughs> you know, for the Gale model, your phone which you can do, your performer, and a vaginal, a simple urinary strip. We use it to check the vaginal pH. So that's a very simple technique that we use. So these are the simple tools for a primary care for a physician, and I think any physician can do it, need not necessarily be a gynecologist. So this is how we do it. And if you have the DEXA and the mammogram, that adds value to whatever you're doing. Pap smear and HPV is very important. 
even the endocrinologist should start telling your women, please get your HPV done at least once in 10 years, and that's enough. Three times, it's enough. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> yeah, this is bad to go, but. So the management is, the minute a woman walks into your clinic, you just, in your mind, go through the history, divide, and divide them into two groups. One is women without menopausal symptoms, then you also subdivide them, presence or absence of comorbidities. Women with menopausal symptoms, presence or absence of comorbidities. And why do you need to do that? You simply need to do that because you want to decide the plan of management. So it's very simple when you divide them like that, you know which women you should be actually having a co-consultant, you know, cross-consultation, whom, where you have to send. Second is when to give MHT, when not to give MHT. If a, if a woman is symptomatic, to give an MHT, to decide when to give an MHT, whether she is free from comorbidities or she has comorbidities. What are the comorbidities she have and when can you give and when you should not be given. So these are the reasons why it's very, very important to group e every woman who walks into your clinic, whether she's symptomatic, asymptomatic, with comorbidities, without comorbidities. And sometimes it's latent disease. So you know that whole uh, spectrum will come. Those with overt disease that you're picking up or they come saying we are on those treatment or you pick them up just by checking the blood pressure or some simple tests and those who are in the latent phase, borderline phase. So these are all the comorbid situations where there are some women who are healthy, the rare kind. The rare ones after 40 who don't have any problems are really rare. So first staging, like I said, you must ask this question, when was your last period? Less than three months ago, regular bleeding, she is in the pre-menopause. Less than 12 months ago, irregular bleeding, three months amenorrhea, then she is getting into that late menopause transition. More than 12 months is when you say she is natural menopause. So staging of menopause is very, very important. You know exactly what to do, when to do, by dividing them into stages, because you know these are the disorders which surface in different part of your life. That is, in the menopause transition, there's a redistribution of fat, we know, that from gynecoid to an android kind of a picture, and the vasobota symptoms, the non-vasobota symptoms come in during that menopause transition phase, and an unintended pregnancy is a big problem at that particular time. AUBs are very common, hyperestrogenic state, and low progesterone levels happen at that time. Later on, five years down menopause, you have the genitourinary syndrome, which becomes very uh, important, and skin atrophy, nail changes, hair changes, hirsutism, uh, frontal baldness, all of them start appearing. And later on, of course, after the age of 60 years, you have all the NICDs which present, them, which present themselves at that time. But then they give you enough time. That means all the ones which are presenting at 60 have actually started off 10 years earlier. It's for you to pick them up at that time. So preventive health becomes very important. So the issues in a symptomatic woman are skeletal muscular, vasomotor, genitourinary, sexual fat deposition, skin, eye, everything, everything. So just like a PCO, you know, a woman needs all of them even at midlife. So risk models are very important. When you're, so risk assessment at menopause transition becomes very important. I'm not, I don't even have to talk about what is risk model to this audience, uh, you know. So I'm just going to talk about the risk models which we promote at menopause transition. First is the menopause rating scale for vasomotor symptoms. It's a 10 point scale where you write from zero to five and then mild, moderate, severe. So this becomes very important for you to understand whether this woman needs hormone therapy. And then, you know, for her also, if it's very severe, moderate to severe are the only ones who needs hormone therapy. Mild to moderate, you need not even go for hormone therapy. So the, when you scale it, when you have that scale for each woman who has got symptoms, and then you give them the treatment, they come back with you and say, our symptoms have reduced from severe to moderate. It's a pleasure for you and as well as the woman. Breast is right now, we don't have anything in India on our population, so GAIL is what we are promoting. CVD risk assessment is a WHO a CRD is simple. There are other ones which you can use, but this is a simple one which even a paramedical can use. OSTA is again something which even a paramedical can use, even the muscle health, SARCF, genitourinary, vaginal pH. So if Dr. Rakesh, if I have time, then I'm going to, yeah? Uh, yeah, so vasomotor symptoms, these are the 11 points that you have. And actually it comes in a beautiful uh, picture where you have all these on one side and you have the date, the visits, in columns and you can enter over a period of 10 visits and then you divide them from none to severe and that is one risk assessment that you're doing. 
breast is the risk assessment online model. So once you enter a few data, very simple questions, which you can ask your uh, woman to enter it herself and come to you before she, even she comes to you. And then the, uh, uh, it gives you a number. Less than 1.67 is low, uh, uh, low risk for breast cancer over a period of uh, uh, lifetime and over a period of next five years to lifetime. So it gives both. Moderate is between 1.6 to 5, more than 5. So when you're doing this risk assessment, this also helps you when you're again, you know, deciding to give your hormone therapy. So when you're giving your hormone therapy, if she's falling into a high risk group, probably we will not be giving the hormone therapy. You're going to talk to her. But if she's in the low and moderate group, you know, it's more comfortable for your own self when you, you know, do the risk assessment before you give the hormone therapy. And we know that uh, compared to um, MHT, there are so many other risk factors which have worse, which are worse when in relation to breast cancer, obesity is 24 more cases if the BMI is more than 30, compared to MHT, which is maybe about uh, five more cases. So there are so many other factors which cause breast cancer when you're looking only with uh, the estrogen progesterone combination. In fact, when you're giving estrogen alone therapy, there are eight less cases of breast cancer. So CBD risk prediction charts, we have this, uh, we have the WHO ISO, which is very, very simple. But um, uh, some of our Indian studies, they have quoted the British uh, uh, third, JBS3, I think, which actually fared better than this because this has got very simple, uh, simple things that we are adding on. So it underestimates the risk, whereas if you're using the JRBS3, you actually estimate very well and it's really not very difficult to do. But we are promoting this for a simple reason that it can be done all over India by anybody where you have these simple charts and you plot the age, the BP, uh, diabetic, non-diabetic, smoker, non-smoker. I think we just have about six of them and then you can chart them as mild, moderate and severe. So I'm not going to go into the details because I know all of you all must be very good with all of these. So then you assess it. And you know, if even if they are high risk, then you don't give the MHT. So it's not for primary or secondary prevention, we know, but primary prevention, there is still a window where we feel that, yes, it can work. Whereas low risk for CVD, moderate risk for CVD, we can give MHT. Moderate risk, we are, uh, are going in for the transdermal MHT. So uh, we always also assess the baseline for venous thromboembolism before you plan for MHT. So high risk, the history is there, you avoid MHT. Normal and low risk, transdermal or tibolone. Varicose veins, again, transdermal is preferred. But mind you, we earlier used to say that once a woman has gone through pregnancy, then that's a clear chit that she will probably not develop a uh, uh, you know, problem, embolism or uh, DVT with uh, the pills. But then with so many other cofactors which happen, the dehydration, the obesity which they develop over a period of years, you have to be careful. Skeletal muscular health, OSTA is something which is, you just take the age and the weight and you plot the graph. And if you have the pleasure of the FRAX and the DEXA, of course, that is the best thing to do. Though we don't have the Indian one, we follow the Singaporean one. We still don't completely go by it. So it's only the uh, risk factor, risk factors put together with this FRAX that you plan the management. So FRAX and OSTA is done only for screening. That is once osteoporosis is diagnosed, you know you have to treat. But low bone mass, you don't know whether to treat or not to treat. So those are the cases where this screening modalities and FRAX is going to help you take a decision whether to treat or not to treat. And uh, assessment for sarcopenia, simple. If the patient is able to walk and sit down, get up from the chair, you don't have to do anything. No risk assessment. But only if she's not, she takes support when she's getting up. Then you do the SARCF questionnaire and then you go on further and confirm by DEXA and go ahead with some more tests to understand the uh, muscle health. So the indications for DEXA, uh, I think uh, this I would give credit to Dr. Rakesh. I don't know whether he remembers it, but you know, we had a closed door meeting of uh, the few group when we made the guidelines, the first guideline in 2012. And we were wondering what to do with the indications for DEXA because the NOF and the IOF says all the DEXA we should start doing only after the age of 65. And at that time in 2012, the average age of woman could live was 65. So then we thought, what is the point in doing at 65? So actually Rakesh came up with this, he drew everything and on a piece of paper and he showed us. He said, I think this would be a better idea and all of us really liked it because it made a lot of sense and we had evidence to back it up. So all postmenopausal women, more than five years of menopause, postmenopausal women, less than five years of menopause with risk factors, 
women in menopause transition with secondary causes. Radiological evidence of osteopenia and presence of vertebral compression fractures, all of them need to go for DEXA. And of course, apart from that, you, nowadays there's a lot of talk about the visceral fat, the muscle health, which you can pick up from the DEXA, which gives you a good amount of, uh, you know, total overall health of the woman, because we know fractures are not only because of low bone mass or osteoporosis, muscle health plays a very important role and we have to know about it. So once you have all these risk factors, this is what we advocate in a menopause clinic. You just put it down very nicely in a small chart, all the risk assessment over five years, lifetime, and finally the risk status for each organ of the body. And then you take a call as to how you're going to manage this woman. And it changes every year when she comes to you. Genitourinary syndrome, very simple, like I said, the pH. <coughs> pH has to be around 4.5, anything more than that you have to treat it. And I tell you this is one of the simplest treatment with the best dividends, no contraindication for vaginal uh, hormone therapy, even except for breast cancer, even there, there's not a contraindication, you can give estriol, which is low, this thing, in, when you, you know, discuss with the patient and discuss with her consultant and you can still give it. So, so management plan is very simple, no symptoms or for all of them, it always starts with the preventive care, MHT when the symptoms are there and treat the comorbidities. So a liaison between us, between the gynecologist, between the endocrinologist primarily or the orthopedicians or the dermatologist or the cardiologist is very, very important. Never, never forget about immunization. Last but not the least, I put it in the end, but this becomes so adult immunization after 50 immunization with comorbidities and pneumonia for everybody after 65. I think simple rules. COVID is another one which has come in now, which we need to advocate. So I think immunization is something which we need to talk about. So in the Swan study, <coughs> Balin and Wang called midlife women uh, a critical window of opportunity for prevention. We keep hearing about this window of opportunity. It was termed by these two gentlemen, and I think it becomes very, very important that midlife is an important opportunity for all of us to take care. So, you know, this is a tagline of actually, uh, when I was the president, this is what I had introduced, and now this has been taken up as a tagline of Indian Menopause Society, fit at 40, strong at 60, independent at 80. So somebody asked, now people are living up to 80. So I said, okay, sophisticated at 100, you know, so we may add that now. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, madam, for the comprehensive overview of uh, menopause, which you covered in the short time. Uh, so, uh, we'll not be having the next talk, we'll probably have it later. Uh, and so, we'll, we'll have question answers for this session. If any questions are there, they're welcome. Yeah, Dr. Sham. Uh, so, all of you are professoral level. So, uh, coming to PCOS, Teenage PCO, uh, the uh, lean PCOS, what li lifestyle changes do we advocate? How useful is lifestyle in patients with lean PCOS? So the lifestyle changes, whether it is lean or PCOS or obese PCOS, lifestyle changes matter. As far as the phenotype is concerned, there is a difference between lean and obese. So the lean PCOS are more oligoanovulatory and they have less hyperandrogenism. And the lifestyle changes matter in both. Yeah, please, ma'am, please. No, no, that is the one of the experience of PCOS that we deal with. Uh, lean PCOS also need a similar kind of management like obese PCO, whereas the visceral obesity is concerned. Maybe it's, you know, the general obesity that you're talking about, maybe they need more aggressive uh, uh, management. But I think the dietary control, because even if they're lean PCOS, because we are doing the body composition for most of these uh, lean PCOS, and none of the lean PCOs have a normal visceral fat. All of them will have abnormal visceral fat. So finally, the abdominal obesity is there. So, you know, the lifestyle changes would be the same. But 
in an obese person, you know, for the uh, uh, um, neck problem and other things, it would be more aggressive. Yeah, and it, I just wanted to comment on uh, that uh, menarche, the first question, you know, when you said, would you agree that whether this is a case of PCO? Uh, so it was like, a, not a yes, not a no. It was like, you know, that kind. So probably nowadays we're using this new terminology uh, in my practice where we say PCO in evolution. Because rightly you said, there could be other causes of hyperandrogenism and, uh, you know, which you need to. and still have obesity. So they still require the lifestyle changes. Um, yeah, any questions from the audience? Any other questions? Yes, yeah. One question at the back, yeah. Do you have a mic with you? Can you pass a mic? Ma'am, for you, uh, with PCUS, you mentioned metformin as a treatment for dermatological manifestations. How is it effective, ma'am, and what's the role in other complications associated with PCUS? Role of metformin in PCOS is, number one, if there is a glucose intolerance. And number two, people were using PCOS, uh, metformin along with clomiphene for ovulation induction to decrease the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And number three, metformin helps in, in restoring the oligoanovulation in PCOS. Metformin is, though theoretically it reduces the hyperandrogenism, practically it is, it is not helpful for a woman with hirsutism, it is not helpful. Could I ask you a question about uh, osteoporosis? How often do you, I mean, given your interest in osteoporosis, how often do you uh, find what is the prevalence of osteoporosis in postmenopausal women? Yeah, uh, yeah. so um, uh, I, I, I think the low bone mass is what I see in my practice because most of them come during the menopause transition for us. And uh, it's almost 40 to 50% uh, of low bone mass that we see. Osteoporosis, yes, about 20% above the age of uh, 30 years, above the age of uh, 55, 60. Even at 55 and 60, we find osteoporosis. So the, according to the books, 80% by the time they are 80, low bone mass. Osteoporosis may be about 30%. Am I right? Uh, at least the books, what the books say. And uh, something like that we find even in our practice. But low bone mass is definitely there. But what is worrying us along with the low bone mass, the sarcopenia is also There's one question here. Yeah. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Ma'am, you mentioned that in PCOS patients, there is role of GLP-1 receptor agonist uh, in improving uh, their cardiometabolic outcomes. Uh, what is your opinion on using SGLT2 inhibitors, ma'am? Because they are uh, available. when we start them in obese type 2 diabetics. But then primarily there is no role of SGLT2 inhibitors in the management of obesity and in the management of PCOS. Rakesh, you want to add? Yeah, I think uh, because the weight reduction is not as great with the uh, SGLT2 inhibitors and the uh, tolerability issue again, oh, and, and, and then the uh, problem with the uh, 
genital infection, the urinary tract infection. Non-diabetic, yeah, we may we may say that okay, so may, please, it may, may not be so prominent in non-diabetic. Sir, would it be beneficial if you want to? Situations because uh, liraglutide, which is uh, advocated in the dose of 0 0.6, 1.2, 1.8 for the management of diabetes, but 3MG is advocated for a non diabetic management of obesity also. So, in that context, definitely uh, GLP1 receptor agonists are robust with respect to the weight reduction. So, it can be employed in a diabetic as well as a non diabetic, but with an advice that they should not go while they are on this therapy, they should not plan for a pregnancy. That is very strict. So coming to the SGLT2 inhibitors, they are, as of now, they are advocated only as an anti-diabetic agent. So if there is a diabetes, again, you can recommend to the PCOS women, but not for the sake of weight reduction. It does cause weight reduction to the tune of 2 to 3 kgs, but not for the sake of uh, weight reduction. And mind you, again, while the patients are on all, all the oral anti-diabetic drugs, they should be advised contraception. They should not go for or plan for a pregnancy. This is very strict. And uh, taking this context as a, as a means, like basically many of the women are not prepared properly to go for a pregnancy. Because in the sense, metabolically, metabolically with respect to the weight or the, with, with respect to other, other cardiovascular adverse uh, risk factors have not been properly addressed. And straight away, they are, I, I think many of the, because uh, one of the important problem is the infertility also. And uh, nowadays, because there's so many uh, centers and all, like definitely many of the women, what we see in our practices, going for uh, IVF pre uh, like pregnancies also. I think what I request uh, to the, all the, the, the medical fraternity or the people who are involved in the management of PCOS, either gynecologists, obstetricians and all. Definitely a proper preparation is very, very important for them to go metabolically in a stable environment for the uh, pregnancy. So that like there will be a healthy pregnancy and healthy mother, healthy baby and healthy outcome. So prevention starts from there actually. So I think uh, this is very, very important whoever are involved in the management of PCOS uh, with respect to the metabolic management, with respect to the weight management that should be properly inculcated at least one to two years ahead of planning. That will be very useful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, we are running short of time. We'll just have one question from Dr. Sham. Can we, predict, can we predict PCOS in a girl child? Is there any way we can predict? So two, uh, two important in a girl child is mother having PCOS, a history of mother having PCOS, early adrenarche, then uh, early menarche, less than 10 years age of menarche and then less than eight years of adrenarche suspect PCOS. Okay, one last, one more last question, yeah. Yeah, uh, hello everyone, first of all. Uh, I have two questions actually. So firstly, it's about the MRS scale. Uh, how relevant or how uh, sensitive is it in the Indian uh, uh, yeah. population? Yeah, it, very good question. So um, it was validated first, I think, in Italy. It started from there, but uh, it's been validated uh, globally also, and also in India with uh, translation into our local language. So it's a validated skill which you can use. Okay. It's uh, been translated, and the sensitivity is good. Picks up well, yes. It did well, it fared well in the Indian population. Okay. And uh, also connecting both the topics, like what is the effect of PCOS on menopause and you know how does it affect the transition? Yeah, excellent. So next time, uh, uh, Dr. Sham, you can call me. I have a presentation on PCOS and menop PCOS and menopause actually, and uh, uh, like Madam was saying, you know, it's 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 uh, there are uh, uh, you know if I think the final uh, very simply I'll put it because it's very confusing when you go into the literature. Very simply put. If you are started treating your PCOs early and you're managing the obesity, all the risk factors well, then you know the studies are showing everything becomes normal for them. Their periods become normal, the cardiometabolic risk becomes okay, and they don't have the endometrial hyperplasia and so on, all that. But if the PCOs are not diagnosed and not worked up well, or they continue to increase weight, 
post, uh, whether it's delivered or not delivered, nulliparous and hyperestrogenic state, you know, and hyperandrogenic state. I think that group of people are going to get lined up into the cardiometabolic problems which are seen in PCOS. So menopause as such, during the transition phase, we know there is a metabolic uh, changeover and the estrogen levels fall down. But what is happening is these women are already all the time hyperestrogenic. And when the fall is too much, then probably the body also reacts like that. But then they have found, studies have found that the changes are not much. Unless, unless the estrogen to the androgen ratio at each cellular level may work differently. So these are real questions which are not completely answered. Oh, okay. In short, I think yeah, Dr. Like Medley also like um, mentioned about uh, you know, the, the weight and the testosterone levels being more, I mean, correlating better with the better with the cardiometabolic risk. Yes, and not just than, the estrogen. just the estrogen. So yeah. I think that is another, that is a factor which again Dr. Mitra has also highlighted. Yes. Uh, so I think both the questions are very good. What's your name? Nitya, ma'am. I'm a third year medical student. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So one important thing is, you know, <laughs> see, one important uh, point is, uh, a premenopausal woman has cardio protection, right? I think with PCOS, that is lost. So in a premenopausal woman is usually protected from cardiovascular disease. That was the conventional teaching. But now with PCOS setting in, so the cardio metabolic, the protection is lost. Yeah, I am not sure how right I am. With diabetes also, you know. But androgenic state. You speak about diabetes also. Diabetes also, uh, you know, women with diabetes lose that protection. I am not. Uh, uh, I am not sure of how right I am about my reasoning here, but uh, as Ma'am said that uh, with the PCOS thing that. Uh, cardio protection is lost with menopause. So is it because of the uh, combined oral contraceptives that they use in the treatment of uh, PCOS? Because they do have uh, some adverse effects related to CVS. It's not because hyperandrogenism itself, which is existing, obesity, which is there, so all these risk factors add into it. Thank you. of the combined oral contraceptive pills is uh, the concern of venous thromboembolism. So that is why we do not use them in uh, women over the age of uh, 35, 40, I think we who have uh, hypertension, then these are certain situations where uh, we differ OC pills. But by and large, the benefits of OC pills in, uh, in the management of PCOS have far uh, outweighed the risks. So they are definitely beneficial. Thank you. Dr. Maitley. I, th I thank both the speakers for the excellent presentations and So that was really an amazing speech. Thank you all the dignitaries for sharing your great knowledge with us. A special thanks to Professor Dr. Ye Maidli Ayengari and Dr. Mita for your presentation on, on PCOS and menopause. So I request uh, Professor Dr. Rake Sahai, sir, and Dr. Nilaveni, ma'am, to present token of gratitude to both the speakers. Thank you, ma'am. You highlighted all the information about PCOS, which was a clear picture about the, all the medical aspects of PCOS. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Meeta, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, you. Because you highlighted the importance of menopause and menopausal clinics in the middle-aged women. Thank you very much. Special thanks to all the dignitaries and, uh, yeah, and speakers. Now we may move on to the most awaited moment, the workshop organization.
So one special request from our colleague. Uh, so the people who want to participate in the quiz competition, the endocrinology quiz initiative tomorrow, you can register now. And the awards as follows. First prize, INR 10K gold medal and a certificate. The second prize, INR 8K uh, silver medal and a certificate. And third prize, INR 6K bronze medal and a certificate. So you can just call our team to the table for the registrations. So quickly moving to the workshop organization, the two workshops are held simultaneously. The first one is food care workshop. Uh, the food care, the most vital preventive management initiative as a part of diabetes complication by organized by Dr. CHVS Ramarao Garu. So our Dr. Ramarao has 16 years of experience in general laparoscopic and diabetic food surgery. He was trained in the prestigious Nizam Institute of Medical Sciences. He was trained in various hospitals in the UK. This includes liver and pancreas. He has worked in surgical oncology and other specialities for acquiring higher surgical skills. His areas of interest are mainly laparoscopic surgery, complex hernia repairs, general surgery, non-healing ulcers, and also diabetic foot ulcers. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so let's start the food care workshop organized by Dr. CHVS Rama Rao, sir. The second one simultaneously follows insulin pump CGMS workshop, which, which covers all the recent trends, the treatment protocols in diabetes management by Dr. Y. Meher Prasad. So he is MRCP CCT endocrinology consultant endocrinologist. Dr. Y.D. Maher Prasad is a diabetologist, general endocrinologist and obesity specialist in Chennai. He practices at Prana Medical Center, specialist center for pediatrics, diabetes, endocrinology, obesity and multi-speciality clinic in Kodambakam, Chennai. Chennai branch at Idea Clinics, Chetinad Health City, Srinivas Priya Hospital. Thank you so much for your efforts, sir. So let's start with the workshop right now. Request everyone to participate. I quickly get through the highlights of the conference. It directly awards four CME credit points. So we obviously covered interesting panel discussions. Now the workshop is going to be organized which covers the topics of food care, insulin pumps and CGMS, which spreads additional extent of awareness on most common endocrinological abnormality, diabetes mellitus. Exciting key highlight of the summit is endocrinology quiz initiative, which is eligible for all MBBS, MD, DNB, DM professionals, along with nursing executives working in endocrinology department, which is conducted tomorrow, 17th July. Interested people, just raise your hands. Our team will come to register your names. And the winners So we are going to organize We are going to organize food care workshop on the right corner of the hall and just in front of the stage it is insulin pumps workshop. So request all the students and dignitaries to just uh, have a look on it and participate thoroughly. So I just resume the uh, awards. The first prize of the quiz initiative, INR 10K gold medal and a certificate. The second prize, INR 8K silver medal and a certificate. The third prize, INR 6K bronze medal and certificate, which is gone held tomorrow. The 
food care workshop is organized by Dr. C H V S Rama Rao Garu on the right side of the hall, right corner of the hall, and uh, the insulin pump C G M S workshop organized by Dr. Y Meher Prasad is just in front of the stage. Very informative workshops which spread ocean of awareness on most endocrinology, abnormality, diabetes mellitus. On behalf of Idea Clinics National Conference On behalf of Idea Clinics National Conference Diabetes and Endocrinology Research Update 2022, we are organizing two workshops simultaneously. I request each and every one to just participate. So I take an opportunity to announce the food care workshop is going on on the back side of the hall. Right corner of the hall. People who registered kindly go there. The food care workshop is held at the end of the hall. Kindly participate. I will just quickly go through the participant list in the food shop, food care workshop. Meghna Divya Jyoti, Shoe Bahmad, Dr. Mohammad Nafi, Dr. Farhan Ashar, Dr. Shahbaz, Dr. Hasnain, Dr. Sri Lata, Samyukta, Dr. Kaushal Sheth, Rehman, Pranita, Manu Sharma, Mahinder, Manisha, Nishi, Nitya. Aishash, Sharif, Mrinmai, and also Dr. Anand. So I kindly request all the presentees go to their respective workshops. So food care workshop is organized by Dr. C. H. V. S. Rama Rao Garu at the corner of the hall and uh, the insulin pump CGMS workshop is just held by Dr. Y. Meher Prasad in front of the stage. There are two workshops going on simultaneously.
Thank you.